Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, this day's uh, seminar. Today we will uh, open with uh, some insights from the UK. And the first speaker is um, Paul Barnes, Warrant Officer Class 2. And um, he joined the British Army in May 1992. And he has seen operational service in the former Yugoslavia, Northern Ireland, Iraq and Afghanistan. He is currently the SO2 Warfare Branch at uh, HQ Land Warfare Centre in Warminster, England and the Secretary of the NATO Land Operations Working Group. Paul Barnes holds an MA in uh, Military History from the UNU <coughs> sorry, University of Birmingham and is uniquely a Chief of the General Staff Fellow and a Chief of the Air, Air Staffs Fellow and was a fellow of the Royal United Services Institute in Whitehall from 2018 to 19. He remains a member of the Military Sciences Advisory Board at RUSI. From uh, 2020 to 21, he was a fellow of the Modern War Institute at West Point. He has written articles and been published in Australia, USA and the UK. And currently he's writing his first book of the, on the principles of war. So today he's going to talk about operational insights from a UK perspective. Paul, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. I uh, hope you can hear me. It's a bit feedback in the ear. It's a bit of a strange sort of feeling. Uh, let's see. Aha, it does work. Okay, so <coughs> where was the UK coming from when we put this production together, essentially? Um, well, first of all, we had direction. We had direction from two people. We had direction from Commander Landcom as part of the NATO Land Operations Working Group that what he wanted to see was a bit more agile doctrine development and doctrine development that was enemy focused so that we were looking at our opponents and seeing where their weaknesses were and seeing where our doctrine fed into that to see if there were any uh, areas that we could improve. Uh, and then secondly, uh, when we received our new CGS, our new Chief of the General Staff, he put the British Army on a thing called Op Mobilize. In other words, uh, what he wanted to see was a complete focus on uh, Ukraine and a complete focus on um, our Russian friends. Um, so this presentation is largely going to be based on uh, what we've learnt or what we've observed from uh, Ukraine since February, but it also has some observations uh, from Nagorno-Karabakh. I've done some work for previous Commander Tradoc on um, Nagorno-Karabakh and the lessons that the US Army might look to extract from that, and we, we've carried on the action, if you like. Um, the presentation, again, is unclassified. However, um, I've extracted stuff from much higher classifications and dumbed it down so that we can talk about it. Uh, it. None of this represents the British Army, Land Warfare Centre, you know, all the usual stuff. Um, it, it's just, just what, it's my opinion. I think that's the best way of putting it. Okay, so, uh, first image is probably the image, I think, probably of the war so far. Aha, right. So what do we expect to, to see when, when Russia invaded the Ukraine? Well, most of us probably thought we were going to be looking at a kind of a revised Soviet doctrine. We we're probably going to see something that looked akin to what we expected to see in the Cold War with additions of improvements as a result of what they had observed of us in the Gulf War and, and after. We expected to see lots and lots of concentrated fires. We expected to see echeloned uh, combined arms manoeuvre groups uh, breaking through um, and uh, exploiting rapidly, enveloping use of VDV and special forces in our rear areas, to, to in the rear areas to break it down. That's what we expected to see, and that's what we didn't see. But we could have expected to see another scenario. So we could have expected to see the use of hybrid uh, forces, like we saw in Ukraine. Though we've got to be careful with that uh, in Crimea. It's a very special, it was a very special um, set of circumstances and probably not 
easily replicated. As to whether the Russians knew that that was not easily replicated is another thing. There was a superb information campaign done by the Ukrainians in the build-up, uh, whereby in those areas that were likely to come under Russian influence, they were spreading rumours that the Ukrainians had no will to fight, that Ukraine would give in at the drop of a hat very easily. Uh, in fact, they knew of the mayors, um, over 140 mayors in those areas who had Russian sympathies, and they fed them the lines that they knew would go back to Moscow so that when the Russians came in expecting nothing, they would get a real surprise. Uh, so did the mayors, all 140 of them were rounded up on day one, put in, put in jail. So um, <laughs> it, it, there was a, a complicated and complex and, and very successful information operation at the very beginning. But why else could we have expected there to be a special case, or rather different? Well, because Russia has a long history of walking into small countries and uh, taking them over. Um, we've seen this stuff in the Cold War, so we saw Hungary in 56 and Czechoslovakia in 68, I think, rather than 67, and obviously Afghanistan in 1980. So they have got a history of this. And when they enter into a country, it often isn't using those combined arms tactics. So perhaps we could have expected to see uh, something somewhat different. So the answer is, should we have expected to see a war or this uh, special operation? Try that. It's over there somewhere. Aha, good. Did it go to you back? Okay, so this is actually from the uh, Twitter feed of the British uh, Ministry of Defence. And what it shows you is exactly, this was just before the invasion. And this is sort of telling us exactly what they expected, what the UK military expected to see. So as you can see from this, you can see um, it is the classic idea of exactly what the Russians would do in terms of Soviet tactics. So large enveloping manoeuvres with, uh, with combined armed forces, probably um, concentrating on Kiev, but also looking to, to um, cut off the whole of eastern um, Ukraine at uh, Dnipro, on the river Dnipro, uh, and then and then side into the south and head to try and take over towards Odessa. So you, it really is, that is what we expect. So I think the whole West was expecting to see that sort of, that sort of maneuver. I'm gonna take you back to the winter war of 1939-40. Uh, and I think you can see that there, is, there are similarities in what you're seeing here. So if you look at the short, short bursts, there is no attempt to try, and, to try and use those Soviet tactics. So why is that? It's because like Finland in 1939-40, when Stalin thought that Finland was gonna be easily conquered, that the Finnish people were effectively under the boot of white Russians and the proletariat would rise up and support the communists coming in. So what he did was a broad front because he thought it would just collapse. So Stalin thought that was what would happen. Uh, the Finns showed that that wasn't gonna happen. And uh, through the winter of 1939-40, they, uh, they managed to hold, not only hold the Russians off, but destroy large units in detail. Very similar in, in, um, in, in taste, if you like, to exactly what we saw in Ukraine. So whilst this is a, is a long time ago and it's a different regime, there are cultural issues with the Russian army that are very similar and remain today. But the important thing is that this is what it looks like. This is not the, this is not the combined arms uh, warfare that we were expecting, but actually the Russians have done this kind of thing before, albeit as the Soviet Union. What's the difference? Well, the difference is fundamentally this. The Ukrainians have destroyed um, I think yesterday we said something like 70% of Russian combat power. They had an army of, say, 170,000 to work with, and that was it. They have a, a million-man army, but 500,000 men of that million-man army are internal security troops they can't touch. Leaving them with 500,000 they can touch, many of whom are or were reservists or, or, or were not, not of the first rank. So once that 170,000 had gone, he had no combat power. The difference is when Stalin had, 
had been beaten back at Suma Salmi and Kemi Yavi and all these battles all down the, the, um, Finnish, uh, the Finnish front, he had lots of combat power left. And so in 1940, in, in, in March, he manages to uh, gather the combat power and says, just do it the proper way. Just, just do it with conventional forces this time. And they do, and they go straight through, and they defeat, because they have the ability to switch to a conventional approach from this kind of political approach where they were just going to see it all collapse. S uh, Putin, arguably, doesn't have that. Uh, doesn't have that anymore because he doesn't have the combat power to change the way he wants to go. He may try and learn. Though speaking to Ukrainians last week from their general staff, they, were, they wonder whether he can learn because most of the people who will be responsible for collecting the learning are dead. And so how lo how it will take a lot longer for the Russians to gather that information than even we might think. Nope, too far. So that's the initial phase, and now I'm going to move on and talk about something that's much later. So we're skipping out a whole area, but I'm picking out areas for interest. And obviously we've got this Kharkov offensive. Okay, so we have this information campaign at the beginning. Th there is a lot of debate as to whether the Ukrainians are capable of um, operational level warfare. Huge amounts of debate in that area. Um, many people think not, um, and we have to be careful because let's, let's remember um, the Ukrainians are very skilled at information warfare, as, as skilled as the Russians. And so what we see on our TVs, what we hear is what people want us to hear. We, so you have to be very, very careful with the evidence. But having listened to Ukrainians last week, it is quite compelling that they used an information campaign to affect the way the Russians would see that area around Kharkov. So from August, the Ukrainians are talking about uh, Kurzon. They're talking about building up in Kurzon. That's going to be their axis. And the reason for that is that down here, round, um, round, uh, in, in this sort of area, the Russians were moving in, in Bakhmut, where they are now trying to put attacks together. We're going to move an entire core into that area to try and break through around Bakhmut. The Ukrainians used the information campaign to try to divert Russian troops down to Kurzon, and it worked. The Russians moved down to Kurzon, leaving the area around Bakhmut quite empty or very lowly held. They then moved their elite troops, the air assault troops, the two brigades of air assault troops, they moved them out and put them up behind Kharkov where they were issued with the latest artillery and the latest equipment that we were giving them, all done very quietly. At the same time, they're waiting for the Russian units that are there to be relieved, a relief in price. Now, they, this is where things get really bad for the Russians. So the Russians do a relief in place in 24 hours. We all know that we would do it in a phased way over time. The Russians just say, pull out, pull in. So you have troops walking one way while others are going back the other way. And it is at that moment that the Ukrainians choose to infiltrate. They do not use heavy artillery. They use infiltration tactics. They break in quietly. They move quickly to get behind the ripping out troops. And the ripping out troops, in true manoeuvre style, realise that they've been flanked and they move. They break. And then then the Ukrainians follow it up with heavy armour and with artillery. And what the, what the Ukrainians only use the artillery for is to uh, destroy the strong points, literally to level those strong points as they go. When they come to a town, so they've gone through this very rapidly, when they come to towns, and particularly we'll deal with um, Izium more than anything else, but when they come to Izium, they uh, don't surround it. They surround three quarters of it and they make sure they leave one road out. And they basically, it becomes obvious to the Russians that they can get out safely. And they do that tumbling them out of place after place with speed, with momentum. But it becomes pretty obvious to me that this is what we're seeing here. 
this is an operation and this is organized at the operational level which means we probably have to rethink what we think about the Ukrainian army or the Ukrainian forces. We think of them probably as a, t as a fairly tactical force that can do tactical things, but I don't think that's the case. I think they are, in fact, capable of far much more than we perhaps would credit them. But what was important for, for the UK in this is that this is a, a level of activity that we, uh, we don't even think of very much these days. If we think of what we have available, we have brigades, um, we barely have uh, a division. And that division uh, has no real way of orchestrating anything below it. What you have here is, with similar size units, with brigade size units, but being orchestrated in an operational way, moving people from one side of a theatre to another, um, providing fires at, at centrally controlled, so that what you end up with is you end up with a, creating a bigger effect than you could have expected if you had just uh, let loose two brigades. A brigade is not going to be um, decisive in, in, in Jim Storr's words. You know, it's just not going to be decisive. However, two brigades could be decisive if they are worked and orchestrated together properly. And so for us, it became really important that we look at this level of orchestration. So what did we see? Well, first of all, we explained the, the issue of uh, the loss of combat power and very rapid loss of combat power. And also the lack of the, what we saw is um, force density of, in, in huge terms. We in the Cold War had expected in the UK, we'd, we'd had a front of about 60 miles to defend in Germany. And we put a whole core to defend 60 miles. Um, today, we would be expecting to manoeuvre a brigade around you know four or five hundred miles it's it's a whole different size of scale than we're used to but more importantly the force density in those areas would be tiny so you are really uh, you are maneuvering in the wind um, but the important thing i think to remember here is of course that this is not we're not strangers to this so when the eastern front and the second world war um, by 43 and 44 the germans are also maneuvering in the wind because they have, their flanks aren't covered. You have to be comfortable in that sort of, that sort of uh, level of chaos. We also have to remember that we're looking at two former Soviet militaries. So you're looking at uh, two militaries which were the same military till 1991 with the same doctrine, the same understanding uh, and intimate understanding of each other's tactics. So um, there is an advantage there that we don't have. So when the Ukrainian sees what Russians are doing, he knows exactly what they're doing. Uh, for us, we have to learn all that. I think it points to, um, to, to the importance of that. What it also shows is the, the Russians with their poor intelligence information flows. Now, this is an historic thing. A lot of these things that I'm pointing out here are enduring. So um, no one wanted to tell Stalin that things were going badly. Everybody would say no. And it's not just Stalin. No one would want to tell Nicholas II. No one would want to tell Khrushchev when things were going badly. And so they invented stories to, to keep the truth away from uh, the leader. Because it, was, it is just a cultural, a cultural thing. And the poor intelligence. The poor intelligence stems from the fact that they were outdone by the same information manoeuvre tactics that they have been famous for for, for years. Because essentially um, every, they learned from the same from the same shop if you like but the real the real weakness of Russian of the Russian military is a rigid command and control system that is a weakness that they've had for probably 200 years at least so since we had the idea of divisions and we divided our forces up um, the Russians have never really been comfortable with that sort of level of delegated command. So we see, we see in the wars of the Crimean War, we see in the wars of the Russo-Turkish War, mo most famously in the Russo-Japanese War, and then again in the Russo-Finnish War. It doesn't matter what your regime is. Hard baked in to the Russian psyche is that there is a hierarchy of command and you never break that hierarchy. If your commander doesn't tell you to move, you stand still. The Russian soldier 
is a is a um, ex uh, an exemplar of of stolid resistance. He will stand still and and die if he has to, but he won't move unless he's told by his commanders. Bear that in mind and look at what Ukraine's been doing by assassinating low-level commanders. He is effectively stopping formations in their in their tracks. Why low-level commanders? So why brigadiers and major generals and not senior people? Well, what we're told is that the senior people are political appointees and can be appointed very, very quickly from the Kremlin. So if you remove one within 24 hours, you'll get another one. Low-level brigadiers are professional, uh, 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 colonels and uh, major generals are professional soldiers. You cannot replicate them. They take nearly a month to replace. If you remove the low-level commander, it will take a long time to replace him. And therefore, the unit that you're fighting will be stood still for a long time while they try to replace him. So that is a, an extract. That, that is from the Ukrainians as to why it is low-level commanders rather than high-level commanders that they're looking for. So why should this become news to NATO? Well, it shouldn't be news to NATO. Um, people would say, uh, people have been saying for some time that you know, we saw the Russians as 10 feet tall giants. We shouldn't have done. There are reasons why we did, probably to do with budgets and, and trying to influence people to, to spend money on things uh, because there was a big, bad, ogreous enemy uh, waiting on the other side. But we knew this. 1970s, 1980s, when we developed air land battle and maneuverist approach, we knew that the fundamental weakness that the Russians had was command and control because those doctrines are designed to attack Russian command and control systems. So we, we've known this for a long time. This is not news to anybody. Their low logistic resilience. The Russians are masters of railway logistics. They can move thousands of tanks from one side of, the, of Russia to the other in a matter of days. There are examples of moving entire divisions uh, in the matter of two or three days from a start point behind the Urals into the Western uh, region. So they're very good at that. So let's not think that they're just, they're a busted flush, they're useless. They are very good at railway logistics. But put a set of tires on it and it all breaks down because they are not masters of road logistics. They're so used to moving everything by rail that once you get beyond, we think about 60 kilometers on a road move, things start to go very badly wrong. They go wrong for two reasons. One, because stuff isn't, just isn't maintained. And we'll talk about, well, why not talk about why it's not maintained in a moment. But one of the key areas, the reason you see 40 kilometer long um, queues of logistic traffic queued up outside Kiev is because of the directive nature of their command and control. They have a complete push logistics system. So rather than a system that we might have in the West where we demand what we need from the rear and it comes exactly, what you end up with with the Russians is they produce a, a plan and they know after 12 hours what you're going to need, after another 12 hours what you're going to need, after another 12 hours what you're going to need, and they put it on the road at 12 hour intervals, whether those trucks get there or not. So what you end up with outside Kiev in, in April and May is, uh, or rather up to April, is 40 mile long queues of logistics waiting to be delivered to units that are no longer there. They don't know what to do with them. They just form up into a, a long snake. Uh, and so that is uh, the essential weakness. This, this hierarchical and, and, um, this hierarchical and uh, a directed level of war is, is, is the key to that. There's also another problem with logistics, and we saw we saw flat Chinese tires and and tires marked CCCP on the side, so they're over 30 years old. And yet we're told that the Russians have, since 2008 at least, well since 2000, but 2008 since Georgia they've they've accelerated that they've really looked at, at trying to solve all these problems. How do I put this? It's the same problem that we all probably face in Afghanistan. Uh, you may put £40 billion pounds in at the top of defence, but by the time it comes down to the bottom to buying the tyres, it looks like two broken old tyres from China and $10. Because all down the chain, there are kleptocrats taking their chunk of the cash so that by the time it reaches the bottom, that huge amount of money looks like nothing. 
And that is in the, obviously we have that same experience from Afghanistan. You give it to the local warlord, but he promises you 10,000 troops and then two of his brothers and their mates turn up at the, at the security, uh, at, the, at, the, at the FOB. Uh, and that is very, very much a similar, similar thing. Also, understanding and education. I was uh, giving a podcast to Tradoc in, in January um, on, the, on a completely different subject. And one of the people said to me, uh, do you think that Putin will, will invade in, in February or March? And I said, well, if he's a historian of war, he won't, because he'll recognize that that time of year the, the ground won't support his vehicles. He won't be able to maneuver. He'll have to move down straight roads. And that will be a really big mistake. The Russians know, should know this from their experience of fighting the Germans in 1941 through to 44 in that area of, um, of the world, uh, which shows how much I know. Uh, so I like to think I was right, but I was, or I was wrong, but I was right. I was wrong for the right reasons. You know, it, if he'd have thought a little bit more about his past and his history, he would have understood it was not the right time. But also, this idea of education. So there are other things to remember. Not only is there a directive command and control system, um, he got rid of his NCO, what, the, what there was of it, his NCOs. He got rid of his warrant officers. So there's no technical expertise below the officer which means every decision has to be made by an officer. Every decision. Um, that there are no real sergeants. The sergeant is a purely administrative role. He's a man pulled out to do some administration. He has no combat tactical role in the Russian army. That, again, is an enormous weakness. And the other thing is um, their education system has suffered. So when the Cold War ended and Russian defence budgets collapsed because economic collapse, what happened was they invested only in certain areas. They invested in strategic areas. They invested in missile defense. They continued some investment in their submarine fleet. They continued some investment in the information warfare and internal security. The things that were important to the Russian state got money. The things that weren't important didn't. Education was one of those things. And that's pretty clear because one of the things that comes out on the whole from all of this, I think, is that the Russians have good doctrine. The fact that we had to change our doctrine in the 1980s completely to try, and to try and face them out does point to the fact that they knew what they were doing. We know from 1944 and 45 they knew what they were doing. They were very good at manoeuvring large groups of people, but they aren't anymore. Now the question is, uh, the question is twofold. First of all, why aren't they anymore? I think it's because the education system isn't as good as it was. Um, but there's also another thing. And it goes back to the, the first slides we talked about. Can he choose to do something different? Did they, was that attack on Ukraine, that limited attack, was that a limited attack because that's what he meant to do? Or was it a limited attack because that's all he could do? And that's a question that I don't know whether we can actually know the answer to. Or probably won't know the answer to that for several years. Because now he doesn't have the combat power to prove us wrong. So we don't, we're not able to know that, the answer to that question. Next one is morale. So the Russians have, um, have abused their soldiers for as long as time. Um, if you look at accounts from the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 and 5, the, just the ability of the, Russian, uh, of the Russian soldiers to take punishment from his own officers is incredible. And they've done this all through time. They are incredibly resilient. However, um, what I think might have been missed is the fact that people move on and that uh, Russian society, although even at a very, you know, is much more autocratic than our society, uh, there's still a degree of freedom. People will be asking questions and we see that all the time. We see, we see people deciding not to fight. And there was a chap yesterday who they were trying to round up who took his machine gun and, and started opening up on his own officers. Um, because these are things that wouldn't have happened in the old Russian army, but they do happen now because the culture of the, the people is perhaps changing. People want a bit more, a bit more freedom. So as time goes by, that, that morale factor will become more and more important. Morale has the other side. I think one of the really important things we need to learn is the will to fight and how that has been accelerated in, in, in Ukraine. The Ukrainian people are fighting for their lives in their own country and therefore they have a strong will to fight. 
if you're a conscript off the streets of, uh, probably not off the streets of Moscow actually, probably off the streets of some village in, in, in the Ural Mountains, uh, you probably don't care what you're doing. Uh, and especially when you haven't been told you're turning up to a war, uh, you, you're, you're probably not prepared entirely. But again, that's that directive, you don't need to know, you just turn up and do exactly as I tell you. Um, uh, it, that is that, that entire culture. And then we have the organisational, the kleptocracy, the low quality conscription. So conscription and even, and even people who join up, they don't jo you do not join up of your own accord largely from Moscow and St. Petersburg because you've got a life, you've got things to have. You join up and that's why so many of them are, so many of the conscripts who then become regular soldiers or regular soldiers full stop. They come from the backwards. They come from places where there are no jobs uh, and they are pretty lowly educated, much l less educated than, than sort of Russians from Moscow and St. Petersburg. So what you're dealing is with really low quality individuals, no NCO cadre, everything delegated to officers, but often to officers at high level. So you have to pass orders up and down the chain. Uh, and you can see it starts to it starts to become uh, a system which has no oil in it, just it's grinding away in its own gears. So if we look at the key military themes, then uh, really to 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 finish off uh, this. So Russian C two is still their key vulnerability, and everything hangs on that C two. So their ability to operate integrated air defence, the ability to operate artillery, their ability to put together attacks, all hangs on that C2. Uh, so if we can exploit that weak C2, we are in a stronger position. Sustainment, as we said, sustainment is they have their strengths, but they have enormous weaknesses. If we can extend the amount of distance they have to move their, uh, their logistics over, particularly, let's face it, once they reach if we were in a general war situation, once they reach the Polish border, they have, we think, probably had it in the future. They reach the Polish border, the railway gauge changes, they don't have the rolling stock, and they have to go to roads. When they have to go to roads, we know that after 60 kilometers, they basically run out of, run out of um, power. So by extending the amount of distance that they have to operate on, you, you are creating, uh, you're creating things um, for them. They have enormously good uh, uh, capabilities in bridging. You wouldn't think it from some of the stuff that's been go going on, but they have the ability to, to, to build pontoon bridges across distances that we can't even imagine, across all of the very wide uh, rivers of Eastern Europe. So they have that. Problem is, it doesn't, again, it seems like their doctrine hasn't, they haven't stayed up with the doctrine. So they know how to build a bridge, they just don't know how to do the whole bridging uh, thing over, over rivers. So it's really important that, that there you can exploit that inability in counter mobility. Um, IADS and counter UAS, we, we, we had great talks yesterday about, about these issues and, um, uh, and uh, USMDO uh, is, I call it say USMDO because there's a NATO MDO and the two things are completely different. Uh, typically we always change, we always get the, we take the words and we use the same phrases to mean two or three different things. But the USMDO is specifically designed to break into an IAD system. Uh, that is what it's for. People are sitting who probably think, oh, MDO means, you know, pulling in, uh, pulling in effects from different domains. Uh, it, it is entirely focused on one job. Uh, the US Army sees it as entirely focused on one job. I had that from the words from the mouth from Leavenworth. Um, they're quite frustrated with people thinking it's something bigger than it is. Um, but that's important. Fires and RSR, we discussed yesterday. EW and space. I'll talk about a little bit about that. Um, in the UK, we've all become very animated by data-centric warfare, uh, largely on the back of this. Um, data-centric warfare has been around a long time. In fact, all warfare is data-centric. Uh, probably Napoleon would recognise data-centric warfare. The, the point of this is, what's different? Well, the point is, in Afghanistan, British Army would use uh, sensors, etc. And we gather like a million data points a day. And then we'd have two analysts, two Lance Corporals, sitting there with a, with a million things to look through. And they'd go, well, what I'll do is I'll take the top 10 and throw the rest in the bin, because I can't get through that in a day. Uh, 
So uh, I'll look at the top 10. And then they look at the top 10, it tells them nothing, so they go, I guess we'll just do that. A guesswork. What the Ukrainians have got is 20 billion data points a day, all being fed into artificial intelligence, which is sorting it, organizing it, looking for algorithms, looking for patterns, and being able to predict where the Russians are going to be tomorrow. Not only that, but predict where they're going to be in 30 minutes, which means that they can bring fire in, f make those fires and get out. That is probably, I think, the biggest lesson for all of us. That is the future that we need to be looking at. The ability to sense, but turn the sense into shoot as fast as possible. And that means artificial intelligence, and that means using the technological benefits that we, that we find. Um, cyber and information. Cyber, not so much as we, as we might have expected, though um, in the cyber, in the real cyber community, people have been saying for a long time that the whole idea of, of cyber warfare, if you like, is, is massively overblown. Because it takes a very long time to create a program, and you have no control over that program once you release it. Once you release it, it starts coming back and affecting you. And in actual fact, uh, it can do more damage to you than it can to your opponent, which is probably why we haven't seen so much in cyber. But information warfare has been really important. Although all of these are just aspects. Um, air superiority or air control. So air superiority is traditionally thought of as, as, as the destruction of your enemy's air force. But I think what we've seen, and I think what was really important, is that in actual fact what it's about is just control of the skies, whether that comes from a missile on the ground or whether that comes from aircraft in the sky. And then we're going to talk about false assumptions. There are people wandering around who have been talking for the last X number of years how warfare is all about the urban. Right? There is no reason to think that future war will be any more in the urban than past war. The UK has a thing that comes out about every five years called Global Defence Trends. And it looks at the world. In the, last, in the last version, it said, because the world is more urbanised, there will be more war in the urban. It doesn't follow, does it? Why is the world more urbanised? Well, if you look into the figures, you realise it's because in the south, uh, Rio de Janeiro, in Brazil, South Africa, China, it's becoming more urbanized. But Europe is no, really no more urbanized today than it was in 1940. And we didn't have breakout of urban warfare then. Why didn't we? Because you have a choice. The Ukrainians and Russians have shown that given the choice, they don't want to fight in the urban. So this whole emphasis, NATO's emphasis at the moment, on urban warfare is wholly misplaced. It is important to know how to fight in the urban, but you get a choice. And don't choose to fight there because it, it's a mess. It's really difficult to fight there. So what you do is you use manoeuvre to surround and siege. It's like a medieval siege. If you're clever like the Ukrainians, you le leave your opponent with one way out and he takes that route. So it's not all about the urban. And be very careful of the single-issue Nazis, I call them. The single-issue zealot who has one thing they want to talk about, because we have them in every army. People who want to talk about helicopters. Helicopters will rule the world. Urban is the only way to fight. Data-centric warfare is the only way ahead. Computers will, will change the world. Warfare. Warfare is essentially the same thing it was 5,000 years ago. It consists of three things. Firepower, mobility, <coughs> protection. Or as JFC Fuller said, how to strike, how to defend, and how to move. What has changed is technology. So what you want to do has not changed in 5,000 years. How you do it has changed. So what we really should be looking at is how we use technology to help us do the things we've always wanted to do. Um, because, to paraphrase somebody else, technology has never won a war. There is no war in history that's ever been won by technology. Technology is uh, war, rather, sorry. War is won by people. People using technology. The, industrial, the internal combustion engine came into general use about, what, 1886? And was quite mature by the start of the First World War. It was an aircraft, etc. 
but it's only when people learn how that can benefit them, moving from horses to tanks in the 1930s and 40s. It's only at that period that it becomes mature. The technology isn't winning anything. People's agency, the way that people decide how to use it, is what wins the wars. And we need now to look at the technology that we've got to see how that can assist us to do age-old things, rather than, unlike some characters that we have in my army, uh, looking to change the whole way that war is, looking to change the character of warfare, whatever that means. It, it still only looks like getting up close to your opponent and stabbing him in the eye. Um, fundamentally, that will not change. So, other things that are false assumptions. Positional warfare. We have positional warfare zealots who tell us that, well, what we're going to do is we're going to put brigades into Eastern Europe and uh, we're going to sit still in a city and we're going to make the Russians come and attack us. And we're going to attrit them down by, by doing that. Attrition. Attritional warfare, positional warfare. Um, I, I just remind them of the Maginot line and say it didn't work particularly well then, did it? You know or Fort Ebon and Mail in, in Belgium, you know, just sitting still, waiting for something to get you, is really really not, not a war winning. Mainly because, of course, it's not offensive, and you can't win a war unless you carry out an offensive. You, no one wins wars by sitting still. You've got to get out there at some point, you've got to attack. Um, and then armour is dead. Uh, JFC Fuller, who was sort of the father, the godfather of... The godfather's probably a good idea for him. He's a very, very strange character. If you want to read about him, I would. He's absolutely fascinating. He was, he was into yoga and free love, and he was a Nazi, and uh, he had all kinds of strange things going on. He believed in the occult. Uh, he was a member of all kinds of strange groups. But what JFC Fuller says is that um, in 1917, he, when he was at, at, um, in France, where the headquarters of the British tank force, only created 12 months before, he was, he was being sent letters from headquarters saying, well, oh, the tank's dead, isn't it? The tank's dead now, because uh, the, the anti-tank gun, all the guns are being used in anti-tank role and just destroying our tank. And he said, no, the answer to that is, is a mass of tanks. That, that will break it through, which it then proved to do. And then the tank was dead in 1918. The British Army said, well, it's a very specialised role for a very specialised type of war. We won't need that again. Um, whereas the Germans said, that's quite an interesting thing, that, isn't it? We've only had like 20 of these, but the British use them quite well. It might be a way forward. 1940, we see just how effective they can be all the way through the Second World War. And at the end of the Second World War, people are saying, well, you know, the tank is dead, isn't it? Because we won't fight that kind of war again. Um, and so that is, again, our, our problem. Uh, constantly through history, the tank has been dead every five or ten years. And the tank finds its way of not being dead. And the way that the tank wouldn't be dead is if the Russians had have used those around those columns, those armoured columns, if they'd had infantry out as a screen, that wouldn't have been dead because they would have been straight into Kiev in that way. Uh, so the tank is by far and away not dead. So what does it suggest for NATO? And I'm going to whip through these really quick. I think I've covered off most of these. So a conventional tactical doctrine is probably on the nail because it was designed to fight the Soviets and essentially they're using similar tactics we think which means that it's still good good to go. We need to be more enemy focused and we need to constantly concentrate on combined arms maneuver. So maneuvering with a combination of arms to gain a position of advantage over your opponent that is what will win us uh, 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 battles against our opponent. But we haven't got any operational doctrine really and so we can do lots of tactical actions, but who's going to pull it all together to make it purposeful? Um, uh, and that goes to Jim's idea of purposefulness that he talked about yesterday. C2 resilience and all of those issues. And I'll end with that quote from James Mattis. Um, for questions. Sorry, but it raced in the end. Thank you, uh, Paul. Uh, I think we have time for a couple of questions uh, before the break. Um, yes, sir. Almost inevitable question. Are the Russians doing now something in order to uh, make up for the deficiency that you uh, pointed out? So, sir, uh, are they? 
The Ukrainians believe that they are trying to learn, but that it's not happening for them at the moment. The learning, or learning as they go doesn't appear to be a thing that they can do. They think they'll probably try and learn after this phase is over and look back and see what they can do. But at the moment, they're not. So, for instance, in that Kharkov offensive, um, we would have expected, if we come up against the Russians, that you'd come up against uh, defence in depth, line after line of depth positions, all supporting. What they found was they came up against linear, one line of barbed wire and some trenches. Once you were through that, you were into open ground behind, and this is why that Kharkov offensive was so successful. But then we look at now, so when they reached the edge of where they were going to exploit to um, last month, I said to them, when you, what are you finding now? You must be finding in-depth positions because surely they've learned. He said, no, no, they're all linear again. So there's no, not even at that low level is there the ability to learn on the hoof. They will learn given time, but they, they don't seem to be able to learn lessons fairly immediately, uh, which, is, which is just incredible. This by itself is a failure that should have been pointed out. And that is, th so it is a failure. And, and the other failure is, is, is the failure to, to adopt the doctrine. So the doctrine is there in the books and they have lots of it, but no one seems to have read it. And they all seem to be carrying on as if it doesn't exist and just, just, just working to, to whatever happens to them is how they, you know, they react to everything that happens. They don't seem to be learning from any one thing at any one time. And of course, the, the Ukrainians are pretty clear that, that they've killed all the people who can make the changes. Uh, because if you re remove that, that level of command at the top, they're the people who will initiate the lessons learned. You can't initiate lessons learned when you've got a couple of privates and a cook. Uh, they just can't pull that out of the hat. So again, it's, they are stymied a bit by the war but there are fundamental underlying problems. They used to be very good at this. So um, Russian lesson learned process was, was fabulous in, in, the, in the Red Army days, but it's just gone through lack of investment probably. Thank you. So. Thank you. I think... Um, it's the BBC, sorry. Uh, probably uh, football. And we have uh, one more question. That's the last one. Uh, Frederick Slidewell from... Uh, you talked a little bit about the. You talked a little bit about the um, Ukrainian attacks and their ability to coordinate their attacks. Yeah. Um, I'll just, from your impression, could you say a little bit about the technology? Um, my impression is that they're maybe not using. Uh, they don't have a NATO. What's going on? Yeah. They're not using a NATO style uh, communication and uh, command and control systems. Maybe they're just using mobile telephones. Um, and I was just wondering. You know, if they were using our systems, would they be able to coordinate so well? And what is your impression of how they're coordinating so no, well? If they had to use NATO's archaic and awful communication systems, they would be in a hell of a state. What they've done is they've, they've taken commercial telephones. So they, they use WhatsApp and, and Signal uh, largely. Uh, and why do they do that? Because if you're in the middle of a civilianized area, it's, the Russians can't find who's, who's military and who isn't. That, so there are thousands of WhatsApp messages, some of which are military. They can't anticipate w what that is. They can't, they can't break into it to, to be able to, to isolate it out. So they hide in, the, in, in plain sight with their comms. But they also use uh, a fabulous app um, to which everybody is a user and they all feed into it. So sort of a, crowd, a crowdsourcing thing. And then what happens is that the Russians break into that and they just shut the app down and they restart it again and issue the permissions. So the Russians do break in all the time, two or three times a day, but then they just take the Russian out and then start again. They also have different ways of command and control. So a lot of it's done by word of mouth. They don't depend on, on um, the electromagnetic spectrum because they know any transmission is going to be picked up. So they do things um, by word of mouth and liaison officers and, and those sorts of things. So it's, it's very, very flexible. It's very commercial. Um, and it's an infinitely better system than if we were to try and put signal regiments out and booming out signal all over the place, being blown up by Russian missiles, finding the signal because it's, it's on the military bandwidth. Um, it, it's just, it is a, it's a very clever way of working out what the problem is 
uh, and making it work. And obviously, other systems, Starlink, uh, etc., cetera, that, that, that help no end. You know, Starlinks get closed down all the time, and up goes some more Starlinks. Um, so it is just a case of resource. O most of this war is a case of who can resource for longest uh, and who runs out first, I think, probably. Just. Thank you, Paul. I think we need to uh, have a break then. Yeah. And um, so thank you very much for your uh, answers as well. Thank you, sir. And we will have a break until uh, nine, and then we'll start up with... Uh, and the next uh, presentation from the UK. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, before I introduce the next speaker, I would like to introduce to you uh, an honored guest from Ukraine. It's uh, Colonel Vasil Shvalyushinsky. He uh, is uh, working at um, Ukrainian uh, National uh, Defense University, but he's also the chief of staff of one of the defense districts around Kyiv. And he was participating or he led some of the fighting, planned some of the fighting until April this year. So a warm welcome to you, Vasil. And um, the next speaker is Lieutenant Colonel James Farrer. Um, he was commissioned in the 9th, 12th uh, Royal Lancers, Prince of Wales uh, Information Reconnaissance Regiment in May 1995. He subsequently became part of the Royal Lancers on amalgamation in 2015. The initial part of his career was spent uh, at regimental duty in the United Kingdom and Germany before engaging in command and staff appointments in the UK and abroad. Of note is the capability development at the United States Army Maneuver Center of Excellence in Fort Benning, Georgia, and the Army Concept Development in the Directorate of Strategy Army Headquarters, UK, and recently as the Chief Instructor at the Canadian Army Command and Staff College at Fort Frontenac, Kingston, Canada. He has fulfilled operational tours in Northern Ireland, Bosnia, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, and exercised in North America, Europe, Africa, and the Far East. In his current job, he has recently been responsible for enhancing British Army doctrine and warfare development from core to subunit utilizing combined arms maneuver. He is currently engaged in developing domain level warfighting and operational art. He is the deputy chief, uh, deputy chair of the NATO Land Operations Working Group and chair of the NATO Senior Land Doctrine Panel. He is a graduate of both the Indian Defense Services Staff College and the Indian Higher Defense Course. He holds a degree from Oxford Brookes uh, University and masters from both Cranfield University in the UK and the U University of Madras in India. So. Today he is going to talk about developing the domain level of warfare to generate land domain freedom of maneuver. Welcome, Jens. The floor Thank is you, yours. Thank you. Uh, Marn says, ladies and gentlemen, good, good morning. Um, I'm James Farrer. If I knew it was going to be read out, I'd have written less. I'm so sorry about that. But uh, got a bit carried away behind the keyboard back in, back in the UK. Um, if you don't mind, so I am the other half of the Q Barnes tag team. So the things that CDS asked us for yesterday I'm going to show you some thinking of where the British are going down that line. Okay, so everything you've just heard from Q, uh, please ask him why I call him Q at the end, and I'll ask me and I'll give you a different answer. Um, but everything that we, not James Bond, but everything that, um, that he has mentioned is as applicable to my presentation to you. Before I go into that, I just want to say thank you um, on a couple, of, couple of, of, of levels, really. Thank you to Norway for inviting us to this, to this conference. I want to say thank you to the Norwegian the Military Academy and thank you for last night. The Norwegian hospitality is absolutely un, un, unmatched, so thank you. It was really, really enjoyable. I was asked last night not to mention a number of things. One was the World Cup. Um, I'm sorry, if, you, if you're not at the World Cup, you're not missing out, don't worry. Um, and they also asked me not to mention Brexit, which comes out from a Brit every time that we speak anywhere. So I'll come back to that in a little bit. Now, in the beautiful city of Oslo, for those online who won't know the, the real enjoyment that we have being in Oslo, but... 
be in Oslo to touch cold outside, three weeks Christmas to a Norwegian, that's a wonderful time of happiness. To a Brit, that means there's time for at least two, at least two British governments. Um, <laughs> so I was really heartened yesterday with some of the comments that came out from, from the speakers. And if I, can, if I can circle back to some of those, you'll see how we try to join the dots and how we're applying our thinking to some of the, of the problems. So for, for, for Jim Stall, we've got some definitions. I'll have to refer to my notebook and read verbatim from, from them to get them, get them correct. I think um, from, from, um, from Ben yesterday, we are talking about society. I'll come back to that as well. And obviously from Mike, you're going to hear us talking about threat-led uh, analysis. Uh, from Dr. Rubin, you've heard us a bit, a bit about the UAS air piece, and I'll return to that at the very end. And try as I might, last night and this morning, I cannot fit the Lancaster model to any of things. <laughs> I've tried graphs and spreadsheets, and I, it just doesn't work. I'm sorry. I am a simple tank commander. Um, so what we're going to brief you on is unclassified. It's open source-ish. ish. Um, and the things that I do, as always, I speak about is not formal opinions from anyone other than really fr fr from me. I wouldn't bring in front of you th things that didn't have a foundation. So read into that as you wish um, as I go through some of the, the items. So I'm going to talk about th for about 30 minutes. I'm going to give you really five or six slides on context. I'm then going to get into the final three or four slides, so slides 9, 10, 11, and 12, which is the real focus of, uh, of our message, of the paper that we've written about how we're doing an applied approach to some of the lessons we're finding here from Ukraine and what that may mean for us in the UK. And, and I, if I may, what it may mean for some of you as well. And whilst you'll see pictures of British soldiers, Please imagine them to be your own soldiers, because probably the things will apply the same, but you'll be the judge of that more than I. So CDS yesterday asked us, how do we get after the deductions of all of these, these presentations? So what for us? And I'll show you that at the end, a line of thinking that we'll take, we'll take forward. So before I start into the lot, and I'm almost starting now, um, I speak very quickly, okay, if you don't know. So please, if I start speaking quickly, just put a hand up and slow me down and I will, I will come back to it. If I use terms like kleptocracy, is that right, Q? Pentafibians or quinquennial, those terms are almost superfluous <laughs> to uh, what you actually need, which is small, short, simple, simple terms. Okay, so let's talk about how we're evolving some British Army thinking in terms of the things we're finding in, in Ukraine. Now, I say it and there will be a flavour of Russia. You heard from Q earlier. Op mobilized was the British Army's focus on Russia. It doesn't just need to be Russia. It is our adver adversary, a state-on-state -state peer or peer-plus adversary. Read into that again as you wish, but this is applicable uh, around the world. So the bottom line up front that I'm going to sort of sell to you on this journey I take you in terms of the logic is we are re-establishing the operational level again back into the British Army, the mindset of the British Army, and you heard from Q why in Ukraine it's so successful, we think that is a, an area for us to go back into. So, the focus is on the land domain, on, and specifically. The title, Freedom of Moving the Appalachian Land Power, is Land Power in the Land Domain, and we can discuss at questions at the end, why land domain, not land component, because that's where you would normally default to. Okay. So these pictures are just backdrops. They were just taken from the defence photographic competition for the last four years. The next four slides are all the winners. They're all male. I don't mean that to be all male. They just happen to be the ones that won for no particular reason. But these are really just a backdrop uh, in terms of a little bit of colour. So some of the, sort of the bigger headlines, I'm saying this is a British perspective, but read into it as you wish. You may um, find that you have something similar. We all have integrated reviews coming, we have defence reviews, we have budgets, we have politicians, we have all those wonderful things, and we grapple with all of those. Okay, so the challenges are similar, I think, to most of the armies here, maybe not the US and maybe not Israel, a slightly different quirk, maybe, and so I think Ukraine as well. So hopefully you'll get those applied. I think post-Afghanistan, we realised, and Mike mentioned it yesterday, the operations other than war. There was a there was a real movement in the UK to look elsewhere in the world of what, of what and where we could do things that were not necessarily warfighting. I think Ukraine, what mobilise, has put warfighting back at the heart of the thinking of the British Army again. So we're back into that space now and we're now thinking, what does that mean and how do we get, get around some of those things? 
We had a term called the Integrated Operating Framework, just to make things more complicated, with a thing called Operate and Warfight, the threshold of armed conflict, Operate of the War. And then we spent a lot of time in this Operate space, in other parts of the world, doing things like Protect, Engage and Constrain, were the sort of the big buzzwords. That's really useful stuff when you're not warfighting. It's very hard to take that and put it into something that's meaningful for warfighting. And I do wonder, nations as aside, how many others have gone down that. Why? Because it's cheaper. It's cheaper and you have global effects, really, for, the, for, for, for less money. OK, so I'm just going to give you a couple of definitions here. So the title of, of the, the talk is Land Power. Let me just define that for you. So the, the land power is defined as the ability of land forces to exert decisive control and influence on actors or the course of events. That comes from UK land doctrine. Okay, I won't go through again. The bit I'll highlight from that and also define for you is what decisive control means. Because I think we need to understand what that means. And the definition for decisive control. Decisive control is achieved by seizing and maintaining the initiative through relative dominance in fighting power and particularly combat power. Okay, so you'll see as I take you on this journey how I'm narrowing the arcs all the time, getting to the end state, which will be reasserting operational level warfare. So let's just talk about the application of land power and what that means. So CGS, head of our army, said, get after it, British Army, war fighting in Europe tonight. Three things we needed to know. Who against, where and when. That really does put you in the crosshairs of focus in terms of, you know, not anywhere in the world doing anything, which we were before, we've now got a very specific um, uh, target state. So how do we get after that? The bit that CGS also said, which is always brushed off, unfortunately, by all of us, is get after warfighting against Russia and Europe tonight, dot, 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 in order to deter. And that's the bit that people forget. And that's the bit warfighting credibility allows us to do is get into the deterrent space. Right? And I wonder if we were a warfighting credible coalition, whether that deterrence is as effective as we think it is. I asked them really, for your armies, have you had such clear direction from your heads of the army as to where you think you're going? Um, now, the difference is Britain is a different Brexit, is a different nation to most, I get that. We have a different focus. We don't assume that we'll be fighting in Britain, for example. We will probably be fighting in one of your countries if things go, go that way. The mindset for British army is slightly different to the mindset for other European armies. So, and we understand that. So getting after Europe tonight in Russia, well, that's if you get the idea. Um, so when I was here last, I came to a, to a couple of conferences at the, um, the, the military academy. And I was here, we, you, had a, you had a guy who used to speak, a guy called Professor Dr. Julian Lindy French, who's probably well known to the Norwegians. He uh, gives a real fire and brimstone smashing of NATO and other countries in NATO. If you, you, if you know him, you'll know what I'm talking about. He highlights two things. One is he always highlights the same things. The countries that don't do the rest necessary GDP spend on defence. Get that? He also says there are only a couple of countries in Europe that have the freedom to do proper expeditionary operations elsewhere and have a society that will tolerate casualties come fatalities. That's quite a hard sell because a lot of us are driven by national politics. We don't like going to other people's countries and having casualties. It's quite hard to sell to the populace. Okay, the change of society that I mentioned to Ben, we were chatting about, about yesterday. Britain has comparatively quite a good resilience in society. We take casualties and we're sort of okay. We don't like it, but we're sort of okay with it to an extent, unless it's obviously your own particular family. Okay, Brexit, standalone nation, I do accept that. So I'm going to move on from Brexit now, if you don't mind. I can move on from Brexit other than, other than others. Okay, let's just talk about this. So I'm going to another definition for you. Military, uh, military success. So uh, military success is De, uh, is, de is, de uh, is um, determined by the ability for one protagonist to exploit the weakness of another. And that's really where we're after. Mission command, maneuvers approach, applying strength against weakness, all that good stuff. That's how we would best, best achieve it. It's achieved through the creation and uh, maintenance of freedom of maneuver. And freedom of maneuver is central to our thinking about how we take the lessons from Ukraine and apply them to the British Army. 
So I'll return to this numerous times at the end in terms of how we get after that particular thing. So what is freedom of manoeuvre? Let me help you with that definition. The freedom of manoeuvre, as we define it, is the ability to move or act freely to maintain advantage over the enemy. Okay? So whatever the enemy has, we wish to retain the ability to move and fight as we choose, not as we are directed to by our adversary. Get the subtlety? I'll come back to why that's important when I show you Russian capabilities that Q talked about and how we look to tackle some of those. So freedom of, of manoeuvre allows us to decide and act decisively when we choose to, which is the, that's where we wrest initiative away from, uh, from our adversary. I'll come back to that in, in due course. So, can we just do this? Can we just take the publications that, you know, that I was responsible for in the UK, core to subunit combined arms doctrine, and just say, right, that was went out over the last 15 years, let's bring it back in again. Go on, British Army, get after it. We can't. We have a problem that we need to address. And part of that is a cultural change. I'll come back to this in a bit more in a minute. This is where our staff colleges absolutely earn their pay. So we've got to reset a mindset and a cultural basis of our armies back into, into this space. So, I mean, 15 years of counterinsurgency has cost us. It's also, it's also rewarded us as well in terms of experience. What's it cost us? It's cost us in troops and lives. That's inevitable. And, of course, both sides. I'm not saying... What we were doing was only right. We were obviously in both sides. Resources, credibility, knowledge, our own knowledge. Uh, and I think that's quite, it's quite, it's quite tough. Now, whether Iraq and Afghanistan were the right or wrong things, I'm not going to get into the politics of it, but they are part of history, and history will tell the wrong or the right. If I may, there is a book, and I'm sorry, Q, you are here, but I talk about this all the time. There's a wonderful book that was presented um, at the Combat Maneuver Conference in Fort Benning, Georgia, back in 2014, by an author from Texas AMU called Brian McAllister Lynn. The book is called The Echo of Battle, and it charts the profile of the US Army post-campaigning. And it's quite a dry read, I'll be honest. So don't do it in one go. Give it in small bite-sized chunks. I will summarize it for you by saying the two key findings that, that he elicits in the book that the US Army has shown in those periods. And he takes the 1950s as his case study. Why? Because, as Q was mentioned, technology was changing quickly. Radar was in, helicopters were in, all that other good stuff. His findings of the, of the, of the, of in the book are two. There are lots, but the two ones I want to highlight. And I ask whether this applies to Norway, to Germany, to Russia. One is talent, the brain, is sucked up from the field army into their quarters. Headquarters are fully established, but you hollow out capability in the field force. Point one. Point two, you don't recognise the degradation of the operational experience of your officers and senior NCOs and soldiers. Consequently, when you look to cut budgets, the things that you cut first are the soft effects, the courses. They get shorter, they get under more pressure. When actually, to compensate for the lack of knowledge, they need to get bigger. You need to teach them more. Help them to have this mental image for your young... And I spoke to your, your three young... Backed, what do you call them? The guards? Backed, is that the right term? Last night. You know, how do you get young men and women, who they were exceptional by the way, get them to visualise things? Does it matter? They may not be in Afghanistan, I get that. But how do they get them to understand this combined arms manoeuvre thing? You know, so in your brigade, with the brigade commander gone, but your brigade south in the north, that's how you get that, get that set. So that's what um, Brian Lynn was, was banging on about. So we understand. And I, I don't know, perhaps over a glass of coffee or later on or a glass of beer tonight, you may tell me whether you think that applies, applies to you or not. But we need to make some changes, and that's what we need to get after. So this actually is a genuine photograph from Afghanistan, from one of the British fobs. You may, for those of you who served in Afghanistan, you'll look at the poor lad's eyes and you'll think, I can probably relate to what he's thinking is, what the heck am I doing here? This is horrible. Get me out of here. I don't even understand anything that's going around me. Sort of normal how we spend our time in the British Army in absolute the darkness for most things, um, just getting after whatever. I'm being facetious, but you'll, you'll understand. But so how do we get this lot to understand? The problem for us in the British Army is it's not just young privates. This is now battalion commanders, brigade commanders, whose only frame of reference is this type of warfighting. So how do we get them back into that combined arms space? Well, we have a challenge. Uh, and I can't say exactly what the answer is, but you'll see I'm leading you down to a similar path. What we want to do, though, is this. 
This is what armies are designed for. This is why we are different to the other government departments. We do this and we do it quite well, or we did do, do it quite well. I think we do do it well now, but we do it in a different way from what we used to do. You know, I think Hugh's comments about the Russians and their pontoon bridging and their ability to, you know, do things great, well done, you know, are, are we that good at those sort of things? I, I, you will have your own reflections. So, for the British Army, the British doctrine, the three core tenets, similar to NATO doctrine, mission command, maneuvered approach, combined arms approach. For us, those three come together and give us combined arms maneuver. Okay, ability to apply, and I'll come on to this a bit more in a second, our strengths against our adversary's weaknesses and guard ourselves against our adversary's strengths. Gives us combined arms maneuver, freedom of maneuver. That's the point to decide and act as we wish. So history tells us, and I'm not a historian, I'm a simple tank commander. Q is our walking brain, so please talk to him about history. Okay, he, history tells us, and I'm going to have a wonderful little quote for you in a second, that armies that understand in a forensic way their enemy and themselves and do combined arms manoeuvre win. It's that simple. If I can distill down all of the politics, it comes down, down to that. You know, is this a new idea? Yeah, well, resurfaces periodically. Here's a little quote for you. Know thy enemy and know thy yourself. In a hundred battles, you'll never be defeated. Do you know who said that? Sun Tzu. Okay, so it's not new. I mean, we've known this for a long time. Have we gone away from really understanding our enemy? Ukraine are showing us many things about our enemy. And, I, and, and if I may um, uh, just go back to a comment from yesterday, I was going to ask, I, I ran out of questions in the end because I thought it was you know, a bit too much, but the house of cards, which is a British expression for taking a deck of cards and making it into a house, is very fragile. And you take one card out and the whole lot falls down. It must be the same in Ukraine. When you look to rebuild your house, the cards that you choose first are quite important. And I do wonder with our experiences in Ukraine, the Ukrainian army's experience and Russia's experience, what cards will be built first as they rebuild a house. That is quite indicative of what they've learned from the operations. So if Ukraine, for example, sir, it looks at a particular suite of capabilities, you'll know they've clearly found that to be a catalyst for, 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 for success. Okay, so as we look at rebuilding, it tells us about future war fighting. If hindsight to foresight works the same. Okay, so that's all reasonably um, straightforward. I was going to give you one more definition, if you don't mind, which is combined arms manoeuvre, and this is a bit of a doctrinal fest, I know, but bear with me, but hopefully it'll save the questions uh, when we get to it at the end. So the definition for combined arms manoeuvre at the moment is the orchestration of task organised capabilities in combination to target and exploit an opponent's vulnerabilities in order to achieve positions of advantage, which can be psychological, temporal, or physical. Okay, so we all understand combined arms maneuver, or do we? Do we understand combined arms maneuver in Afghanistan? We did, that variety, but is it the same one that we want now? I don't know, question. Just to make things really complicated, um, the Brits have just mixed it all up and confused ourselves no end, because we just do that and we then write doctrine about it and send it to everybody else and say, why don't you do our doctrine? And then we don't really understand it either. So we had under, and this is my opinion, by the way, before I go anywhere else, devise this thing called integrated action. You would call it a uh, comprehensive approach in NATO uh, and other bits. So we used to have a thing called integrated action. I know you can't read it there, so I'm just going to come forward and put my glasses on. I'm going to read it for you if you're at the back because you won't be able to see it. It's the different definition. Integrated action is the purple box at the top. It is the orchestrated uh, use of a full range of capabilities to change or maintain the attitude and behaviour of audiences necessary to achieve a successful outcome. Okay? So that's what we used to have, integrated action. What did that mean? That meant a young platoon commander was sat in his fob in Sangin, thinking, or in Helmand, thinking, I'm going to get a satellite feed, a cyber feed, and everything else at my platoon. Is that a reality? Well, it was in Afghanistan, and that was what people got used to. And you've seen the inversion of the levels of command of empowering the more lower levels of command. We get that. The US in particular, I'm going off tangent a little bit, you know, removed divisional level artillery and put it down at the BCT because that's what they were fighting in Afghanistan. They think, please correct me, Team USA, that's now going back up again to allow a divisional commander to shape the battlefield for their brigades. Okay, so go back to where we were. 
We really hash hashed that one up, and it confused everybody, because that's so generic, it's useful platoon to government. Consequently, we've now taken that, decided, we've decided it, and we've just pushed it up. It's something that we can't really do at the tactical level. We need to keep tactics focused on tactical actions. So there's a general in the UK, General Mike Elvis, commanded our third division, we actually of, the th of the three divisions we've got, okay, and a call, sort of. Um, he was saying, look, at the divisional level and above is where we do this stuff. Brigades and below, you just do tactical actions. Just focus on that. I will set the rest of it for you. We've lost that by empowering two to the depth. Anyway, so there we go. So a little bit of higher tactical and upwards is integrated action. We then focus on the combined arms bit, the bit that we need to get better. And you'll hear me talk about this in a minute as I get onto my proper slides, 9 to 12. So for combined arms, a synchronized and simultaneous application of arms to achieve an effect greater than if each element was used separately or sequentially. You've heard that from Hughes and his observations from where some of the failings were in Russia. You've heard that from us in terms of there, where we think we can add real value, where we get better at things. Okay. Right, this is it. So this is the key bit. That's just the context. Hopefully I've taken you with me as I've thrown random different bits at you. Um, but you'll get the logic as to where we're rethinking about this problem set. So here's perhaps, this is our solution, part solution, some of the issues. Right, I'm going to give you one more quote before I do um, go, get on to this bit. I'm just going to give you a summary, of really, of what I've got to with those sort of contextual bits. So it says, whereas in the past it was possible to win uh, wars through decisive battles, today wars can only be won by a decisive campaign or even a series of campaigns. A successful outcome across the whole operating environment demands an approach which coheres a number of successful tactical actions. The orchestration is provided by the operational function, which both supports the tactical um, level uh, effects created in other domains and sustains it to prevent culmination, thereby ensuring retention of, initi of the initiative and freedom of manoeuvre. So doing individual activities is not sufficient. You've got to link them all together, make them into a com campaign, and orchestrate that, as Q was saying, at a level of division core, whichever level it is. Okay, okay, right, here we go. So, you've already heard about Op Mobilize, CGS task to us. Again, your own armies will have your own views. It NATO has something different. You've heard from Commander Lancom, who spoke to us in Izmir last year. Uh, he's no longer there. It's now, you understand how uh, uh, NATO have slightly rebalanced. Um, we've now got a four star, not a U star. It's always good to go down to, to Izmir when you get a fiery US three-star giving you that fire and brimstone warmer in the bank first thing in the morning. They, I mean, only US three-stars can do that with such passion, really. Then, um, you know, you, you, you want to go away and comb your hair and shine your shoes because you're going to get picked on by something you've done wrong. But anyway, look, so we've given that and we went away and had a think about this problem set. And what we decided was, going to go back to what, as, at my age, we used to do before, Go back to answer question one of the estimate process. What is the enemy doing and why? And make it really simple for all of us. So a threat-led approach. Mike, I'm back in your space again. Taking a threat-led approach, lessons from Ukraine, things that Q's covered, and others, and decide what we, what we want to do with those. So this gave us a couple of things. It gave us an opportunity um, over time to influence how we develop um, domain-level tactics, formation-level tactics, and our readiness profile and posture. I'll come back to that at the end. It's the last box of these five. Two key lines of effort for us came out. And again, we lay this out logically, so hopefully you'll follow the, 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 the thinking that goes through it. First of all, threat. You know, I think we are comfortable um, on a variety of reasons, particularly from the experiences in Ukraine, as seeing on contemporary operations and history, because history tells us not much has changed, how Russia will fight. We think we know how Russia will fight. I think we have a pretty good idea um, how Russia will fight. Okay. So we had a threat symposium. I'm afraid it was above secret. I can't tell you the details of it. Um, but um, it highlighted some areas that, from our analysts, where we thought we would have um, critical capabilities in Russia, where they would use things to get their own freedom of manoeuvre, and there were critical vulnerabilities, the things that we could look to exploit. And I'll come back to those um, in a little bit. So we know that Russia will do things 
to try and impede our freedom of maneuver. Let me put this in an example for you. You know, I think as a simple tank commander who believes strongly in combined numbers maneuver, I like to have forces laid out that I can aggregate at the point of time I need something to be decisive and then disperse again. So we operate at the moment, thanks to the 2014 Ukraine operations, and now under a fear of mass artillery. Is that a fair assumption? So our armies plan to operate dispersed to negate that threat. Why do we let that happen? How do we get more muscular to prevent Russia from applying massed fires to allow us to maneuver the way we want to maneuver? Because that's our way of war fighting. You might be thinking, this guy obviously had too many glasses of wine last night. He's talking, he's talking. But think about the muscular approach. Now, the key part to that is land ca the land domain cannot do that on its own. How do we get the other domains to help set the conditions for the land domain? Why is the land domain important? I know we're all army by and large, a couple of, so a couple of other, other ones. The land domain is important because it's decisive. It's where decisive actions happen. So there are two domains of the five, land and maritime with the two decisive. That's where people are and we have a decisive outcome. The other ones, excuse me, Air Force, Cyber and Space, are almost enabling to those two. I mean, I'm being provocative, but you'll understand the logic that I'm applying, applying with it. So that was the first one, a threat-led approach, understanding our adversary and how they will have strengths and vulnerabilities. What do we then target to allow us to have our own freedom of manoeuvre? The second one was a more focused, proactive approach. What do you mean more focused, proactive? It's all about freedom of manoeuvre, how we generate those conditions um, at the domain level. So what do we ask from the other domains to help us um, to achieve that? So for a simple land commander, being given a series of tactical activities, you know, within the British Army, or any army, that's what you want your tactical commanders, brigade commanders to, to achieve, to nest the overall objectives set to them by the joint commander. And that's really what we're at. So we're not saying doing this on our own, we're saying we've got to nest into a joint plan, but we need to be able to get it in the tactical bits. Okay, so focusing on areas that matter most to us in relation to the, to the threat, unlocking maneuver, as I mentioned, um, cross-domain dependencies, what do we need from the other domains, and especially where land cannot do it by itself. So let us the three outcomes, and that's the three bits. So obviously I've touched on threat, and now you're in the domain maneuver space, you're seeing why I'm using the term domain, land domain, not land component because I need the other domains to help us be decisive in that domain. Okay? So combined arms maneuver, and what I would say is these two here, I would put it under a strap line of making red less impactful. These ones here, I'd put under making blue better. If that's a strange analogy. Okay? So, um, let's just have a quick look at um, those three uh, outcomes. Combined arms maneuver, tactical um, priorities, so getting after better training, better equipment, our own capability stuff, normal sort of bits and pieces. The annual training cycle, getting better at our, our jobs. Nice and easy. Orchestrating capability development, looking really at where we want to focus capability development to get the right freedom maneuver for us. So we have problems in the UK in terms of, you know, all sorts of, we have all sorts of problems. But getting capability that we need as an army is one of our problems on time, in budget, and that's actually relevant. What we're saying here is actually target your adversary and make sure you have capabilities to impede them. I don't think we do enough of that, um, if I'm honest, but, but you may disagree with me. And then finally, once you know how Russia will, 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 will um, deploy, in what sequence, because we know their sort of templates, how do we mitigate and match those deployment options? So how, what kit do we have on readiness? So our high readiness or very high readiness forces, what profile do we keep them at? What profile do we have in terms of, I know, EW and cyber and other bits to mitigate those Russian, those Russian um, th and threats? Okay, so the last couple of slides and then I've, then I've done. So what? So how do we get this change to happen? So resetting from warfighting, or sorry, into warfighting from counterinsurgency is quite a good one. A really hard pill for senior officers to swallow if all they've known is Counterinsurgency. I'll be honest, it's just, it's just human nature, or, you know, but it takes a convincing, compelling um, discussion. Okay, um, it's not just about doctrine, as I've mentioned. So, and then getting after the domain level ac activities. What's, what happens in terms of maximizing our freedom maneuver? So, how do we maneuver as we want to maneuver? What capabilities do we need? And what trainings do we need to, do we need to undertake? And what, how do we want to shape the environment to allow us to, to do that? So, how do we set the right dependencies from 
the other, other domains. So in the UK, I'm, I'll be myopic about the UK, we have a series of joint exercises. Um, none of them are centred around the land domain. They're all air and maritime. This is historical, because land has done its own thing. It's never really asked for bits. What we'll do is we'll set up a land warrior, an exercise that sends a demand signal to the other four domains, what we need, to try and get them to understand how better support the land, the land, the land work. Okay. Right, this is the slide that Q just showed you. I'm almost done now. Q showed you. I've just taken it and just tweaked it a little bit. Okay. What I've done is I've just broken it into two halves and I've just reordered them slightly. You'll see why in a second. Because so this the same things you just mentioned. I think they're this. I may have tweaked a couple of the words too. Bear with me. I was it was it was you know good idea. So they're what Q has very eloquently explained to us this morning. If I put this into a different bit and say, look, this is ballpark, unclassified stuff. I'm going to use the wrong term here. Capabilities that Red have to allow them to do freedom manoeuvre. I call those high value targets in gunner speak. Down here, Red capabilities that, MP if, that if I struck them would help me with my freedom of manoeuvre. I'd call those high payoff the wrong term, but please just bear with me. I now know the sort of areas I need to focus on while still maintaining my own blue capabilities. Does that, does that make sense? Okay, so I now know in terms of operationalizing my capability development, supporting my training and getting after a specific outcome, I've now got a quite a good focus. Okay, based on all the things that, that Q has mentioned. So, what are we gonna do? We're going to do a bunch of things. We're going to do um, continue studying our adversaries, but I think with meaning, genuine purpose, threat-led, question one, putting that back in terms of the psychology of the army. What does it mean? What, who can tell us? Now, not all of those things come from land. Some of the best intelligence, if you don't mind me saying, comes from maritime and air, because they've had a different relationship with their adversaries over the last 15 years as we've been sat in Iraq and Afghanistan. Their understanding of changes is different to ours. So seeing how they deal with these issues is quite interesting. Okay. So there we are. So we're going to keep studying that. We're then going to look at which of the capabilities on the left we can target and how develop capabilities to get after some of those. And then we're going to keep maintaining our blue, getting our blue better. Because this is really what the army does in terms of the combined arms maneuver piece. Right, that's me done. Rand's expended. Um, I put this up just as the same sign that Q used. I'm just going to use the one phrase that the Dutch use at the Land Operations Working Group, which is think beyond the ink. I'm not sure if it's a Dutch phrase, but they seem to think they own it. So someone will tell me it's a Norwegian phrase or something, and um, they just still have no idea. But we've, that's the easy bit. I've let out the stall in terms of how we think we want to operate in the future. Lessons from Ukraine. Things that the Ukrainian army has shown us have been successful. How do we make something out of those? Now, this is very early in the thinking. Q and I would welcome your challenge. That's why we've brought this paper to the conference. Um, I don't think we have it right. I don't have an ego in it. I think I have an I we have an idea, and this is an area we'd like to get after. <coughs> we would welcome your comments. Thank you, James. Um, we have uh, now the opportunity to have some questions, and uh, we have a couple here. We can start with uh, Brigadier General Paul Berglund. Thank you, sir, for a great presentation. Uh, and both this and the, the last one <coughs> I see in context. And um, is my assumption right that the conclusions and the analysis that you have done, it's somewhat contradictory to the conclusions leading up to the latest British white paper. Uh, and uh, so what uh, is this? How do you expand on it from being a sort of army internal into making proper conclusions for future development? Yes, I think it's, uh, I'm on the cusp of talking politics here, so I, 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 I can't, but great question. The, um, so the last white paper in the Strategic Defence Review from two years ago set us down a path of other activities, and I'd put them into their operate space, non-war fighting. I think, no, we had a Prime Minister that sat in the House of Parliament and said, there will never be a tank battle in the mainland Europe again. The tank is dead, 
let's move on, shall we? Let's get to the bit that CDS referred to yesterday, that novel technology, the leap of faith of some w other way of doing business. What February told us this year is that's not the case, and therefore, how do we get after this again? Half of our procurement process has gone down that novel technology, so we need to let that continue, because there is goodness in it, but we also need to know we need to keep these conventional capabilities back at the centre. So, Defence Review is coming out next year. Our CDS is involved in it this week. Um, so, we are trying to reset the balance back again. You know, Now, the question I would ask is, after Russia has spent in Ukraine, or, um, you know, and it's trying to develop its own capabilities, what next? Where's after that, that one? That, and that is a challenge for the land component, because it may not be quite so focused in Europe, maybe elsewhere, further east, perhaps. Um, so, so I fully accept what we wrote in the white paper isn't necessarily in keeping with this, but I think the situation has changed enough for us to have a rethink about how do we get after the capabilities we need in the next 10 years, for example, uh, in, in Europe, or more. But that I think we've let atrophy over, over time. That answer, does that help? Thank you. Without saying anything about politics or politicians. Sorry, thank you. Uh, Michael from the Swedish HQ. Uh, you were talking about domains, and in Sweden we are uh, talking and discussing the combination of updrags tactique with joint all domain command and control. Is it possible, or how do you combine those two and integrate them, the, the, these two uh, concepts? Could you elaborate a little bit about the difference when you talk about maneuver uh, and the joint all domain? Yeah, uh, so concept. Thank you. So there was a wonderful Einstein quote, you know, if you have a, an hour to solve a question, you spend 59 minutes understanding the question before you spend the last minute solving it. We spent quite a bit of time thinking about this idea and how do we, how do we, un, um, how do we cut ourselves away from people's preconceived ideas about things? So we took domain, not component, because the natural way is component, because I think all those thoughts about, you know, Maneuvers approach and the rest of it, it gets tied to a componency level. And that gives a C2 element and it's brigade, core, division. We didn't want to get in that space because actually this is applicable at any level in any bit. It's all about the land domain. So that's why we end up going down that path by perhaps the things you're talking about really is tying into the reality of componency. So try and keep this as a f as a f unfettled idea. We've kept it in that slightly ethereal domain space. Um, but knowing it will become components at some point and it'll be into that space. So this is just too early to get after the orbits. Give us a bit of time, maybe next year. So if you invite us back, Mom, if you invite us back to your conference next year, we'll give you an update. Um, but we'll evolve this thinking a little bit further. Then we have a Jim Storr. James, thank you for that. What I hear from you is very interesting, but um, I would ask for your opinion on this contention. What you're talking about actually is that about five or ten years ago the British Army lost a resources battle, F-35s, two major carriers, but that happens all the time. The real reason, and I think it's a sadness amongst us as professionals, is that we, the British Army, lost an intellectual battle about five or ten years ago, and particularly to the adherence of novel systems. I'd be grateful for your observations. Uh, that's a that's that's a, a great question and probably easy to answer because I, I totally agree with you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I do, but I do wonder, if, Jim, if you don't mind, uh, can I just open to see anyone else, anyone else wish to share? You may not wish to share publicly, but I think other armies have done the same. I think NATO has probably done a bit of the same. I think we have, you know, got s slightly consumed by. Sorry, I'll go back to my. I don't want to take you too much away from elsewhere. Some of these issues. I mean, Q mentioned data-centric warfare. I mean, this is a real thing, the MDO, MDI, US and UK and NATO. You know, so we've seduced ourselves that there are other ways of not having to think through a problem. And one of our greatest assets is how we think through problems. So I totally agree. So I think we threw a little bit of the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah, that's an expression in the UK, which is the good ideas out with the bad. I'm not sure that translates. Anyway, you get the idea. So I do have this question from the last session, which I, I won't have time now to do it, but we'll come back to it on the panel this afternoon about the US and NATO MDO explanation. If you're happy, if you're happy, we'll come back to that this afternoon. Q can give us a good burst on that. Thank you, James. Thank you.
I think we need a break now and then we'll uh, gather again at 10 o'clock. So thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, the next speaker uh, is uh, Major Jacob Henry from uh, the United States Military Academy. He is an armor officer serving at the United States, uh, United States Military Academy as an instructor in American history. He is graduated from the United States uh, Military Academy in uh, 2012 and commissioned into the armor branch. He served as a M1A2 tank platoon leader with the 4th Infantry Division, deploying in support of Operation Spartan Shield in 2013. He then trans transitioned into the role of an M2A3 Bradley Company XO and deployed again in support of Operation Spartan Shield in 2015. Upon uh, graduation from Maneuver Captain's Career Course, Major Henry served as an assistant operations uh, officer in a striker cavalry squadron. He commanded a, re a reconnaissance troop and HQ troop from 2018 to 20 in the same formation. After command, Major Henry attended the George Washington University in Washington, D.C., where he studied under notable Cold War policy experts Hope Harrison and James Hirschberg. In 2022, he graduated with a Master of Arts degree in history from George Washington University and produced a prize-winning thesis titled Polar Bears and Bolsheviks, the American Expedition to North Russia and the Impact of Military Operations on National Policy. Today, he will present um, Armored and Alone, the shortcomings of a Russian BTG. So, Jacob, please. Thank you very much, sir, and I appreciate the, the kind words. I would like to say raise hi to my fellow colonial, uh, Sean Callahan, who's streaming in live, we heard last night. Anyone who's interested uh, in how the United States Army's intervention into Russia in the winter went, please let me know, because it's a fascinating topic that we decided to do that 100 years after Napoleon. But that's not what we're here today to do. We're here to talk about the Russian Battalion Tactical Group. So, as an armor officer, I think this really interests me, and I hope it interests you as well. But that said, uh, every word up there is, is true, but especially the ones at the bottom. These views are my own. They do not reflect uh, history department policy, West Point policy, United States Army policy, the same thing that you've heard several times, but I must reiterate it. With that, I think we can go on. Okay. So I understand. Uh, I teach a bunch of 18-year-olds at 7.30 in the morning, so if I see some nodding off, I, I get it and I understand. If you just want to read this slide and go out and get coffee, I also understand. Because this is what we're going to do today, ladies and gentlemen. I'm first going to talk about what is a BTG. Uh, in the spirit of Jim Store, I do want to have a definition. The BTG is a very flexible organization. It, it isn't, no two BTGs are the like. I don't want to call them a snowflake, but they're, they're a bit of a snowflake organization. They're all unique. Then we're going to talk about how they came to be. Uh, I want to really emphasize this theory called zones of combat that Soviet planners, not Russian planners, but Soviet planners used in the development of the BTG in the 1980s. And then we're going to talk about some of their shortcomings, and this is why we're all here. I've narrowed it down to three broad shortcomings. The first and foremost is the, the lack of qualified infantry personnel in the BTG. The second one is, and I don't want to step too much on my qualified colleagues' toes here who are following me up, they have significant issues in their organic resupply and maintenance, and those are compounded by some other issues that are inherent in Russian culture. And then span of control. We know that the Russian officer is not well trained at the company level, but I think there are issues that we, also, we must also talk about uh, that are beyond just training, but get after the span of control and what the force structure looks like in a Russian BTG. And then very briefly, I have some numbers from mid-November. We'll talk about how many BTGs are the equivalent of a BTGs have been destroyed in the 2022 phase of the Russo-Ukrainian war. And then we're gonna talk about how they can get better. There are some simple things that the Russian BTG can do. I know we talk in here a lot about how, you know, they may not be super flexible. Some of their best officers are no longer officers, um, but these are simple steps and these are the ways that I think they'll go forward. With that said, what is the Russian battalion tactical group? I meant for this to be more of a rhetorical question, but 
I'm outclassed by a lot of the men and women in this room, so I'll just go ahead and put the force structure up there. Bottom line, even though most of them are unique, the Russian BTG looks exactly like this. It is a battalion-sized element, 700 to 900 personnel when fully complemented. You have one armored company, three mechanized infantry companies, an air defense company, an anti-tank company, and this is most flexible, uh, maybe three, maybe four artillery companies. The way that that looks, um, there's about one armor company that's got 10 main battle tanks. Those main battle tanks, we'll see a slide later, are not all the same. They could be anywhere from a T-64 to a T-90. I don't think we've seen the T-14 Armada yet. I don't think we will probably at this phase of the operation. The three infantry companies typically are comprised of BMP-1, 2, and 3s, maybe BTRs, maybe a mix of other vehicles. And then the uh, artillery companies are a mix between rocket, so MLRS equivalent, and 152 millimeter SBGs. I want to be very clear though, these are not the way that the United States Army would see a formation. They're not organic. They come from a higher level headquarters and are all kind of smashed together to form a BTG. And then when they're done with that BTG, they separate. And I'll show you that here in a second. But at the end of the day, they're designed to be self-sufficient, relatively mobile, and with organic resupply. And the big so what that I have it in all caps, so if you're in the back, I'm sorry if you can't see it. The BTG has a lot of firepower. Uh, just for reference, an American Striker Brigade combat team has one company that has a 105 millimeter cannon on it. There are seven of those companies in the entire United States Army. The BTG, each company of BMP-3s has the equivalent firepower. So each BMP-3 company is the equivalent of an MGS Striker platform company in the Army, in our Army, and we only have seven of those companies. A lot of millimeters of firepower in the Russian BTG. Let's see how they use it. All right, so the history of the Russian BTG. In the 1960s to the 1980s, uh, Soviet planners looked at the American New Look, and I don't want to confuse that with the 2009 Russian reforms, but American New Look and American Flexible Response and decided they wanted to do something very similar. They emphasized what's called zones of combat. These zones of combat are hotspots, if you think of a map. They, they think, they thought, that instead of having linear warfare, you'd have places where there'd be a lot of action, places there wouldn't be very much action. And so you take this divisional structure, some of your best units, you comprise them into a battalion tactical, gr tactical group, and then you put that at the hot spot, and then you disperse it. I put mass up here. Um, I, don't, I don't know, if, is that concentration now? I don't know if I got the word right, but it's up there, it's in the slide, so we're gonna use the word mass. So they're designed to come together, have a lot of mass, a lot of mobility, and then back dispersed. And they played around with the composition. It could be a main battle tank and BP BMPs, uh, it could be BMPs and BTRs, wheeled vehicles. It could be all main battle tanks. The, they figured out a method that worked and they, they tailored it to unique environments. Up here is Afghanistan. So the way it breaks down is this slick little animation. You get your units together. You give them an objective. They achieve that objective. And then they go back to their higher headquarters or disperse. Simple as that. At the end of the day, it was always a balance between survivability and mobility. Can you get to where you need to be? And can you survive the fight when you get there? That's what the BTG is designed to do. So how has it done? I've limited uh, myself and for your own sake to about three or four conflicts. That way we don't get too drugged down to it. But Chechnya, there are two different examples I want to use in Chechnya. The first is on December 31st, 1994, uh, the Russian army, the one, specifically the 131st Motorized Rifle Brigade and a couple of its regiments went into the city of Grozny. Um, that brigade came out with 18 of its vehicles and a few dozen of its soldiers. Uh, the other 100 or so vehicles and 800 soldiers remained in Grozny. Put simply, it did not go well. They were able to use canalizing, the Chechens were able to use canalizing ter uh, terrain. The Russians did not employ their infantry correctly. They realized that urban warfare may or may not be shifting towards, towards urban warfare in the future. That's up for debate. But urban warfare was incredibly difficult for them. So what they do, they reorganize their units, uh, not with the composition in war, but in garrison environments, into these units that are more trained, and then there are units that are not quite paper, but they're conscript units. They're not fully manned, they're not fully trained. Those are your reserves, your call-ups. Those are not the ones you expect to send into a city at the very outbreak of war. They reorganized, they went back into Grozny five years later in the Second Chechen War in 1999, 
And they just didn't go into the city, period. They employed siege tactics. They surrounded the city, they bombarded the city, and they crawled their way through it. The UN ended up calling Grozny in 1999 the most destroyed city on earth. But they took it. And that's what they learned in Chechnya. And we have a Georgian in the room, so stand up and yell at me if I get this wrong. But in Georgia, they employed the same thing. The Georgian war is over in 12 days. Uh, the, the Russians won. I, I don't know if there's many other way to cut it. But to be clear, they only won because of their overwhelming firepower, overwhelming numbers. The, the BTG, again, did not perform well. Makarov, at the end of it, called it an absolute disaster. It was because they had a very burdensome chain of command. The reporting from the BTG went all the way up to the military district and all the way back down. So they learned to cut a few of those phases out. Right now, there's about four links between the BTG and the military district headquarters. There used to be over six, closer to eight, depending on the operation, depending on the regiment, depending on the division, depending on the military district. And then they went into these new look reforms. This is the Russian new look in 2009. These new look reforms completely eliminated the paper units that I talked about in the last slide uh, that they learned from in Chechnya. They reduced their officer corps. And that's going to make them, yes, more streamlined, but it's going to cause an issue in a later slide where I talk about how there's a span of control problem. So they reduced their officer corps by about 30%. They reduced their army by a significant number, and they centralized, which leads to a difference in training and different in application of firepower. So let's talk about not the past, but let's talk about the present. The number one shortcoming in the Russian BTG, infantry personnel. Remember how I said the BTG has those three mechanized infantry companies and that armor company? Amongst those companies, a fully complemented BTG has 200 dismounted personnel. An M2A3 Bradley Infantry Company, United States Army, has about 120. So for reference, each BTG company has about a quarter to a third of the dismounted personnel that we use in our army. Furthermore, those personnel that are inside those holes are trained in very simple battle drills. They're not trained to do much. Maybe, and I want to say battle drill one alpha, but you know, enter a clear trench may be the, the highest level thing they do. But it's a lot of get out, go sit on a hill, go tell me what you see, get back in. Or go into that building. There's not a lot of, of training for these usually conscript or even contract, contract soldiers. They also struggle with deploying at the probable line of contact. Um, most of you understand that it might not translate well. So whatever that line is where you think you're going to start being affected by enemy fires, the probable line of contact, if you're still inside of a turret or a hole, when you reach that probable line of contact, an ATGM strike becomes a lot more catastrophic, we'll put simply. So they don't deploy at the probable line of contact. This is a problem for a lot of militaries, if we're being honest with ourselves. But they don't do it very well either. It is difficult to backfill personnel in a BTG. I mean, besides the partial mobilization at the political level, it is just difficult for, let's say, the 4th Guards Tank Army or the 12th Regiment uh, Tank Regiment. They just don't have the structure to get their personnel forward into combat and allocate it to a BTG. It's a, it's a difficult and complicated process that stems from the way that they organize their units. At the end of the day, this leaves their armor units very vulnerable in urban, dense, or restricted terrain. And here I want to also talk about Russian uh, doctrine when it comes to infantry personnel. The, the Russian doctrine when it comes to infantry personnel really relies upon local units augmenting the BTG. By local units, I mean the DPR, the uh, Donetsk People's Republic, Luhansk People's Republic. They rely on these personnel to be their infantrymen. These aren't contract, these aren't conscript, they're not even, in some cases, Russians. But they are designed, the, the Russian doctrine is designed to use them as a screening element. And that's more of a cab task, but in an element to hold terrain or go clear dead space. They're using local units. So when you, when the Russians arrive in an area where they don't have as much local support, let's say in regions of Ukraine that don't really want them there, they lose the ability to recruit infantrymen. So that number of 200 continues to drop. It is a problem that compounds upon itself. I have up here what a tank platoon and a Bradley platoon integrated in urban combat looks like. This, to our doctrine, is the way to go. You have the Abrams providing front and side support. You have infantry dismounted, so three squads are dismounted, one theoretically on each side and one in front. They are providing overwatch. The tank turret, the Bradley turret, they can only uh, raise to about 60 degrees, or for most urban environments, that's a three or four story window if you're sitting right next to the building. So the infantrymen, they clear, 
Uh, and then the tanks are providing the infantrymen in the street with protection. It's a good relationship. And it ends up looking something like this. That's a great field of fire. And if you don't have those infantrymen, that field of fire gets a lot more narrow. So that's the number one issue I've seen so far uh, in the Russian BTG. The second one, they're self-culminating. The Russian BTG does not need to run into significant obstacles to stop. It is good at stopping itself. I, I would say that, you know, it goes Ukrainians and then Russians for the best people at defeating a Russian. They don't do well over long, uh, long distances. This is a line wire diagram or force structure that I know my colleagues are going to talk about at length. But in the American system, uh, a battalion sized element has a maintenance company. The BTG does not have a maintenance company. It does not have a maintenance platoon. It has a maintenance squad. Very few personnel to maintain all that. That's a smattering of what you will find in a BTG. What we got up here? We got a T90, got an MTLB, uh, we've got a self propelled gun. MLRS, it, it, the bottom line is, there, I just picked the top 12 unit types or vehicle types that you may find in a BTG and put them up there. And it's not like these are fresh pieces of equipment either. In some cases, these are pieces of equipment that were designed in the 1960s, fielded in the 1980s, and maybe have seen combat already in various other wars. So these are old pieces of equipment, very varied pieces of equipment. You know, that, th th that cannon is not the same size as that cannon. So these parts are not interchangeable. They don't have light kind towing. This cannot tow that. That cannot tow that. So when you do have a breakdown, when maintenance does go afoul, you can't tow yourself out of the battlefield. Think of how many videos we've seen on social media of a Ukrainian UAV dropping a grenade in a hatch of an abandoned vehicle. Well, that vehicle would not be there if there are two $200 tow bars and the capability to tow itself off that battlefield. That's not what's happening. So they're losing numbers of vehicles r really much more rapidly than they have to, and there are simple fixes to it. And then finally, the Russian doctrine says that they can self-sustain for one to three days. Uh, there have been findings that even unopposed, they only make it about 50 kilometers, which is still inside artillery range of their original objective. So they get to almost within line of sight of where they originally started and have to culminate because of resupply issues. Uh, I could see, I certainly saw one artillerist uh, squirming because he, he saw that picture of the ammunition. It's damp, it's cold. The next day it might be hot and dry. The day after that it might be damp and cold. It might freeze. Sitting outside the entire time. What's happening to that artillery ammunition? What's happening to the powder in there? It's, it's losing effectiveness. It is not as accurate. You have all the computing systems in the world, but if you can't count the grain accurately, it's not going to fire accurately. So that's what's happening when you don't have the capability to bring forward from your ammunition or supply depots in the rear, the equipment necessary to fire on time. So there's a lot of slack in the resupply. Oof. Okay, uh, so th this is a very big slide. Uh, and, I, I, and I know it looks bad, but I, have to, I had to include it. The Russian BTG is designed to have about a three to one command ratio. That's manageable. A lot of you out there, to use a fun analogy, have probably two siblings roughly two siblings. Your parents were able to pit you against each other and, and manage it pretty well. It's easy to have three uh, subordinates. Nine is a lot different story. If you have eight siblings, probably understand that, that, that you didn't see your parents. Maybe you had to schedule some time to see your parents from time to time. That gets much harder to manage. And you compound that with the lack of staff officers in a BTG. The battalion tactical group commander is the decision maker. He is the planner. He, in some cases, is the intelligence operator. All power stems through that one individual. So when you have few staff officers and many units that report to you, you can get overwhelmed very quickly, no matter how well trained you are. And they're not very well trained, certainly not as well as their analog Norwegian officer of a similar rank. They have what's called Ustav, um, and depending on how it's translated, that might mean charter or menu or dictum. Ustav means here's how you're going to do this. Here's your checklist of how this mission is going to go, and that's how you're going to do it. There is no flexibility here. We use something called mission command more or less successfully. So you have an officer who might have a lot of subordinate units, who doesn't have a lot of personnel to help him make that decision. And then he, when he does have the time and space to make that decision, it's a pretty straightforward one. He opens the book, points to the right page, and that's what they do. So let's break it down. This is the 4th Guard Tanks Division. It has seven subordinate units. That's pretty good. That's not bad. That's manageable. 
in the United States Army, the BCT has about the same. On the left-hand side here, we have the 12th Guards Tank Regiment with 15 subordinate units. From this tank regiment, they will make one BTG, maybe two BTG. So they'll take some of those units. You saw those 15. They might pick nine. They might pick eight. They might pick 10. They'll make it into the BTG. And then what you have now is between the division headquarters, which has six direct reporting units in this case, the 12th tank regiment, which has 15, and then the first BTG within that regiment, which has no less than eight or nine, a lot of personnel reporting to one headquarters in combat. And that headquarters doesn't really have the flexibility to handle all of it. So even qualified personnel in these leadership positions would struggle to handle the flow of information coming from combat when you have this branch tree that is orders of magnitude bigger than what it's supposed to be. Very briefly, again, this is a brigade combat team. This is an armor brigade combat team, specifically uh, my old one when I was in 4th Infantry Division. So that's what it looks like. We have about seven subordinate units. Each one of those subordinate units has four to five uh, subordinate units to itself. Highlight just one armored focus uh, battalion. This combined arms battalion has four subordinate units. Usually they'll get uh, attached to one of these support companies. This is a headquarters element. Uh, my, trust me, for those of you who've, who've commanded a United States Army headquarters element, you do understand that none of those report to you. Um, and this, this section right here outranks you, so it is what it is. So this, while having eight, usually several of those elements will be detached, and then some of them are battalion headquarters. So we do a good job, a better job, of following uh, a solid span of controller command ratio. So how is it, how's it ended up? These are the numbers as of November 14th. So they're a couple weeks old. Using Oryx, which is a fairly accurate reporting system and cross-reference with the United Kingdom's Ministry of Defense, uh, Ukrainian Pravda, and our own assessments. About 1,500 main battle tanks. Um, so that right now sits approaching what the United States Active Force has. We have about 3,700 more in stockpile. That's most of our tanks already. 2,300 AFVs and IFVs, 4,000 others, 1,800 artillery systems. General Milley himself said recently, at least 100,000 casualties. We don't know what the composition of that ratio between wounded, captured, missing, and killed are. But at the end of the day, the equivalent of 50 to 65 BTGs. They started this war with around probably 100 is a good estimate. I have some S2 personnel, some smarter men than me, like Glossin, eh. But what we know, what I know, is about two-thirds of the original deployment strength. What did they gain for that? Well, Luhansk, half of Donetsk, Kherson, Zaporizhzhia province. And so for, for my Norwegian friends, uh, Luhansk is the size of Vestland County, province, county? That's what it is. Uh, in American terms, that's West Virginia. And then uh, I refuse to use kilometers because I'm American. So for our British friends, that's, that's three whales plus or minus an, island of, an Isle of Man. And it's that if that number works. Um, and let's not forget the cherry on top. International condemnation. They've isolated themselves. For those of you sitting in the first few rows to really highlight the, the losses in the background that's been fading in and out the entire time is a symbol for a main battle tank. Each one of those main battle tank symbols in the background represents one main battle tank loss in the last 10 months. On average, the, the Russian, the armed forces of the Russian Federation lose 30 vehicles 378 personnel a day, and they gain approximately 262 kilometers, half of the Oslo metro area. And they've been losing that on average every day for 10 months. Let's not pop champagne yet. They can learn, they will learn. Combat is a hell of a teacher. So here's what I think they're going to do to address the specific problems that I put up there. The, po the partial mobilization in Russia has fielded or will field possibly 300,000 plus soldiers. They're not high quality soldiers. We know that, but personnel are personnel. The jobs they'll ask these soldiers to do are not complicated. They may ask them to take over jobs within the Russian Federation that frees up more well-trained soldiers to come into Ukraine. But at the end of the day, 300,000 soldiers is 300,000 soldiers, and we cannot look past that. They will fill these holes, and by holes I mean, you know, ULL. They'll fill the holes of these APVs. They'll get better at deploying the line of contact and there will just be more infantrymen to clear dead space. They'll fix these shorter supply lines. 
My guess is they won't do it well. They'll do it while losing quite a bit because our Ukrainian allies are extremely good at identifying their weaknesses and they'll exploit them. But they'll get them fixed with a little bit more of an established supply route and shorter supply routes. I, I would say specifically near Bakhmut. I mean, that is the shortest distance between the Russian Federation. I mean, compared to on the right bank in the Dnieper River, it's a lot shorter. You have much more protection. You have a little bit more support from the population. I'm not saying it's a ton of support, but more is always better. They'll be more established. They'll know what they're doing. They've been there now for 10 months. They don't have to figure anything new out. You know where the roads go. You know where the checkpoints are. And then the unspannable gaps. They will, at the end of the day, when you lose 50% of your BTGs, you don't have to worry about having so many subordinates anymore, huh? So they will reduce the complexity of their operations. They'll shorten their objectives. And as they do this, they will gain more and more experience. I think attrition's been uh, a word tossed around a lot today, or even yesterday, but I do believe they'll transition to attrition. I believe that because I saw Grozny in 1994 and then in 1999. They learned their lessons. They applied those lessons learned. They did not care about what happened or international condemnation in 1999, they got Grozny. And that's what they'll do. So on that, on that note, I would like to thank all the people listed up here. Hey, if I listed you up here and I got it wrong, come find me, I'll buy you a beer, my apologies. Um, but these are the personnel that I listed. They're, they're great resources. Uh, it's a multinational group right there. I want a special thanks to some of the resources I use for numbers. Uh, West Point for sending me here, for you all for hosting us, especially Colonel Smith, and Major Brat, I see you back there, you're very tall. Thank you very much for everything you've done for everybody in this room, for organizing all this, for getting everyone together, and for your hospitality. If you like these slides, please let me know. This is how we see our enemy. This is how we, the Americans, see ourselves. This is that TRADOC website uh, that Ben Griffin talked about that has the worldwide equipment guide that has our understanding of all the Russian equipment. And this is a fairly accurate um, BDA website. So with that said, I very much appreciate your attention. I've taken up a little bit more time than I wanted to, and I'm open for your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do you have any questions uh, to the speaker? Major, thank you for your very good presentation. And a uh, question I have uh, you, properly underlined the uh, weakness of being Russian infantry and uh, level of their training. But now to consider that uh, they are stretched too much, they have to fight basically on a too big fronts, considering uh, Donbass or East Ukraine being one and Southern Ukraine being second. Okay. With, with available resources, and I, I just could make my comment that while this war is ongoing, there is no way Russian can fix the infantry training. They cannot do it. They need to finish war and then then start implementing different training and they have to bring even foreigners. They cannot do it themselves with their capabilities. They need to find some other nation which would do training for them at the beginning. So how would you see that with their infantry, they can sustain both fronts in a long term? By transitioning some of their wings, so I would say that in the north, uh, where the Kharkiv front has recently not culminated but reduced uh, its speed, and in Kursan, where they have a defendable border along the Dnieper River, you'll see these lower class or less trained infantry personnel from maybe the partial mobilization, maybe from other regions within the Russian Federation that haven't had been called up yet. You'll see those personnel deployed there. Uh, I think that will help. I agree with you that they're not going to have the capability to send all their soldiers back to, you know, advanced infantry training. That's not happening. They've got to get them forward. But they'll send them to places where things are simpler. They'll, they'll, they'll give them a shovel. And they'll, they might do a defense in depth. They will probably do at least a linear defense. And they'll focus the units that do have experience and a little bit of training in areas where they think they might have more maneuver. And I do believe that to be closer to the center of the front line right now, which uh, in, in popular media is just now Bakhmut. I, I don't know... I think I do agree with you that there's no way to fix the systemic problems within their infantry training. They're not going to do it in one year of combat if they couldn't do it in the last 30 years, roughly thereabouts of peace. So I agree in that assessment, but I do think that, you know, if you're an infantryman and you've just been called up, 
and there are shell bursts around you, you learn, you learn how to dig a hole. Like, you don't need to go to AIT to learn how to dig a hole when there's, when there's artillery landing. Does that answer your question at all? Yeah. Uh, the, the the Uh, so what do you, if you couldn't hear him, he, he does, I do believe that you're correct. They may not be able to su support or sustain both fronts simultaneously, certainly not in an offensive capability, certainly not anytime soon. But defensively, they might be able to make do with less for a little bit longer. I hope to be proven wrong. Major, thank you for your presentation. That was <coughs> very interesting. Do you think it's... Um, lack of employment of infantry that is actually there regardless of uh, training but the btg does have some infantry but mm -hmm. does not seem to be employed or is it a question about lack of dedicated infantry units uh, maybe on brigade level sorry i'm i want to write it down so other people have an opportunity to, to remember the topic at hand so this is an employment of infantry question correct yeah so i mean you could argue that it's not a lack of infantry in the BTG. Right. However, they may not be employing it. Or is the problem that there is no dedicated infantry units with a, with a mission to support uh, the armor units? Can I say both? Can I cop out and, and articulate that I think both is possible? Um, I, I think that the employment of the infantry personnel that are in a BTG is going to be the nut they have to crack. Um, because while I do profess that the, the infantry that are coming or the soldiers that are coming will be a change, if you're still putting them inside the holes, uh, if you're not employing them properly or, or at all, all, all they are are casualties when that vehicle takes an ATGM round. So in order for them to fully transition to a more successful operation, the employment must happen. So if that gets after the, the basis of your question, I apologize if not. Again, I guess it's a question of uh, at which level do you do the infantry armor mix? Is it a company level, battalion, or a brigade level task uh, that we're looking at? Because uh, the infantry is there. It's just where do you f maximize the effect of employing infantry? At, at which level, I don't say. Battalion. Um, I think certainly at the battalion level, I'm sure they'd love to get down to the platoon level. I'd love they, I'm sure they'd love to have that integrated platoon that I showed on the, on the map, but at the battalion level, certainly. Is, is where I think it's heading towards. Anyone else? In your presentation, you focus on a few of those uh, areas where the uh, Russians might actually learn some lessons. Mm -hmm. Did you, have you also looked at where would they possibly not be able to learn lessons so that we can look at opportunities? So, and you mean in regions of Ukraine where they do not learn lessons? Exactly. I would say that in the north, um, in the beginning of the war, the, in, around Sumy, they, they expanded very quickly and then collapsed very quickly back in September. So I think there are opportunities in the north. Uh, the southeastern front has demonstrated a little bit more... Um, of a flexible environment for for the Russian, you know, the armed forces of the Russian Federation. So, if you're looking for an opportunity where we don't think they're going to learn, or where they may not have the capability to learn, I would say in the northeastern front. Is that answering your question, sir? It, 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 I'm happy to to continue if it did not. Okay. Well, yeah. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you very much, sir. Well then, um, the, now we have um, uh, a short break, and uh, we will. Uh, I'll make sure to read uh, my uh, program because I was uh, wrong uh, about the length of the break uh, last time. So we'll uh, start again uh, at uh, eleven fifteen, and then we'll uh, have a presentation on logistics. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, now we have two presenters uh, for the next uh, speech. And uh, we have from the United States uh, Military Academy, 
Major Jessica Rudu and Major Charlotte Stutz. And Jessica, she graduated from, uh, from Ramapo College of New Jersey with a BA in International Relations. She then enlisted in the Army as a Civil Affairs Specialist with the 404th Civil Affairs Battalion out of Fort Dix, New Jersey. She attended Defense Language Institute for French and was the honor graduate earning an associates in French. Soon after, Major Rudo deployed to Samara, Iraq with the No Slack 1st Brigade combat team of the 101st Airborne Division. Then, well, Radio Major Rudo commissioned via Officer Candidate School, branching military intelligence, and reported back to 1 BCT of the 101st uh, Division to serve as a platoon leader. She was then pulled over to 4 BCT uh, to participate in the Women in the Army program, serving as one of the first female intelligence officers in a field artillery battalion and later deployed to Afghanistan. After serving as the Brigade S2 for the Divisional Artillery and uh, 101 CAB on Fort Campbell, uh, Kentucky, she attended the University of West Florida and graduated with an MA in Traditional History in 2021. She currently instructs in the International History Division at the United States Military Academy. Major, uh, Major Stutz served as an American history instructor at the same academy, and she is a logistics officer by trade. She was previously enlisted as a light wheeled mechanic in the Indiana National Guard. She studied English literature at Purdue University for her undergraduate degree and was commissioned in the United States Army as a transportation officer. She completed her Master of Arts in American History at the University of Oklahoma. Her historical field of study is American democratic capitalism and consumer culture, institutional branding and advertising, and the American Western frontier. Her most recent positions were Battalion Operations Officer for 8th uh, STB at Hawaii and Company Commander for JMC HHC Fort Bliss, Texas. I think you have to uh, explain the acronyms. Um, and an EDECON for the DCGO at Fort Bliss and uh, the 141 Infantry Forward Echo Forward Support Company Executive Officer in Afghanistan. I'm, I'm not sure I got the last part right, but please excuse me. So the floor is yours and we're looking forward to hear your presentation. Thank you. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, general officers and esteemed colleagues. It's very nice to be able to stand up here today in the beautiful uh, city of Oslo. Um, so my name is Major Charlotte Stutz. I will be covering the portion of this presentation that looks at military logistics operations in the Russian-Ukraine conflict. I'm a logistics officer by trade. How it works for us is once we get to captain in the Army, we become logistics officers, which is an amalgamation of quartermaster, um, quartermaster, ordnance, and transportation. So I serve as basic branch transportation officer, but as you heard when I was enlisted, I was a light wheel mechanic. So many of these conversations are near and dear to my heart as someone that used to lay underneath um, trucks and fix things. So this has been an interesting journey. So today I'll be working with my partner, Major Jessica Rudo. She will focus on global logistical implications of the conflict, and together we explore the linchpin logistics as an operational necessity and global land warfare. So as you heard many of my other colleagues, I'm going to give my disclaimer. I am here representing the United States Military Academy and the History Department and the United States Army. However, this is my personal research and findings. So there's a common thread for my colleague as well. So I think it's important to note, as we heard from one of our presenters earlier with um, Mr. Uh, Stuhr, 
we need to define a term, right? So when we say linchpin, it's important to note the definition of linchpin as it's a context for the framework that we're going to be using today in our conversation. So it's defined as a person or thing vital to an enterprise or organization. So we're going to look, much like my colleagues have talked about before, why logistics is that linchpin and what specifically is the problem in this conversation. So where does this the conversation of sustainment or logistics fits in. It's really the next step after an operation. It's continuing the fight, the ability to sustain that maneuver and mobility. And it follows planning. So we have the implementation of a plan, we have the operation that actions that plan, and then we have the sustainment to continue with follow-on actions. So historically, the success or failure of warfare can be analyzed through the implementation of logistical operations and supply chain management. Historic examples of logistical operations impact on warfare can be seen in Russia's military operations in Syria in 2015, the illegal seizure of the Crimea Peninsula in 2014 and build up along the border before the invasion on February 24, 2022. Currently, the strategy of active defense in Russia's invasion of Ukraine showcases the effects of poor logistical planning and implementation of combined arms warfare. The linchpin of Russian military logistical operations is distribution of material, equipment, and training to the tactical level, severely impacting their operational efficacy. This critical linchpin provides the operational capacity to continue maneuver and operational reach. Without it, we see entire formations grind to halt as pictured in this armored column. However, Russia does have significant theater and strategic level logistics ability. They're fundamentally insufficient at the tactical level. Russia relies heavily on the ability to pull material and commodities from a fixed position within reach of railway or pipeline. In fact, they are so dependent on railway assets, their training and implementation process dictates entire brigades trained and proficient in railway operations. This is a force that does not have a parallel in most NATO-driven doctrine or training. This capability dissolves significantly with the limited operational reach of Russian logistics. Large-scale supply is maintained well at the core level. The logistical gap really occurs when the material technical operations units end and the battalion tactical group begins. Organic units are unable to push needed commodities and material largely due to a lack of ground distribution assets and their infrastructure dependence. This oversight has caused operational demand to outpace logistical assets and sustainment training, resulting in a logistical gap. Tactical level logistic capability requires soldiers trained in multiple trades and proficient on specialty equipment, a key element of proficiency that's missed in the Russian force configuration today. Though Russia has strategic level strategic level logistics at the theater level, they're not able to push assets all the way to the current operational front or secure logistics operations center to the protection level required for large scale warfare. So I'm gonna focus on a couple of key uh, geographic areas. We're gonna talk a little more in depth about what the, the infrastructure available in Ukraine is and why that's important. And we're gonna link into the real linchpin of why these logistical capabilities and lift assets are not being utilized to supply the operational front as necessary. So this is a logistics overview. There's going to be a few key places that I look at. Kiev in the north, Odessa and Kherson in the south, and Crimea. Um, you'll see notated on this slide, you also have several supply depot depictions here. This showcases these areas that were meant to hold theater level logistics in order to distribute to the operational front at the tactical level. So there's several key areas that have their, the ability for theater level sustainment. When we talk theater level sustainment in Ukraine, what we're really talking about is the ability to push assets, days of supply for 30 plus days and be able to pull those assets and push them to the tactical front to fill a need past that three days of supply that my colleague talked about earlier that is supposed to be inherent to the BTG. So for, I'll focus on these areas, Kiev in the north, the Dnipro River is an inland waterway, which is an interesting and important conversation when you're talking logistics and sustainment. Odessa in the southwest, Kherson and Crimea in the south. 
right now it's important to note that the contention that's happening in the east is starting to bridge into Kherson and potentially into Odessa. So this is stopping shipments, this is disrupting uh, logistics um, in these areas and will continue to have impact. We'll talk a little bit about that going forward. So the green circles notate a critical sea of deparkation, airport of embarkation or debarkation, rail port of debarkation, and logistics operational center capacity with the supply depot aptitude for storage and distribution. These areas affect ability to successfully fulfill shipping, freight movement, and material maintenance of Ukrainian industry and critical infrastructure places of disruption for the Russian active defense operations. I selected these areas as they provide Russia's need to conduct large-scale lift capabilities and material movement. Theater level capability and supply chain shipping led to initiatives to control the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov through seaport of deportation limitation in Odessa, Kiev, and Kherson. The ability to quickly deliver supplies, troop transport, and air support requires substantial airport of debarkation capability available in Kiev. Railport debarkations remain, <coughs> remain crucial to Russian logistics strategy due to limitations of gauge, interoperability, and negligible palletized lift. Russian railways are built on the Stephenson gauge, a physically larger railway gauge than the EU standard. On one hand, this gauge difference allows for a larger weight threshold to move both troops and cargo. The limiting factor remains the inability for interoperability outside of previously designated Soviet Union rail infrastructure. These key capabilities are located at Odessa, Kherson, and Kiev. The logistics operations centers paired with established supply depots allow storage and pull capabilities of material goods at a theater scale to push to the tactical level. These areas provide critical infrastructure and physical proximity to waterways imperative to implementation of theater level sustainment. Furthermore, the seizure and defense of these areas allow for the establishment of theater wide sustainment. This allows for stockpiling, storage, and distribution as notated by the supply depot depictions on the provided map. The ability to source internal logistics sustainment at proximity to tactical operations is imperative for flexibility. However, it also mandates the ability to protect that material and munitions lest to be seized by enemy forces for their own use as seen, as as seen in Kiev. As we have also heard from other presenters so far, the use of long-range weapon systems, UAVs, and allied-owned systems paired with Ukrainian ingenuity, training, and innovative techniques has further complicated sustainment activities. We're going to look a little more in depth at Kiev. It provides the second largest shipping and sea lock, um, which is Sea Logistics Operations Center, and container handling capacity in the country. This is important because containers are how we typically move large-scale freight material goods. A railway is how much of the classes of supply move for the Russian army. And we're going to talk about that a little more in depth later on. It's the only inland waterway distribution receiving location with significant airlift and sea lift ca capacity. These sustainment functions are crucial for troop and material movement in large scale, as well as distribution to the lower levels. Furthermore, this location provides the ability to move freight and roll on, roll off material goods from shipping assets to supply depots for further distribution. The operational tension surrounding the city and destruction of infrastructure has caused a lessened shipping, receiving, and distribution ability throughout inland Ukraine. Some of the damage to infrastructure has occurred strategically from Russian aggression to control economic and military maneuverability of supply, shipment, and materiel. The Ukrainian army has realized this infrastructure dependence and targets key areas to deny access to Russian troops. Kiev spans both sides of the critical Dnieper River. By securing the city, avenues of approach are protected for Ground Logistics Operations Center. To distribute material goods from Russian supply depots to the north to inland troops, it would take multiple convoys or aerial shipments of material through contested countryside on existing infrastructure daily to distribute the needed supplies and commodities. Ground infrastructure is incredibly challenging for the Russian forces for several reasons. Russian mechanized logistics support vessels are not able to provide their own protection. 
without armored exoskeletons or gunnery attachments, leaving their distribution packages susceptible to attacks. Furthermore, on average, it takes 245 cargo load bearing wheeled vehicles per day to move supplies from Kiev inland along the only main internal waterway or rail or ground system to distribute material from supply depots to tactical operations areas. The added underestimation of Ukrainian opposition ingenuity against the Russian invasion allowed the element of surprise via ambush attacks and standoff weapon systems to target critical logistics operations center and lines of communication. That's why we see abandonment of certain areas in the north. They simply could not hold it and still sustain operational functions. The supply depot north of Kiev was originally developed as a sustainment stronghold for the Russian Federation. However, it's not been able to adequately protect its ground and railway logistic operations center or lines of communication from Ukrainian tactical countermeasures. Underestimation of the Ukrainian will to fight and ability to exercise flexibility in their nation severely undermine Russian reliance on infrastructure and labor demands for distribution of critical supplies. Inability to secure their ground transportation and dependence on established roadways created a shortfall in their historically lengthy supply lines. Throughout the course of this almost 10-month conflict, most of the sustainment operations have shifted to the east and the south of Ukraine, leading to my next critical key sustainment area located in Kherson. Kherson is a critical railway junction that serves as moving theater level logistics from Russia into Ukraine. It also serves as the southmost entrance to the Dnieper River, denoting a potential key avenue of approach by multiple sustainment modes. The proximity of Kherson to Crimea allows for the utilization of the land bridge connecting these areas. This allows for large scale railway operations, a key asset for Russian sustainment. Russian logistics is designed to move largely through railways and pipelines for class one, which is your food and water, class three, fuel, oil, and lubricants, class five for your ammunition assets, and class four being your engineering assets where we see bridging and, and uh, barricade supplies. Kherson is especially important due to the difference in metric width of rail lines. Ukrainian rail lines were constructed on the Stefansen gauge utilized by the Soviet Union. This allows cross mobility of cargo and troops within the Baltic states, but it limits shipping capability outside of Ukraine's borders. Ukrainian forces realized this limitation well before the current conflict working with surrounding countries to plan the construction of railways on the EU standard rail gauges. Furthermore, targeting of railways in areas of Russian aggression limit their advance due to the inability to rely on rail infrastructure. This makes it fundamentally impossible for Russian assets to move to theater, move theater level assets using their logistics rail support brigades capability that was fundamental to their sustainment. It has a distribution capacity and in Kherson from railways to ground supply routes, as well as cross-loading assets with roll-on, roll-off capability between sea transportation and railway hubs. This ability to utilize large-scale transportation modes in nearness is crucial in order to secure stockpiling of materials and supplies at these rail hubs. The current structure of Russian equipment cross-loaded materials tends to stockpile assets by railheads by manual labor. They don't use a palletized package with a more robust internal mechanized lift like we see in the US Army and other armies. The sustainment capacity in Kherson became instrumental after the seizure of the Crimean, Crimean Peninsula in 2014. Crimea serves as a critical point for, for theater level logistics capability as it is essential in protection of shipping and mobility throughout the Sea of Azov that sits between Crimea and mainland Russia and the Black Sea south of Crimean Peninsula. The southernmost coast of Ukraine holds most of the sustainment modes of transportation crucial for exportation, supplying and equipping the military. Next, we're going to look at the largest port on the southern coast, which is Odessa. Odessa is currently enveloped in operational contention. Odessa is a seaport on the southern edge of Ukraine and serves as the last remaining large-scale container lift and material handling capacity for importation and exportation of goods, assets, and supplies into Ukraine. It provides three times the shipping capability than any other port on the nation due to its container, container handling 
infrastructure, and two floating cranes. Odessa became an even more pivotal consideration in the conversation due to its location on the Black Sea and across from the Sea of Azov, paired with the loss of asset flexibility in southern Ukraine throughout Crimea. Odessa provides instrumental exportation of goods on a global scale, as will be elaborated by my partner later in this presentation. These key sustainment areas provide a macro view of the theater level operations in the nation and key infrastructure for, of interest for Russian operations. The real difficulty and complexity of sustainment dictating success or failure of Russian operations is occurring at the tactical level in the BTGs. We hit on this slightly with my colleague, but I'm gonna dig into that a little bit more in depth. And I'd like to discuss some of the logistical constraints that we're seeing before we look at what their actual sustainment build is. So Russia's invasion of Ukraine has showcased the shortfall that exists in their logistical planning and operations. Russian theater level sustainment movements can mobilize significant sustainment and supply to the Ukrainian border. Outside of the designated routes and assets available within their national reach poses quite a challenging task. Ukraine provides a multi-front operational problem for Russian warfare as their forces are dis designed to fight in place with most logistical assets and necessary commodities pushed to the tactical front. This operational strategy has not performed sufficiently as theater level logistics have not been properly distributed to critical junctions at the tactical front. Russia's restructuring of their military forces after the fall of the Soviet Union prioritized leaner maneuver elements with more robust combat arms, as we saw in the last presentation. In short, the Russian shift in strategy has essentially sacrificed their forward logistics capability in favor of combat arms firepower. The ongoing conflict in Ukraine has proven this strategy has limited effect effectancy in sustaining an invading force for a prolonged period. A further variable of complication is Russia's dependence on already constructed and fully functioning infrastructure. Environmental and weather conditions compound logistical movement for the Russians. Russian forces are highly dependent on railways and pipelines. Their operational ability becomes virtually non-existent non-existent beyond 90 miles outside of the reach of rail and ground logistics operations centers. As weather and terrain are significantly influencing Russian operations and logistical resupply, we start to see a shift into the winter months. Russian mechanized elements can maneuver on established roadways with limited mobility outside of their assembly areas due to the limitation of their equipment and troop training gaps. The reliance on roadway infrastructure within Ukraine has left Russian logistics convoys and material movement at risk of disruption by standoff weapons, targeted attacks, and infrastructure sabotage. Inability to provide and protect distribution when pushing forward sustainment packages against multiple types of targeting has caused large-scale inability to recover their key equipment. Russian dependence on railway infrastructure and transportation has led to a critical shortage outside of embarkation tasks, initially delivering assets and non-existence capability to distribute via ground transportation. As commented on by several presenters so far, the ability for Ukrainian forces to develop in innovative means of disrupting Russian sustainment operations did not seem estimated. The ability to train and equip forces with ally provided equipment and training showcases a level of ingenuity and adaptability also underestimated by Russian planners. The Ukrainian national will to fight and ability to implement changes quickly and seamlessly in supply operations and sustainment packages has the potential for NATO sustainment lessons learned going forward. It will be, I would be remiss to not transition fully to the linchpin of sustainment in Russian operations in Ukraine, the inability to fully distribute these supplies and material goods to key sustainment recovery material and equipment needed at the tactical level. So with that, I'm going to shift to where the real crux is. For the sake of time, I put a comparison between a United States 
Army Combined Arms Battalion and a Russian BTG, as outlined here. As you can clearly see, there's quite a difference in the sustainment personnel that is available at the tactical front. Logistic capability simply does not meet the operational demand currently. Inability to protect their distribution to the tactical front and inability to man and equip key sustainment interoperability has limited the Russian advance. A comparison of the battalion level sustainment, maintenance, and distribution package between Russian and American logistics elements provides further insight on the issue. In the U.S. model of a combined arms battalion, a company-level element is attached to a battalion-level maneuver element consisting on average of 120 sustainers, maintainers, and transporters. Furthermore, these key personnel include planners in the form of five company-grade officers that participate and are nested in battalion operations and maneuver elements. Each of the soldiers fulfilling logistics support are trained and cross-trained in their tasks in order to provide interoperability in the sustainment unit. These soldiers are constantly evaluated and trained on large-scale operations in order to identify pitfalls and avoid gaps in logistics operations. This is not to say that the U.S. model is perfect. We have our own considerable disadvantages. However, you can see by the numbers, we are simply more robust and integrated in this model. We have not seen this integration in the Russian performance to date. Palletized lift assets, internal recovery, and mechanical flexibility are key assets that seem to be missed in the BTG. By comparison, the Russian BTG utilizes a platoon level of 38 maintainers and sustainers with no staff officers that are providing that nested integration and planning process. On average, we see in practice five shower and laundry soldiers, 11 food service personnel, and three mechanics. This is a massive difference when you're talking maneuver and sustainment. In short, there's not enough mound power or assets to move the necessary equipment and material sustainment to the operational front, let alone maintain or sustain operations or recover equipment for a prolonged period of time. The BTG is further plagued by targeted attacks on their logistics operations center and avenues of approach, delaying much needed supplies to forces on the ground. Inability to conduct material loading and offloading of equipment and commodities from theater level depots onto ground vehicles further exasperate the delay of equipment that's needed so critically at the front. Ukrainian forces and civilians have a strategic advantage in disrupting internal shipments Tactical group logistics element is designed to kill three days of supply in practice with operational tension, delays in supply and resupply, and equipment failures. The reality tends to be 24 hours with 12 hours in reserve. Part of this logistics, lack of logistic flexibility, stems from lack of um, trained personnel and outdated equipment. So in conclusion, the sustainment strategy in supporting Russian military operations focus on active defense is complex. What is becoming apparent is the inability for the operational strategy to achieve successful sustainment relying on a sig singular sustainment line of communication such as railways and pipelines. S substantial commodities, troops, and equipment mobility is possible by troops for Russian forces. However, the critical link to the operational front must be conducted by ground lines of communication. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has tested their sustainment operational plans through manning demands and lack of line of communication interoperability. Inability to develop uniform railhead material handling in a prepackaged format has demanded enormous manning requirements. Russia's infrastructure dependence is detrimental to their sustainment operations. As the conflict develops, the shift to urban warfare and environmental condition changes will further sustain their sustainment. There is much to be learned regarding the sustainment operations inherent to the conflict at hand. As conditions develop and assessments are made, military organizations and leadership today will have to confront the future of sustainment in warfare. One of the greatest lessons showcased in Ukraine that will impact our future logistical planning remains mastering the fundamentals of sustaining operational warfare. Finally, not only will proficient 
and accurate logistics dictate war fighting capability, so will securing and defending logistics operations centers and lines of communications against constant threat, both internally in planning and externally. I've detailed the linchpin of military operational logistics focusing on the broken link between large-scale theater-level logistics and distribution to the tactical front. I will now be followed by my colleague, Major Jessica Ruto, to discuss global logistics impacts. Thank you. Okay, it's just me between you and lunch. <laughs> so let's talk about food. Can you do the slide for me? Thank you. <laughs> Logistics is the linchpin that connects the world, and there is no better example than food supply chains. Please let me know if I'm going too fast or too slow. The main point of my presentation is to point out that the Russia-Ukraine conflict has global impacts, and one of the biggest global concerns is the impending food crisis that is emerging, highlighting the importance of both Russia and Ukraine within global food logistics and the fragility of food security, which will be huge if this conflict turns into a war of attrition that has been mentioned previously a couple of times. The Russia-Ukraine conflict has caused Ukraine to halt food exports, which, according to USAID, has caused the world's worst food crisis ever, which is saying a lot as the Ukrainian people have suffered through Joseph Stalin collectivizing farms and redrawing the lines that wheat followed in 1932, a move that introduced an artificially made famine that killed millions. This region is also where Joseph Goebbels imagined an Aryan race, the Third Reich, reclaiming the fertile plains of Ukraine and in the process starved millions during World War II. Slide please. Ukraine is called the breadbasket of Europe, and the importance of this region is nothing new. Ukraine's agricultural power made possible by the, by the well-aerated land called Black Soils, which is what's depicted on this slide, uh, has been sought after for centuries. Catherine the Great fought wars and, uh, to obtain the Ukrainian region and access to the Black Sea and those ports. When those same ports closed in World War I, Wheat prices soared, not surprisingly, since the Black Sea moved 22% of global wheat exports. In the United States alone, wheat prices rose by almost 50%. A food crisis followed, and this crisis moved Britain and her allies to knock the Turks out of the area and restore the wheat trade. More than a century later, there is a similar conundrum, how to get Ukraine's food exports out of the Black Sea through Russia's blockade. Slide, please. <laughs> Our food supply chain is global, making food security a global concern. Ukraine and Russia are two grain powerhouses, according, uh, accounting for 25 to 30 percent of the global wheat supply, 76 percent of global sunflower oil exports, and 16 percent of corn, just to name a few, but I will focus on wheat. Slide, please. There are dozens of countries that rely heavily on the wheat and other foodstuffs coming out of Ukraine and Russia. When Russia invaded Ukraine, the flow of food exports stopped. Even though the military actions happened in Ukraine, the second and third order effects of those actions are still unraveling across the globe. Since the invasion, much of Ukraine's harvested, ready-to-export grain has been stuck or backlogged in the war-torn countries because of damage to rail infrastructure, which Charlotte talked about, damage in closed ports, which is how 90% of export trade travels, and several key European countries have banned Russian flag vessels from their ports, blocking Russian grains. Finally, Russian blockade of the Black Sea severely hindering food exports. In June, I'm sorry, of July of 2022, the Black Sea Grain Initiative passed which is a UN-backed deal brokered in Turkey, and this deal eased the Russian naval blockade to allow three Ukrainian ports to move 400 ships and around 9 million metric tons of grain in response to the mounting food crisis. This deal stopped in October. So for comparison, the eight months prior to the invasion, 51 million metric tons of grain moved. Uh, through the seven Black Sea ports, uh, but in the 10 months following the invasion, only 10 million metric tons have passed through. 
This disparity brings consequences that will add to future food supply problems. Farmers cannot harvest in all areas or plant new crops. It means that not only is there grain that is ready to ship but cannot and will go to waste, there will not be enough storage available when the winter harvest comes in, according to the World Food Program, as the harvest that needs to be shipped sits idle. Furthermore, Russian airstrikes have damaged silos, making storage even more of a problem. Supply has been affected, but the demand stays the same. Slide, please. Mm, I don't think that's the right slide. Food prices have been climbing uh, since 2021 due to a couple of reasons, uh, including pandemic-related shortages to include labor and supply chain disruptions, climate catastrophes like droughts and ice storms that have ruined crops, and an increase in oil prices. The increase in the price of oil translates into increased costs in food transportation costs, industrial agriculture costs, and fertilizer costs. In addition, the conflict has reduced production and exports of fertilizers from Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus, affecting access to fertilizers and thus food production in many countries around the globe who depend on those fertilizers. Uh, on top of all of these factors, the military invasion of Ukraine and the disruption to the food supply chain has sent food prices spiking around the world. Next slide, please. Okay. <laughs> In Europe, the Consumer Price Index, which is a, the selection of goods economists use to calculate people's overall cost of living for food, has sharply risen in all of the continent's largest economies, mostly in the teens, while the United States, the CPI, climbed more than 14 percentage points since J January of 2020. And you'll see those numbers on that first row in, the, in this uh, slide. In emerging market countries, the index change is even more dramatic, 30% in Europe, I'm sorry, in Egypt, leaving consumers facing much higher prices for essential food staples, which you'll see in that second row. And then finally, uh, oh yeah, okay. in developing countries, the price increases are astronomical, ranging from hundreds to thousands of percentage point increases. In many developing nations, food is the single largest category in the overall cost of living for consumers, so any price index increase is a big deal. Slide, please. Okay. <laughs> These price increases have devastating consequences for countries who rely on Ukraine and Russia for as much as half or all of their wheat imports which is seen most vividly in the Middle East, North Africa region, which is called the MENA. The MENA is not only the world's largest exporter of oil, but it's the world's largest importer of grains. Food self-sufficiency is not an option because of the lack of water in this region. Wheat and other cereals make up a large portion of the diet in this region. Egypt, where bread is called aish or life, is the largest wheat importer in the world. Egypt has fertile land and the country does grow some wheat, but water needs of wheat and other cereals competes with Egypt's other export markets of fruits and vegetables. Egypt is hoping to fill the Ukraine-Russia wheat gap uh, with imports from India, but India's heavy droughts have affected the plant harvest, and this is true for France and the United States also. The food crisis hits the MENA unevenly. Countries with a lot of oil money can afford the inflated food prices and can implement comprehensive food strategies, such as the UAE created a whole task force to find other places to import from and adapt to supply chain disruptions. The MENA's reaction to Russia aggression underlines the interesting dynamic that lives between oil and food. The UAE abstained from the UN Security Council vote condemning the aggression because of the oil deal that exists with the OPEC plus countries. Slide, please. The most extreme example, I oh know, can you go back? Thanks. The most extreme examples have been seen uh, for food infl inflation uh, rises in the thousands of points. Somalia, a country that relies 100% on imported wheat from Ukraine and Russia, saw the slide index rise more than 3,100 percentage points in 2020, since 2020, which means that food now takes 100% of someone's salary to buy. Citizens are now vulnerable to being exploited through food aid and availability of aid. 
Ex experts estimate that Somalia will see a 300% increase in children that will need food assistance to survive. The UN's food program, the one that currently assists Somalia, gets 45% of its food from Ukraine. <laughs> so that means that the program that assists those who need food have less food. This factor will set the perfect conditions for terrorists and criminal organizations to take root. Al-Shabaab, Somalia's biggest terrorist group, is reported to control a third of the country, setting up de facto authorities throughout the region. For the United States, there are parallels to operations that occurred in the early 1990s called Operation Restore Hope, where the task force was charged with creating a protected environment for conducting humanitarian operations in the southern half of Somalia, a humanitarian crisis exacerbated by warlords and a complete breakdown of civil, disorder, of civil order. Rising prices for basic food items have already fueled protests in countries around the world, including Argentina, Indonesia, Greece, Iraq, Morocco, Lebanon. In Iran, protesters took to the streets after prices for flour-based staples rose as much as 300%. Slide, please. This is not the first time that there have been an increase in food prices, and there are a lot of parallels between the current crisis and the global food crisis of 2008 and 2011. This slide shows the spike in the food price index. What you will notice is that the price index does not return to pre-crisis levels for five years after 2011. Slide, please. Okay. In 2008, food prices started to rise because of droughts in grain-producing countries and ri rising oil prices, mostly due to the increased use of biofuels. Rising oil prices increase fertilizer and food transportation costs. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations raised concerns about falling world food stockpiles. Big food exporters like Argentina and Russia implemented trade restrictions to ensure their own food security. These actions affected the MENA, whose local food production was compromised because of water security. Uh, Yep, okay, the most. <laughs> Violent rioting broke out in dozens of countries across Africa, the Middle East, Asia, and Latin America. All of these events, from the rising price of fertilizer to trade restrictions, are happening in 2022. 2011's food crisis was a result of population growth, rising affluence, meaning diets rich in grain-driven foods like meat, milk, and eggs, and the use of grain to fuel cars mixed with loss of farmland due to non-food use, soil erosion, diversion of irrigation water, and crop withering heat waves. Mixed with an already existing political tension, the UN's Food and Agricultural Organization Consumer Price Index raised the, to then unprecedented levels riots erupted in 48 countries, including some later referred to as the Arab Spring, a series of anti-government protests and armed rebellions that spread across the MENA. Most protests faded out by mid-2012, but in, the, in their wake lay toppled governments, civil wars in Syria and Libya, coups in Egypt, and the rise of ISIS. Seeing some parallels to the rising food prices today, there are protests for food all over the MENA region. On July 9th, with food prices raising 80%, the Sri Lankan people stormed into the presidential palace, uh, in Egypt, bread prices have increased up 50%, straining the government's ability to maintain already reduced bread subsidies, which have historically been flashpoints for unrest. Even with significant international humanitarian aid in many of these countries, forced migration will be the only way to combat rising prices and dwindling livelihoods, which will cause issues that NATO will need to work through in the future. The initial invasion of Russia into Ukraine triggered a huge wave of refugees across Europe, roughly 7.6 million. The current situation sets conditions for a massive forced migration across the MENA. Such a migration could emulate the Ethiopian War of 2020, for example, where over 100,000 refugees absconded to the Tigray region, contributing to the loss of relative stability in and around Ethiopia and the Horn of Africa region. Food is global and food security affects everyone. The military actions of Russia inside Ukraine have had global consequences. NATO countries cannot view the Russian-Ukraine conflict solely through a military lens. Military actions cause food supply logistics, the linchpin, to stop or slow down and, affect, and the effects of those actions will ripple outwards for years. All right, that's it. Who's ready for lunch? <laughs> yeah.
No time. Zero time for questions. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Jessica and Charlotte. Uh, d do the audience have uh, any questions for the presenters? No. <laughs> Lunch is waiting. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate your, your uh, contributions. So, thank you. <laughs> now there is a uh, lunch downstairs as yesterday, and we will start again at uh, 1300. Thank you. Gen uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, now we'll listen to my friend uh, Christopher Lawrence. He is the executive uh, director and president of the Dupuy Institute. He is a professional historian and military analyst. And um, the Dupuy uh, Dupu Institute is an organization dedicated to scholarly research and objective analysis of historical data related to armed conflict and the res resolution of armed conflict. The Institute provides independent, historically based analysis of lessons learned from modern military campaigns. Uh, Chris has uh, participated in studies on casualty estimates and studies of air campaign modeling, enemy prisoner of war capture rates, medium weight armor, urban warfare, situational awareness, counterinsurgencies and other subjects for the U.S. Army Department of Defense, the Joint Staff and the U.S. Air Force. His published works include papers and monographs for the Congressional Office of Technology Assessment and Vietnam Veterans of America Foundation. And he has also over 60 analytical reports prepared for the Department of Defense. He is the author of six books and is working at on at least a couple of more. Yeah. So, um, Chris, please, the floor is yours. Okay. See if the slides move. No? Ah, now it's moving. Okay, there's a lag. Okay, um, I'm just going to cover some observations on a few things that got my attention. Um, so we're going to end up, this is supposedly going to cover six different subjects. Uh, we'll see how far we get. I'm going to discuss and cover losses. That's going to lead to a discussion on wounded to killed ratios in the uh, war in Ukraine. And that's going to lead to an uncomfortable discussion on combat effectiveness of the various armies. And then I may, if we have time, be able to touch on urban warfare, U.S. intelligence advantage and the duration of war and the duration of the war. Uh, I am working on a book right now. Uh, supposedly, supposedly, I'll send it to the publisher at the end of this month. I may hold on it for a month or two while I get people to review it because I'm uncomfortable with what I'm doing. Uh, you know, in the past, I've worked on books on the Battle of Kursk. I was able to get access to the Soviet military archives, and I used retired friends and military academy professors to do my research and pull the records out of there. So I've been able to do material based upon the unit records of both sides and assemble systematically organized public works on that, and I'm not doing that at all for the book on Ukraine. Um, it's being written from open sources. And so I'm looking at a series of four books, one on Kiev, one on Mariupol, one on the Donbass, and then the Ukrainian counteroffensives. And they're all fairly small books, about 70,000 words, and between the four of them, they may add, eventually add up to a real book. Um, so anyhow, losses. Um, Ukraine said on 21 August, they lost nearly 9,000 people killed. Um, I'm not sure if this estimate includes National Guard or foreign fighters. Um, what struck me as odd is a month earlier, or two months earlier, there was a rumor coming out via De Spiegel that advisor Zelensky was saying there was about 10,000 Ukrainian soldiers killed. So suddenly, two months later, the official number is 1,000 lower. You know, was that a bad report or not? Um, and if the number didn't include everything, are we safe to assume that the real count is some number higher than uh, 9,000 killed? And of course, this is estimated as 21 August. That's a couple of months old already. Um, now, literally, since I wrote this briefing, another estimate just came out as of 1 December. And that was, that was um, an advisor was saying it was between 10 to 13,000 soldiers killed in the war. 
So it's somewhere in this range. Um, Russia, Russia came out on 21 September with a figure of 5,937. Most people assume that that number is low. BBC Russia is tracking from various open sources. Um, the number killed as of 15 December, they had counted 6,476. And you know that's not a complete record because not everyone gets reported in the obituaries or in graves, et cetera. So the, the Russian figure is some figure of 6,000 plus whatever they missed. And the BBC count as of 18 November is up to 9,000. So, you know, you, you sort of, this does sort of verify that this is a reasonable minimum and obviously 9,000 is a minimum and the real number is some number higher. Um, Lugansk People's Republic said back on five April that they had lost 500 to 600 killed and they'd never say anything further. Donetsk People's Republic, oddly enough, is the only people that's giving us weekly loss reports for this war. And they have systematically reported every single week how many people are killed and how many people are wounded. As far as I can tell, the reports look reasonable and realistic. I have no idea. I did actually email them to try to see if they if they talked to me, and they, of course, have not responded back. What gets my attention, though, is that they do report a 4 to 1 wounded to killed ratio, which is, doesn't surprise me. That's kind of what I would expect to see. Um, but they have, you know, but they have pretty consistently been reporting it every week, and there doesn't seem to be anything odd about this report. So Russian Army losses are, what, 9,600, 4,001, 13,000, 14,000 or higher killed. Um, and then, of course, you wonder if it also accounts for Chechens, which are, or the Wagner Group, et cetera. So, you know, these are probably, probably low, S, low, low counts, any way you look at it. And then there's the missing in action. Um, Russia stated on 30 June that they're holding 6,000 prisoners. Um, they claim that they captured 24,039 in Mariupol. Ukraine stated in early July that they had more than 7,000 people missing. From our studies at the Battle of Kursk, we know that at least that the majority of missing in action end up captured. So, you know, these numbers don't appear to contradict each other. Um, Zelensky has confirmed that there's a whole lot more Russians held. I mean, there's a whole lot more Ukrainians being, being held than there was uh, Russians. There's been about 1,000 prisoners exchanged since the start of the war. That sort of indicates to me that Russians probably captured about 6,000 Ukrainians, and the Ukrainians have captured about 1,000 Russians. Maybe it's, maybe it's maybe higher. And of course, casualties are killed, wounded, captured, missing in action. Wounded is not reported. Anyhow, armed with this data at one point, in early June, I ended up, I got a blog and I got Twitter accounts, so I ended up posting up. And in early June, I sort of basically said, hey, the figures that are being officially reported by Ukraine of Russian casualties cannot be right. Because, you know, at the time we had about 150 to 190,000 Russians army that was about a, estimated to be about 150 to 190,000 invading. We had 30,000 Ukrainians, Russians claimed killed. You had the wounded, which is probably four times 30,000, and then the captured and missing. And basically, you got 156 casualties, 156,000 casualties out of a force of 150,000. So that number is probably wrong. And so I basically ended up writing an article that, bas that said it's clear that the that the um, that that the um, that the Ukrainian claims are off by a factor of two or four. And I tended to lean towards off by a factor of four. And, um, and at the time, U.S. intelligence estimate was saying between 7,000 to 10,000 killed. Um, so that all sort of, sort of matches up with what I was saying. Of course, I got pushed back because the moment I said Russian casualties were not 30,000 killed, and it was probably some figure one-fourth of that, um, a, a number of people gave me some pushback, and of course they particularly went after the issue of wounded to kill because I was saying I was using the four to one wounded to kill ratio from Donetsk People's Republic because that's the only people who reported anything. Um, and that's why we end up having a section on wounded to kill ratio in a moment. Current claims as of 29 November is, well, it's now over 90,000. So Ukraine continues to publish its casualty figures. I go to my Twitter account and I see it there, and then everyone proceeds to do their analysis based upon 90,000 Russians killed. 
um, you know, it's, 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 it's not a believable figure. On 21 August, when Ukraine claimed that 9,000 of their zone had been lost, they were saying that 45,000 Russians were lost. That would mean that the Ukrainians were killing Russians at a wounded to killed ratio of 5 to 1. Um, at the same time, Russia was claiming 61,000 Ukrainians were killed. So there's just sort of general inflation here in the reporting, obviously. Um, and a 5 to 1 killed to 1 ratio, that gets a little hard to believe. The Battle of Kursk in 1943, the exchange ratio between the Germans and the Russians were 3 to 1. So you're arguing, you're arguing that the performance difference between the Ukrainian army and the Russian army is greater than the performance difference in World War II between the German army and the Soviet army. And um, um, so you go through the numbers, and I throw in 3,000 unreported, and I add up the other numbers, and I straight line some estimates out based upon the fact that it's the 21 August, and we're now into uh, December. And I end up coming up with a range of total deaths of between 13,000 to 16,000, and total casualties between 75,000 and 90,000. There's loads of assumptions there. Do the same thing for the Russians. Add in additional Lugansk People's Republic um, deaths. Add in an additional 3,000 unreported. Miss, a thousand missing in action, maybe, because I have a thousand captured, so I just assume a thousand missing. Um, and end up with a range of about 16 to 19,000 Russians killed. Uh, total casualty ranges of 80,000 to 97,000. And that's just back of the envelope calculations um, with some some assumptions for errors, but not, you know, not doubling or tripling the reported figures to get to my, to address my errors. That is still lower than what everyone else is saying. Miley is saying over 100,000 casualties on each side. And that may be true. I don't know. But, you know, if, if, if it is, it's on the, it's going to be on the low side. In my, in, in, in the current DOD estimates, are they assuming casual uh, parity in the casualty exchange ratio. You know, if each side has lost over 100,000, that means they're basically suffering losses one to one between the two armies. Um, does it also mean if they're using the traditional three to one wounded to killed ratio, which everyone seems to hang their hat on, because that's what it was in World War One and that's what it was in World War Two, so we still people still want to use this three to one wounded to killed ratio. Does that mean that there was over 25,000 killed in each side, according to uh, to um, Miley's estimate. Needless to say, I think it's a little lower. I'm working with a wounded, wounded to kill ratio of 4 to 1. I'll go into that in depth. And so I'm looking at total casualties basically between 75,000 and the Russian range is getting up towards 100,000 uh, for the total casualties in the, in the war. And that includes w killed, wounded, captured, and missing. Um, Ukrainian presidential advisor said between 10,000 to 13,000 Ukrainian troops had died as of 1 December. And so it happened early enough, I was able to get my last revision of this chart. Um, I still don't know. I still wonder if this figure is, is low or leaving certain elements out. You know, you can accurately report Army casualties and not report National Guard casualties. So I don't know what they are reporting. General Miley, and this is a sensitive subject, General Miley also said the Ukrainian civilian dead was about 40,000. The UN is independently conducting a survey, and as of 28 October, they had counted 6,655. Probably does not include counts from Mariupol, and it's hard to say what has been lost in, who, who all has been lost in Mariupol. The head of the Donetsk People's Republic at one point said it was 5,000 people killed in Mariupol. Last Ukrainian estimate I saw was saying 22,000 civilians were killed in Mariupol. Uh, the problem is, is that um, these figures haven't been independently verified. And I don't want to downplay the tragedy in Mariupol, but what we have not seen is collections of graveyards that show tens of thousands of people buried. There's been graveyards that clearly have been identified in satellite photos that show hundreds of people buried. There's certainly been a lot of tragedy and a lot of casualties, but there's nothing that really demonstrates that there is tens of thousands of people buried in and around Mariupol. I've not seen the photographs or the, or the satellites of that. Um, so the, um, um, and I, this is 
this is sort of the count of what I see. What was interesting is that the UN did an independent survey of the uh, attack on the theater of Mariupol, the one where people were claiming 600 people were killed. The UN review estimated that about one dozen, the attack definitely occurred, but about one dozen people were killed. So these numbers appear to have gotten inflated a little bit. Um, and so, and that wanders us moving past that. Um, we wander into the issue of wounded to killed ratios. And wounded to killed ratios, these are the figures that are reported. It came out of a book by Trevor Dupuy called Attrition. I repeated my book on uh, uh, war, war by Numbers. But the number that everyone seems to hang on is the three to one wounded to killed ratio. And that's with including di those who died of wounds. And so people keep assuming when they're doing their estimates, keep working with three to one ratios, even though in Korean War and the Vietnam War, it was already higher. And it was higher because, of course, medical care has improved. Um, and I mystify why people keep hanging their hats on the three to one wounded to kill ratio, but they do. Um, and three things have happened since World War II that influences wounded to kill ratios. Use of body armor significantly changes your wounded to kill ratios. Development of motorization and mechanization, mechanization in helicopters, which leads to faster evacuation, changes your uh, wounded to killed ratios. It also increases your die to wound percentages because you're getting people back to the hospitals quicker. And then, of course, improved medical care has made a big difference in wounded to killed ratios. Um, it makes it pretty hard to believe that the wounded to killed ratio in Ukraine remains three to one 75 years after World War II. Um, there are other things that also influence wounded to kill ratios. I have an entire chapter on it in one of my books. Um, posture, whether you're an attacker or a defender. Mix of wounding weapons. What, you know, artillery and, our, and heavy use of artillery tends to generate higher, much higher wounded to kill ratios. And with artillery, you can get up to 10 to 1 wounded to kill ratios, 10 people wounded per person killed with artillery. The nature of combat, particularly unconventional versus conventional warfare. And oddly enough, your definitions, because people define wounded differently. In the U.S. military, the U.S. Army defines wounded differently than the U.S. Marine Corps. Um, in World War II, Germany defined, defined wounded differently than the United States or Britain. Uh, in the United States and Britain, a guy was wounded if he spent the night in the hospital. In Germany, he had to spend three nights in the hospital to get counted as wounded. Um, so an example from a completely different study we did, we pulled up some wounded to kill ratios by units in Vietnam. And this was always a wonderful test case because the 1st Brigade 5th ID, it was actually a mechanized unit up on the DMZ, and that was running a 5 to 1 wounded to kill ratio. You go a little further down, the 3rd Marine Division is running 7 to 1. Operating just to the south of that was two U.S. Army divisions running 6 to 1. And then operating in a much more guerrilla type environment and less hostile environment, you had a Marine division that was running a 9 to 1 wounded to kill ratio, and then the Americal division just south of it down here in these provinces that was running a 6 to 1 wounded to kill ratio. So I pulled up this data. Of course, this to me was a wonderful test case because I had U.S. Army unit, Marine Corps Army unit, U.S. Army unit, Marine Corps Army unit, U.S. Army unit, Almost, almost conventional, less, less conventional scenario, completely unconventional scenario. And it was just sort of an interesting test case of data. Um, obviously, the Marine Corps weren't running a higher, a higher wounded to kill ratio because they were tougher. Uh, they were running a higher wounded to kill ratio because they were using body armor and the reporting requirements were different. They reported every guy as wounded. U.S. Army had a category called Carter for record, and so 20 to 30 percent of the wounded were not counted as wounded. They were just wounded Carter for record. They didn't spend the night in the hospital. They could get a Purple Heart, though. When we get to Iraq, we see the same pattern. My father got one that way. <laughs> you get to Iraq, you, get to, you see the same pattern. U.S. Army, 9 to 1 wounded kill ratio. Iraq's guerrilla warfare. Most of the wounding agents were, were um, IEDs and, you know, blast weapons, um, indirect fire, etc. The Marine Corps is 10 to 1. Afghanistan, 10 to 1 for the U.S. Army. 
um, 13 to 1 for the U.S. Marine Corps. Now, at this point, they're all wearing armor. So clearly, the difference is either Marine Corps is tougher or they're using a different definition. They're using a different definition. And I got a whole chapter on the subject in my book, War by Numbers. Um, you could probably, with <laughs> a significant effort, you could probably actually develop a wounded to kill ratio based upon the nature of the combat, the mix of weapons, the mix of opposition, et cetera, and you could actually come up with something that would be useful. Nobody's ever done that. My attempts to get funding from the Combat Casualty Care Research Program for the uh, DOD were uh, stymied because a medical doctor didn't see the reason for that. Um, so DPR is reporting 4.23 to 1. I obviously don't accept the 3 to 1 ratio. I don't know if the DPR data is correct, but that 4 to 1 ratio seems reasonable to me. The records of some of the records of the 1st Tank Army through 15 March were, 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 were intercepted and picked up. And they, it's a very small count, it's only 260 casualties or so. Uh, but they're reporting 4.39 to 1 wounded to kill ratio. That is with a unit that had over 100 tank losses, high number of missing in action, and high number of POWs. I then went through the report, because, you know, I can sort of read Russian. Um, <laughs> and I went through the report, and um, um, uh, hang on, did I skip a, skip a slide? Yeah. Okay, let me just skip through this for a moment, because I want to, I went through the report and pulled up by regiment the ones that took heavy tank losses and noted the number of killed and wounded in each regiment. So there's 45 tanks lost, there's 15 killed and wounded. There's 44 tanks lost, there's 15 killed and wounded. 18 tanks lost, 32 killed and wounded. Um, the... Um, the old statistics that we had gathered, we were looking at roughly one crew casualty per tank loss. And that was from World War II. That was from the first U.S. Army, June 44 to April 45. That was like 900 tanks that that statistic was developed from. Um, that is both killed and wounded. Looking at the uh, Russian da data, we're coming out from this, from just looking at these three regiments, we're coming out to 0 0.6, less than a person killed per tank loss. And then you add in the fact, you go back to the reports and everyone sort of gloms on to these reports of, you know, 1,500 tanks lost, you know, but those reports are destroyed, abandoned, and captured. 500, you know, 55 of those are abandoned, 515 are captured. So, you know, people have focused on this fact that the Russians have lost 1,500 tanks to say that, yes, the Russians are suffering heavy losses as a result of their actions in the, in the battle. But I'm not convinced of that, that that is a useful or a valid measurement. I mean, if you're looking at the tank losses from Russia versus Ukraine, you're looking at a 4 to 1 exchange ratio. You're looking at IFVs, you're looking at a 4 to, AFVs, you're looking at a 4 to 1 ratio, et cetera. I mean, it all sort of indicates that, that the exchange ratio in vehicles between Russia and Ukraine is 4 to 1, but that does not mean the casualty exchange ratios are 4 to 1. The casualty exchange ratios look to be closer to 1 to 1. Uh, so, okay. so, the, um, so that leads me into a discussion of the comparative quality of the armies, and this is sensitive, and there's nobody that's going to be happy with this, forgive me. Um, a couple of ways of measuring comparative performance of army. One, the one that we've used a lot is something called a combat effectiveness value. This requires us to run engagements through a model and then tell us what the model tells us about the historical engagement. That is always controversial because this is using a combat model. You can measure it directly, which is what I did in my book, War by Numbers, and I looked particularly on World War II data. Uh, you can measure it by comparative casualty effectiveness. You know, if they're in a roughly equal engagement, what is the exchange ratios? What's the exchange ratios in the, in, in the engagements? Are they causing 20% more casualties to the other side, or are they taking twice as many losses as the other side? And so you can look at that, looking at casualty effectiveness, you can look at it on, based upon casualties compared to mission accomplishment, and you can look at casualties versus spatial effectiveness, meaning distance opposed events. And we've done all that. You can also use a judgment or another methodology. Um, William Sayers, who I think was actually referenced in the first day in this briefing, 
William Sayers was an old, is a retired DIA agent, um, Defense Intelligence Agency, and he put together some sample model runs and basically came back and says, it looks like the difference I'm getting is a combat effectiveness value of 1.2 for the Ukrainians, which basically means that the Ukrainian forces are about 20% more effective in combat than the opposing Russian forces. Of course, he was using sample scenarios with estimated order battles in a combat model, um, et cetera. You know, you don't, you don't want to hang your hat on this. Um, but it, 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 it's sort of an indi indication that we're not looking at performance differences of six to one between the Ukrainian and Russian army, which has actually been quoted by somebody in the, in the Ukrainian government. Um, so anyhow, I got four chapters doing compar comparisons of casualty effectiveness between various units in World War II uh, in, in my book. But so what we're looking at is you know, if we work from my estimates of what casualties were in Ukraine and casualties were of Russia, we're looking at about a 1.1 1, 1 .1 to 1 ratio in favor of the Ukrainians. So it looks like we're getting a little bit of performance advantage across the field um, from the Ukrainian army. Now, that performance will vary widely depending on where the units are, what the situation is, what the commander does, etc. I mean, there's no, you know, there's no consistency across this, you know, and particularly I think the Russian army tends to have some very good units and some very weak units. And I think the consistency of the units is, um, is, um, is less. Now, if I work from the <laughs> Ukrainian, <laughs> Ukrainian data as of 21 August, they're still claiming a four to one ratio. Um, so anyhow, it does appear that, um, that the performance difference between the two armies are roughly similar, roughly similar with perhaps Ukraine holding the edge on this. Um, both of the armies came from a similar background. Um, from 1991 to 2010, the Ukraine army was being westernized, but then they voted in Viktor Yanukovych as their president. The army shrunk to 60,000 people. And then they had to rebuild that army from 60,000 people to 170,000 people over the next six, seven years. I don't know what the degree of training is the Ukrainian army is anymore. Um, I had some feeling for it before then because the head of the Dupuy Institute at the time was Major General Nick Kratchu, retired Major General who was originally born in Lvov and was advising the Ukrainian army. Um, it did pick up some experience in fighting in 2014, 2015. Russia also has some experience over time. And then there's issues of doctrine, whether they're using conscripts, whether they're using contract sources, et cetera. So you could sort of sit there and sort of go through the non-quantitative factors. And the non-quantitative factors, would, I think, would tend to lead you to conclude that the armies are roughly equal. You know, we look at the operation. There was a 78-day offensive near Kyrgyzstan. Um, there was limited opposed advance early on the offensive. where They took a couple of villages um, in early September. And after that, everything after that was basically as a result of Russia choosing to withdraw from areas up until they withdraw all the way from Kyrgyzstan. I don't know who suffered the higher losses in that campaign. I did post it up on my blog to see if anyone else had a comment on it. Nobody paid attention to it. I put it in bold and posted it again. Nobody seems to have an opinion on it. Um, but, um, you know, I don't know if the Ukrainian army suffered higher losses during the you know, 78-day campaign against Kyrgyzstan than the Russian army. So, um, um, so anyhow, my ten, ten conclusions of the Russian, Ukrainian and Russian armies are roughly similar in, in ability and capabilities. The Ukrainians have the higher, have the advantage of higher motivation due to defending their homeland. The relative capabilities of the army can, can change over time depending on how the battles are going, how the war is going, the sources of recruitment, training, and of course, getting more experience. Most likely, the Ukrainian army will only get better over time. It is possible that the Russian army will only get worse over time because of their extensive use of, um, of uh, l the, the, the nature of how they're recruiting. Um, it is possible that if the Russian army degrades enough, you could end up with an army that would, would start sliding into collapse. Um, and of course, added to that, we're looking at a war, warfare that is increasingly being dominated by artillery. 
And right now it looks like Ukraine is going to have the edge in artillery and artillery ammunition over time, which will probably throw the, four, the casualty ratios into their favor and probably degrade the morale of the Russian army. So right now it looks like, you know, it's, shall we say, covering the, broadly covering the first 10 months of the war, they were, they were roughly equal. But it looks like over time it's going to shift in favor of the Ukrainians. Shall I continue on to urban warfare? <laughs> okay, nine minutes. Um, we did three, three urban warfare studies back in 2002, 2004. At the time, there was a lot of buzz, especially coming out of RAND, about how significant urban warfare was and how it was going to define the future of warfare and all, all this other stuff. So we were asked by the Center for Army Analysis to come up with model inputs as to how they should measure the effects of urban warfare. Of course, we being unimaginative just took a whole bunch of engagements, division level engagements from the European theater operations in 1944 and proceeded to run, look at what the casualties were as they marched up to the city. And then when they got to the city, looked at the casualty, the casualties were going through the city and looked at what the casualties were of the units that were outside the city that were still fighting outside the city. So we created, basically used history in a laboratory type of settlement, look at, experiment looking at, you know, over 100 engagements outside the city compared to 50 or 60 engagements inside of urban areas. And then we, it was three studies, so we ended up later on doing that for Kharkov. At that time, I still had access to the Soviet archives by contracting a Byzantine cartographer who had access to the Soviet archives. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and um, so the... Um, so we ended, up, um, we ended up doing the three battles of Kharkov in 43. Kharkov was actually the largest city to exchange hands in World War II on the Russian front. It was bigger than Stalingrad. It, so in February 43, the Russians <laughs> took Kharkov. In March, the Germans took it back. In August, the Russians took it back, or the Russians, the Soviet Union. Um, so this gave me, as far as I was concerned, an absolute wonderful case study to look at the casualties fighting in urban areas and casualties not fighting in, in urban areas. And we were eventually went off to look at Philippines, Manila, Way, etc. And then we were going to do a study on Stalingrad, but the money was hung up in contracting office when Hurricane Katrina came through and the money got yanked from us. And the general conclusion was urban warfare slows down casualty rates, urban warfare slows down advance rates, and disease and non-battle injuries decline in an urban environment. RAND was forced to redo their study, <laughs> pulling up the same data we did, and came up with, with a revised study with the same material we were coming up with. Um, so the, there is a, what we didn't see was a significant defensive value to urban terrain above and beyond any other difficult terrain. So, you know, um, you know, urban, urban terrain gives you a defensive value compared to flat open terrain nearby, but it's no more defensible than rugged mixed terrain, rolling mixed terrain, etc. And um, so the, um, so, you know, the, this giant almost mythology that's developed over urban warfare as being this dominant, overwhelming environment that increase, increases stress, increases casualties, increases disease and non-battle injuries, et cetera. It's actually the opposite. It decreases disease and non-battle injuries. Battle fatigue goes down because, you know, you're, you're actually in civilization as opposed to living out in the woods. Um, it's, not, it's, not, it's not any more defensible than any other restricted terrain, you know. Um, and, um, and, um, and casualty rates and loss rates slow down. So we ended up making this statement here, and I'll just read it through. The vast majority of urban terrain, this is what we wrote back in 2002, the vast majority of urban terrain encountered will be flanked by non-urban terrain. Operations on the non-urban flanks will potentially advance at a pace two to four times that of the urban operations. Under normal circumstances, the urban areas will be bypassed in one or both flanks and will be threatened with envelopment within a few days of an operation beginning. Does it sound like Chernigov? Does it sound like Sumi? Furthermore, as the attacker is usually aware that faster progress can be made outside of the urban terrain, the tendency is to weigh one or both flanks and not bother to advance to the city until it is enveloped. So they turn, up, turn into mop-up operations. This, of course, 
will result in either the defender withdrawing from the urban terrain, which is what they, which traditionally what has occurred, or an assault and eventual mop-up operation by the attacker of the enveloped defenders. This has been the consistent pattern in the past and will likely continue to be so in the future for those cases where urban terrain, regardless of the increased size or density, has non-urban flanks. And, you know, that, that was what we wrote 20 years ago. Um, as far as I know, the only case where we have a city with non-urban flanks is arguably Seoul in Korea. And, um, and as we've seen in the war in Ukraine, cities are regularly being bypassed and developed very rarely taken. And when they're taken, it's usually because they weren't defended. So this still appears to be the case. And then intelligence advantage. Um, a lot of people talk about that, so I'm not going to bother too much about it. But it became very obvious, very obvious um, through a series of events that US intelligence, Ukraine had a intelligence advantage during the war over the Russians, and that was, you know, I blogged about it at the start of April, it was painfully obvious that there was more going on here. Um, back in 2004, we did a study for OSDNet assessment on measuring the value of situational awareness. And as far as I'm aware of, this is the only study of measuring the value of situational awareness that was based upon real world combat data. So we put together, being on imaginative, 295 division level World War II engagements. Half were from the Eastern Front and half were from the Western Front. Okay, we back, went back to and reviewed the intelligence files of each of the divisions and coded what they knew about their opponent. We then ended up creating a matrix of results that got very complicated. And I've got two unreadable chapters in my book, War by Numbers, that addresses these complications. But basically what it came down to was we were not getting a huge result from situational advantages. We were getting a bonus from it. This is, of course, looking at division level combat in World War II. And that bonus was up to 25% bonus in combat results and capabilities. But it was nothing like the multipliers that people who were advocates of the revolution of military affairs were discussing. And of course, Andy Marshall's office was one of the sources of the revolution of military affairs. So they thanked us for our study, and I never heard anything further from them. Um, <laughs> um, so, you know, our rough conclusions, because it's a little more complicated, is that superior information advantage gives around a 25% advantage in combat at the division level, at division level combats in World War II. Um, oddly enough, poor situational awareness affects the defenders more than the attackers. It was actually the defenders that generated the worst results from having no knowledge of their opponents. So situational awareness was more important for the defender than was the attacker. Now, of course, what I'm looking at is combat in World War II, where you've got divisions with boundaries and a division on each flank, et cetera. So, you know, they're going to go where they're going to go and have been ordered to go no matter what they know or what they don't know. But it does, does appear that it mattered more to the defenders. There was not much difference in the results between some and considerable um, um, knowledge of the enemy, there was some, there was considerable difference between little and some. So, you know, having some information about your opponent made a big difference. Having a lot didn't make that big of an additional difference. Ha knowing little about your opponent made a difference. Um, and so, you know, the question was, was the real problems caused when you know nothing? Yes. Is there a point of diminishing returns in situational awareness? You know, at the time, of course, the RMA people were talking about complete situational awareness and complete knowledge of everything. Um, you know, um, you know, this is obviously not the end all of this discussion, but it is the only discussion on situational awareness based upon real world data that I am aware of. And I seem to have some, I, I seem to think there's some value in using real world data for testing material as opposed to, um, you know, doing a, a thought experiment using thimbles and peas and pods, which is what the RMA people kept discussing. Of course, this does raise the question, if we're seeing a 20% advantage or so in Ukrainian combat performance, is that because there's a 25% advantage for superior intelligence? 
And I think we'll stop there. I'll get to the conclusion of this slide. Um, um, looks like, most likely, it looks like this war will continue till fall of 2023. I would not be surprised if it continues till fall of 2024. Um, and I will skip all the discussion as to why. I'm sure most of the people know that. You know, so what are you, what are you looking at? Here's the, my estimated range of losses for 2022 so far, effectively. Um, you know, um, and so in 2023, right now, I gather both armies are roughly 200,000 people. In 2023, are both armies going to be 400,000 people? Does having armies twice the size in the same area result in twice the casualties? I don't know. Um, and plus, we're looking at extensive deployment and use of artillery. And is that going to drive up the casualties? It's going to change the wounded to kill ratios. So, you know, we're looking at total total 36,000, 42,000 killed in this war in 2022. Are we looking at twice as many killed in 2023? And are we looking at, a, at the war continuing in 2024? And that's, you know, some unpleasant back of the envelope analysis. Um, I'm not sure I'd call it an analysis. Guesstimation may be the better word. Uh, but that's, um, that's potentially what we're looking at. And I think that's it. Thank you, Chris. Uh, very interesting. And now we are going to do two things at the same time. Uh, while we prepare Vasil for his uh, speak, speech uh, and presentation, we'll do Q&A at the same time. So can I ask you to go back and get your micro microphone? So do the audience have any questions for Chris? Yes, there's one there. These numbers are only military casualties, and uh, how do urban combat affect civilian casualties? We never, we never addressed civilian casualties when, when we did our first urban warfare studies. Obviously, we're aware of it because, in particular, the Battle of Manila, it was an issue in '45 in the Philippines, uh, but we never addressed it, and so we've never actually done any analysis on that. Um, Chris, you seem to be reporting a big disparity in prisoners of war lost by the Ukrainians and lost by the Russians. Do you think that's an artifact of reporting or do you think it reflects battlefield reality? Mm, I, I think it's just the situation that developed in the first month of the war. Yeah, I mean, you know, that, that you know, the first month of the war, <laughs> there was Russian units running everywhere and going everywhere. And I, and I don't know when, when the, when, when the 6,000, um, Russian prisoners were, you know, the 6,000 Ukrainian prisoners were taken, but Russia reported in June. So it was clearly occurred in the first couple of months of the war, and I suspect it's because, you know, it was, you know, you know, in, 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 in the first couple of weeks of March and the first week and the last week of February, it was a very mobile situation. There's one back there. James first. Uh, Chris, I'm so sorry if I've taken that one. Really interesting stuff. Thank you so much. Just, do you have an X factor you can put into the maths, rather like the Lancaster um, uh, modelling, that takes into account a home match versus an away match, a sanctions that kick in, and of course the allies that are supporting directly or indirectly for both sides? Over. Well, the combat, the combat model that we occasionally use um, is called the. Um, it was originally called the QJM, it's the TNDM. And it, of course, like every combat model, addresses all the issues of terrain and all the other conditions of combat, et cetera, and then addresses and values all the weapons and puts in factors for all the weapons to address, et cetera. But then it has a factor called combat effectiveness value, which is to address the human factors. And human factors fundamentally, the real core of human factors is fundamentally morale, training, experience, leadership, and I actually have a listing of 16, but I won't bother to list the other 12. There's lots of things that influence it. Um, and the um, combat effectiveness value we find can move change to as much as six to one, depending on what the forces are. I think Falklands, it was four or six to one when we ran the Falkland battalions through. I think it was four to one when we ran the Falkland battalions through. And that was the difference between the British Army and the Argentine Army. Um, 
In South Africa, we ended up with ratios of six to one. Um, the the uh, German army against the Soviet army in um, in 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 40, 1943 in 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 Kharkov and Kursk, it was about th three to one. And um, and then in, in Italy in forty three and forty four, the German army held about a twenty percent advantage over the U.S. army and a slightly higher advantage to that over the British army in Italy in 1943 and 44. That last statistic got us extremely unpopular in Leavenworth. Yeah. There was uh, one last question there. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, have you seen any difference of casualties or combat effectiveness from the start of the war to where we are now? I or a difference between offensive or defensive operations? Uh, we don't have anywhere near the detail to do that. You know, I would, I would actually have to start getting casualty reports from both sides over time that would do that. And the only, the only casualty report I've got over time is from the Donetsk People's Republic because they have systematically reported it every single week. Okay, uh, Dr. Rubin will get the last question. Did you ever study <coughs> the ratio between the claimed casualties of uh, a side claimed by the other side and the real casualties. I have done that. I've done it for the Battle of Kursk. It's in my, it's easy to look up. It's in my 1,662 page book on Kursk. So, <laughs> but I have done that. And, um, and I did actually go through and look at what the Soviets were claiming were German casualties, what the Germans were claiming for Soviet casualties. I also did it for um, the air combat. Um, the air combat statistics, I have to know off the top of my head because I just finished up another book on, on the air battles of the Battle of Kursk. In the air combat, the, Soviets were, the Soviet Air Force over Kursk was losing planes at a rate of six to one compared to the Germans. They were losing six planes for every, every plane the Germans lost. These were roughly equal planes technologically. Um, they were, of course, claiming ten times as many casualties as the Germans were, lost, were losing. Uh, because the Soviet staff system at the time, to quote from Colonel Sverdlov, who was a veteran of World War II and later a professor at Friends of Military Academy, the enemy always suffers more casualties than you. And that's what he see. And he was a staff officer with the Soviet Army during World War II. And he says, this is what I did. I know what we do. I know how we do it. So the Russians always, the, so Russians, the Soviet Union always reported higher losses than they suffered almost invariably. So, you know, a battle occurs, the Germans, are, the Germans are exchanging casualties with the Russians at about three to one ratio. Obviously, the Russian reporting is claiming that the Germans lost more than they did. So at the Battle of Prokhorovka, the Russians lost 400 tanks on 12 July, 1943. Of course, they claim they killed 400 German tanks. They did not. German, Germans probably lost at most 70 tanks that day. Um, so, um, so, so there has always been a tendency in the Soviet army to inflate casualty figures. Um, oddly enough, for the air battle at the, at the Battle of Kursk, the German estimates of, 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 um, of Russian plane losses almost exactly matched to within a couple of planes their actual losses. Now, the Germans were getting six to one kills, so they probably weren't feeling a strong need to brag. Um, <laughs> and so I think there's, and oddly enough, on the, days when the, on the days when the Russians lost their highest losses, when they went through and went through 75 planes in a day, the Germans underestimated their, the number of killed. It was on the days when they had low losses that they tended to overestimate, and then it all averaged out to equal up to about the number of planes they lost. Thank you. How do I disconnect? Okay. Now, I would like to introduce the next uh, speaker. His name is uh, Colonel Vasil Shvalyudshinsky. He is from the Ukrainian army. I presented you uh, a couple of hours before. He um, completed his studies at the Odessa Military Institute of Ground Forces in 1997. 
He then served in the following positions as a mechanized platoon commander, mechanized company commander, and then deputy chief of staff of a mechanized regiment. After completing his studies at the National Defense Academy of Ukraine, he was appointed to the position of Deputy Chief of Staff of a tank brig brigade. After that, he attended and graduated school and earned a um, PhD in 2013. He uh, received the academic title of Associate Professor after that. Now he is a um, professor and a deputy head of the army department in the university. And since 2021, he has been head of the, that department. In uh, 2015, he performed combat missions during an anti-terrorist operation in the East Ukraine at the Joint Forces headquarters. In 2019, he attended the foreign language course in San Antonio, Texas, and the Joint Staff Command and Staff course in Norfolk, Virginia. From March to May in uh, uh, this year, he performed the mission as a chief of staff of, the, of one of the sectors, uh, which is part of the Kyiv City Defense Group. And he is going to talk about courses of action of the Ukrainian army military formations during counteraction to the Russian aggression. So Vil Vasil, please, the floor Thank is you yours. Thank you so much. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to, uh, to, to say uh, thank you so much for TIGVEST, for organizers of our conference, uh, to be here to speak with you, because uh, uh, maybe uh, several months ago i didn't mm, understand did believe that i uh, during the war i will be able to go to uh, some somewhere abroad yes <laughs> yes but uh, thank you for your co uh, cooperation thank you for your support uh, because of uh, without uh, support of all civilized world uh, all of what you do for our country uh, i think that i could be able to be here yeah uh, today maybe uh, I, I could be uh, complete statistic uh, what about uh, our uh, uh, my, my uh, previous uh, presenter uh, told about yes uh, but uh, I'm here and thank you for very much for that uh, my uh, before uh, I came back uh, came back to uh, Norway uh, I planned uh, uh, to present my presentation on different places <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, that organi organizers uh, told me that uh, presentation should be cut, <laughs> short and clear. Yeah? Uh, I did everything to, to uh, make it short, but I don't know if it will be clear because of my English is not very good. Sorry about that, but I try. Uh, how much uh, time I have? You have uh, 35 minutes. Oh, very good. About 40 minutes. A lot of. <laughs> okay. We will listen to you, so just don't think about it. This work. Um, I need to read because of, uh, you will not understand what about you. <laughs> I, I, will, I will tell you, okay? Uh, to defeat the enemy which has a significant, a significant advantage in means uh, of air attack missiles, artillery and other weapons. The Ukrainian uh, army uh, is forced to act non-standard, non-template and uh, sometimes uh, defiantly. Uh, the chosen uh, courses of action must be effective, unexpected for the enemy uh, uh, and inflict maximum losses while providing that friendly forces are maintained uh, in a uh, combat ready state our armed forces <coughs> sorry uh, armed forces other components of the security and <coughs> defense sector <coughs> i'm sorry uh, have significant adv advantages uh, over the enemy uh, these advantages uh, are in leadership command and control efficiency flexibility professionalism etc at the same time, uh, we had certain mis uh, miscalculation regarding 
uh, risk management to prepare uh, repelling Russia's, Russia's uh, armed aggressors, uh, aggression. Factors uh, that negatively... Oh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, factors that ne uh, negatively affected the effectiveness of military formation operations include a low level of uh, personal training, in, uh, not uh, in all, but in the parts of uh, our troops uh, and forces, uh, weak uh, intent in uh, inter in, uh, interdepartmental, yeah, is uh, correct, interdepartmental uh, uh, interaction, extremely low level of pre pre preparedness for uh, reducing enemy uh, uh, mobility, engineer, uh, engineering uh, the obstacles, etc. Thus, uh, measures uh, had to be taken already during the conduct of the defense operations to reduce the impact of these weaknesses. Uh, I will use my experience and the experience of uh, my uh, colleagues from, uh, from the Army Department of our University, uh, who uh, also, like me, uh, took part at the uh, in, uh, in the operation of defense of Kyiv, yeah? Uh, I will talk about experience of maneuver units, uh, air defense, air and army aviation. Uh, the operation of, Ky of defense Kyiv can be divided into three stages. Uh, repelling the enemy's strike group of troops, and forces uh, start from February 24 and uh, to beginning uh, of March, uh, stopping the enemy's offensive at large, uh, disrupting Russians, uh, Russian efforts to resume the offensive. Uh, start, uh, it was start uh, uh, beginning of start of uh, from from start to end of March, and force the enemy. Uh, to retreat from our territory uh, end of March and beginning of April. I would like to focus on uh, effective use of maneuvering group, uh, maneuver, maneuver f our mobile fire group uh, by both maneuver uh, by both units armed with uh, maneuver units armed from uh, uh, new anti-tank uh, weapons like Javelin, like uh, Enlau and Ukrainian uh, Stugnape. Uh, maybe you hear uh, about it, and the air defense units. Uh, thus, the key task uh, to block the enemy from uh, approaching Kiev city in, in the early phase were, were firstly, to provide support. Sorry. Yes, to provide support for the uh, battalion battalions f uh, that were be, uh, defending in the first position. Secondly, uh, the military formation planned to delay the enemy's offensive uh, in the event of enemy uh, penetration through the first position by conducting uh, delaying operations and intermediate positions. Uh, third, to block the enemy at the final position, uh, the next task was to prevent the airborne landing and capture of the Borispil airfield by the enemy, and in final, uh, if there was a breakout by the enemy of the final position, the sector units uh, had to fix a significant part of the enemy enemy's forces by conducting a secular defense around Borispil and Bravari. Uh, but thanks to the courage and heroism of our soldiers who strongly defended the first position, the enemy was unable to break through uh, our defenses uh, and this uh, made it possible to successfully uh, move to the uh, third uh, phase of the operation uh, to force the enemy <coughs> uh, to retreat. The, <coughs> the large front of the uh, significant uh, the significant distance uh, of the command post from the front line uh, of own uh, troops and uh, the first position and other factors uh, uh, prompted the Kyiv defense leadership to divide sector double B. Uh, we talked about double B, Bravo and Borispol. Uh, into two separate sectors according to the territorial principle uh, within the uh, boundaries of administri administrative districts. Uh, 
I would also like to note that uh, the tactical standards defined uh, by field menus or status, which we used uh, for today in our armed forces, uh, for maneuver units are uh, exceeded in practice by three, five, uh, and sometimes uh, ten uh, times more uh, in practice. Uh, therefore, this situation requires uh, paying more attention uh, to maneuver uh, maneuvering actions. Uh, the most significant factors uh, for uh, effectiveness in an early phase uh, and still present are uh, the patriotism and high level of motivation of uh, those people who did not evacuate and uh, uh, despite the threat uh, of losing their lives, uh, got their hands of on weapon and uh, performed tasks at checkpoints and battle position. Uh, I would like to tell about one uh, example uh, which we had in uh, bravery uh, direction uh, when uh, people afraid uh, to fight with enemy, uh, but uh, one. Uh, anti-tank anti gunners, it, it will be uh, good, uh, uh, shoot uh, to the enemy tank, but uh, miss, uh, uh, don't hit it, yes, it, it will be correct. Um, but uh, tank, uh, tank stopped and uh, stopped and uh, uh, people who was inside uh, spread uh, to the territory. Uh, the next day, uh, head of the uh, bravery, uh, give uh, to that soldier five uh, hundred dollars. After that, uh, battalion of territorial defense uh, captured uh, <laughs> the, uh, the uh, village uh, which was uh, next to uh, Bravory. Uh, it's it's a joke about motivation, but it, it is it is true. <coughs> Professionalism and experience of commanders and subordinates of soldiers, uh, because you know that we have war st uh, which uh, start in 2014. Leadership qualities of our commanders and the level of relationship in military teams. Uh, it is might be uh, one of the great differences uh, differences between our army and uh, Russian army. Uh, uh, hatred of the enemy uh, who has been trying to destroy and oppress our people for many centuries uh, and the uh, uh, unprecedented support of our people from the entire civilized world and I would like to say you uh, uh, more and more thank you for, for your support it is very uh, great uh, help for us uh, some uh, uh, questions uh, concerning the army uh, air defense uh, uh, units course courses of actions uh, the uh, enemy uses single pairs and uh, sections or maybe links yeah uh, do you use this uh, aviation links uh, of fighters and attack helicopters to provide air support for its land com uh, combat operations most most of uh, the aircraft they used airborne weapons against ground targets uh, without entering the zone of defeat and uh, of air defense units. Uh, at the same time, uh, they uh, observed the radio silence uh, regime and uh, uh, operated at extremely low altitude uh, using the topography and the area along the uh, uh, riverbeds. At the beginning of the defense operation, unfortunately, uh, no air defense system was created in the northern, uh, northern uh, direction. Uh, we, have, uh, we, had, uh, we created uh, our system on the uh, east, uh, uh, where we have uh, uh, joined, uh, where we conduct, conducted joint forces operation, but on the north it was not created. Uh, so the main uh, method of fire control uh, and air defense units was decentralized. Portable anti-aircraft missile complexes uh, played uh, a significant role in destroying uh, the air enemy. Mobile fire group uh, were created on both military and civil, uh, civilian vehicles with uh, a supply of portable anti-aircraft missile system like IGLA or Needle, maybe you know about it, uh, and uh, uh, Stinger, uh, which uh, advanced uh, in the uh, 
uh, enemy's aircraft probable actions, dire directions, uh, and uh, created ambushes uh, while constantly moving. Uh, for example, uh, personnel under the leadership of Major General Kiselev, uh, he was uh, uh, head of the Air Defense uh, Department in the Army, uh, and uh, he retired uh, before the war, maybe two, two years ago. Uh, correct? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but uh, uh, on uh, 25 of uh, February he returned and uh, uh, took uh, three, three uh, uh, sergeant with, with him, uh, a civilian car, and went to, uh, to Bucha and uh, uh, to Bucha direction uh, uh, to create uh, ambushes against uh, aviation of, uh, of the enemy. Due to uh, uh, they shut down uh, four car uh, 50, uh, 52s uh, in uh, Gustomel and Bucha di direction uh, and used a uh, portable anti-aircraft missile system. Due to high, force, uh, high uh, losses, uh, the Russian uh, increased the distance uh, of attack and effectiveness of his action uh, decreased uh, significantly. Uh, as airborne weapons were unused uh, without uh, entering the zone of defeat uh, of air defense system, ambushes again became the main way of fighting against, uh, against attack aircraft and combat helicopters. Uh, but for action in ambushes, it is necessary to have a so-called gray zone uh, or uh, to go in a small group of anti-aircraft gunners behind the front edge of the enemy, uh, which uh, significantly complicates uh, the execution of tasks. This also showed the uh, insufficient efficiency of the available means of air defense of Ukraine in encountering UAVs, uh, uh, unmanned area vehicles, yeah? uh, and the helicopters, which are equipped with special protection. Uh, to ensure the uh, destruction uh, of four, uh, for example, Ka-52 helicopters, attacks uh, were carried out with uh, uh, concentrated fire by two or three anti-aircraft gunners. Uh, firing uh, at night was efficient, uh, effective only from uh, the portable anti-aircraft missile complex like Perun uh, from Poland uh, production, yeah. uh, which is uh, equipped by uh, night, uh, uh, not night, but with a, a combined site. Uh, an analysis uh, of army aviation combat operations uh, in the first month of the war showed that uh, there are uh, several important factors that significantly affect uh, the effectiveness of the helicopters, uh, helicopter units operations. Such factor are, uh, factors are uh, the quality of crew training, uh, thorough study of the operation environment, uh, establishment of clear interaction with units uh, on the ground, uh, especially with air defense units. Uh, because uh, friendly fire, it is very big problem uh, in our uh, army uh, during the first months of operations. Uh, I uh, was in the uh, headquarters of uh, in Kiev and uh, uh, spent some time with my uh, colleague from from army aviation, and I thought that uh, we don't have any aviation, but he told me that we have more than 60 helicopters for, for that time. Uh, but he told me also that eight helicopters was uh, 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 shot yeah, yeah, by, by our, our own uh, air defense system. Uh, this is the key of the... Uh, successful execution of a combat mission by helicopter units uh, and significantly uh, reduces the loss of crew and uh, aviation equipment during combat operations. Uh, a careful uh, study of the position of friendly forces, uh, features of the terrain, uh, the presence and location of power lines in the area of the uh, strikes, the laying of routes uh, to the uh, target uh, of the strike and in the opposite di direction, uh, taking into account the results of the study, 
uh, of the uh, hostilities condition allow carry out successful uh, pinpoint air strikes uh, on targets and uh, uh, that uh, have been uh, identified uh, identified in advance uh, depending on the enemy's air defense uh, countermeasures uh, repeal, uh, repeated attacks uh, on the target uh, were carried out with different uh, courses without crossing the front line of the enemy's troops. Uh, the retreat uh, after the uh, attack was carried out in different directions uh, considering the situation. Radio silence, of course, during operation was uh, ensured. I would like to uh, give one example of successful action of the enemy uh, aviation crew in interaction with special forces units after the anti-aircraft uh, uh, missile and gun complex uh, uh, Panzer S, Russian Panzer S, uh, was destroyed by the special forces with the help of barrage ammunition the army aviation crew carried out an attack by, by fire on the enemy platoon on the first position it was successful operation uh, on one uh, of, of direction. Uh, in the first week of active uh, hostilities, the main attacks uh, of the helicopter units uh, were the search and uh, disruption of enemy columns. Uh, the tasks were performed by helicopter units uh, uh, consisting mainly of three Mi-24 helicopters and one Mi-8 helicopter, uh, the crew of which, in addition of firing tasks, uh, performed search and secure tasks. Advantages, high accuracy of fighting, uh, surprise regarding the strike by the sec uh, second pairs and uh, availability of information about the results of strike from uh, from crew uh, disadvantages reduce ability to uh, detect targets uh, reducing the reaction time to the helicopter crew and uh, increasing the uh, probability of damage of helicopters from small arms and uh, by fragments of the uh, rockets uh, yeah and uh, uh, constant entry into the zone of detection and destruction by means of enemy air defense. In advance, uh, the task of air support of maneuver, uh, maneuverable units were uh, subsequently carried out on targets identified. Uh, the strike was carried out from the uh, camber mode from friendly territory. A missile are launched along a ballistic trajectory without entering the zone of damage of the enemy, enemy's anti-aircraft defenses. To increase the effectiveness of fighting uh, from a camber, uh, three probable uh, fighting area or target area uh, areas uh, are uh, assigned during preparation for combat uh, flight. During the flight uh, to the target in the, uh, pre uh, in the uh, presence of communication with a uh, uh, with uh, advanced air gunners or ground units, uh, the location of the target is uh, specified. Advantages, uh, advantages, uh, advantages uh, increasing the uh, survey, survey, survey sorry, <laughs> of helicopters, increasing the area of fire damage, and disadvantages, uh, impossibility to aim in fire uh, at target due to lack lack of uh, visual contact with the target uh, and lack of information about the result of the strike from the crew. Uh, also, the analysis of combat experience showed the high efficiency of the joint performance of tasks by army units and tactical aviation on Su-24 and Su-25 air aircraft. Uh, for example, uh, after Su-24 bomb attack uh, and air attack in, uh, is carried out by uh, a group of climbing helicopters, after which a pair of Su-25 uh, strikes uh, at the time interval of two or three minutes. Uh, thanks to this order of launching and Air strike after an accurate Su-24 strike, uh, the column dispersed uh, and uh, the personnel leave the combat equipment. A pair of helicopters attack a large area where combat equipment and personnel are uh, unprotected. Uh, so, 
thanks for uh, to the effecti effective action of the army's military units and the clear organization of uh, interaction with the military formation of other components uh, the security and defense forces it is possible to uh, overcome even an enemy uh, that has a, a qualitative advantage advantage in force and means the experience gained in the war with the Russian aggressor, both positive and negative, requires immediate study and consideration uh, when planning further military operations, as well as in the educational process of military uh, educational institutions. Scientific and pedagogical of our university have a unique opportunity to uh, personally, uh, personally gain uh, uh, combat experience by participating in combat operations. Uh, communicate with uh, students uh, who uh, are direct participant, uh, particip participants in the Russian-Ukrainian war, uh, to receive both detailed and gener generalized information from many sources available today, available today and uh, uh, to introduce it into the educational process. Uh, so, thank you for your attention. Uh, I hope that despite of low level of my <laughs> English, I will be able to answer your question. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vasil. Uh, I guess there are several questions, so uh, it's uh, good that we have uh, enough time for that. Um, I guess that there are questions popping up that you may not uh, that you may not be um, allowed to answer due to security. But uh, then you just have to say uh, if that's the case. Mm -hmm. We o o obviously accept that. But uh, after seeing that, um, are there any questions from the audience to uh, this presentation? This is my debut. Uh, speak with this. Uh, audience in English. <laughs> so <laughs> sorry for that. I uh, need to train. <laughs> uh, thank you, Sarah. It was very interesting. Uh, on the last point where you were talking about the follow-up uh, using the, the SU-24s, 25s from yeah. the helicopter strikes, were there cases too where you're utilizing uh, ground-based long-range fires, either um, howitzer or rocket fires in similar fashion? Uh, using artillery after the uh, no. helicopter uh, strikes. We need to... Uh, uh, to do something uh, like graphic, uh, no. Uh, uh, when we use uh, aviation artillery, uh, need to uh, to change this position. Yes. Uh, after that, uh, when uh, aircrafts and helicopters uh, uh, finish th their missions, uh, we we use also an uh, artillery on on the maybe to th the, the same direction. Okay, thank you. And then uh, just uh, a follow up. Uh, I, I, I don't know <laughs> if you understand me. <laughs> no, that was yeah talking about the using the artillery afterwards and then ah. dis displacing the artillery in order to protect them. Yeah, um, because we use our aviation uh, on a very low altitude. Altitude, yes. And uh, when we use artillery and aviation together, it uh, could be very uh, dangerous. Yeah. Okay. You know, you know about it. No. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's another. I'm sorry about this, but sir, excellent presentation. Thank you. Can thank I you. ask you about your original doctrine, which had its origins in the old Soviet doctrine, and how you had to adapt that to change your fighting methods since February? Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, maybe start to change uh, our system, uh, educational system and uh, doctrinal system, uh, maybe uh, from. Uh, 2014, uh, but in our university uh, it was started uh, in 2018, uh, and a lot of the doctrinal documents we changed. Uh, for example, uh, in in the army for uh, maneuvering uh, for uh, mechanized and tank brigades, we used a new uh, new status maybe or uh, field manuals, uh, which uh, based on the 
United States uh, FM 396 uh, Brigade Combat Team. Uh, but it is not, um, uh, it is temporary uh, documents. But uh, we know that uh, we know that uh, our and we uh, we have seen uh, for today that our uh, armed forces and army uh, was created from uh, not not created. Uh, 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 start. Uh, no, we had uh, three hundred thousand people in our armed forces here, uh, and today it is maybe uh, approximately one million. million. Army, Navy, Air Force, and others, and the uh, uh, seven hundred thousand people uh, who uh, came to to our armed forces, uh, they don't know uh, new new field menus, new doctrines. They know only uh, old, uh, which was created on based on Soviet doctrines. You know, uh, and this is problem for us for today. In our university, we, uh, we try to learn our uh, officers, our uh, students, uh, close to NATO standards. We know about it because, uh, because uh, a lot of our officers um, uh, had a course, some courses, like me, uh, I had a short course in, in, Vir in Virginia, you told about it, but, and, uh, but it is hard to, to change, yes, for today. Thank you. So it's impressive how fast you have changed the doctrine. We have tried for ages to, to try and change things, so <laughs> impressive. So, so the question is, how do you do it? Are you, are you, are you taking the same, same time for the courses, or do you shorten them due to the war? How do you manage to, to train the officers mm -hmm. while you are, are performing a war? Uh, Uh, from February to, my, to May, in, in our university, we didn't have any, any uh, classes uh, because all of our officers uh, were in, in mission uh, in uh, different direction, in Bakhmut, in, uh, uh, in, in, in uh, sectors uh, around the Kiev and inside the Kiev. Uh, but uh, on May, uh, we start to uh, train our new uh, uh, staff for new brigades. 66 brigade, five, uh, five uh, uh, regiment, and other and other. And uh, for today, uh, it it is uh, not long but short courses, uh, approximately uh, two or three weeks. Uh, it is not enough as for me, uh, but we need to do it because uh, we need to complete our army, our armed forces uh, for new, new troops. For uh, yes, uh, and today. Uh, we have 12 officers from our university who train, uh, who are training our uh, brigade uh, in uh, the training center in, in Germany. Not only in Ukraine, but in Germany, uh, in, in, in other countries. Because uh, you know that it is dangerous uh, to uh, keep together or to uh, put together a lot of people on one uh, training center in Ukraine. We need to spread. Uh, even uh, in, in our university, uh, we try to uh, conduct our lessons not only in uni our university, but in civilian universities. Okay. Thank you, Bartsu. Uh, may I... Um May you say something uh, on how you were able to keep situational awareness and command and control and information system up and running when you were conducting operations like you are shown in your presentations? Mm. Uh, command and control system? Yeah, how you were able to keep the situational uh -huh. keep awareness situation. mm -hmm. and also the command and control when running those operations? Yeah. Uh, our uh, command and control system was... Uh, uh, was good working maybe uh, uh, in in the military formation uh, like uh, in my sector where I performed a task uh, it was uh, 20, uh, 22nd uh, mechanized brigade uh, and uh, uh, eight, eight, eight mountain brigade it's good mountain and uh, uh, infant, mountain infantry brigade 
uh, and airborne brigade uh, because it was a military institution which was created uh, a lot of time ago and they ha had a good uh, combat experience but uh, we had a big problems uh, with uh, terror de territory de defense units uh, it was approximately 8000 people in our sector only uh, and uh, 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 different civilian organization uh, which uh, tried to help us but uh, we didn't uh, had uh, any communication with them uh, the main communication system it was mobile phone uh, but uh, step by step uh, maybe uh, from march to may uh, we we had uh, three types of uh, communication system it it helped us to uh, to, uh, uh, to to help, yes, uh, command and control system on uh, that level uh, that uh, help us uh, to conduct operations to uh, to keep to keep it in a, in, in a good level, maybe. I don't know. I, I don't have enough words to explain what I <laughs> I want to, to talk you. Maybe uh, you understand me, no? <laughs> if not, you can uh, write me and I need to <laughs> Uh, I need to use uh, uh, Google Translator, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for that. I need to improve my English. <laughs> well, uh, I would like to ask one question as well. Um, I guess that you have a system for uh, collecting the experience. Yeah. So a kind of lessons learned system. Can you say something about that? Uh, yes, uh, yes. All of our department in the, in the university uh, every week uh, we uh, collect all information uh, because, uh, as I told, uh, that we have good opportunity to speak with our uh, with our students who are uh, who was who participated in the combat missions uh, and it helped me uh, to create a command and control system uh, when we start to uh, start our mission because uh, when i went to 12th sector or double b sector uh, i didn't have any communication with with different with uh, all troops which was in our uh, sector and uh, but i had uh, the phone numbers of our students and i start to phone who served in 70, uh, 72 brigades and uh, we start to go to first position and after that we uh, we had whole picture what uh, and today uh, we uh, get information from different sources uh, put it together and uh, uh, also we had historical center in our university which complete whole uh, information for from our institute uh, institute for different institutes and for today it may be uh, i don't know uh, 12 or 13 uh, uh, big i uh, how it is uh, big books yes mm -hmm. uh, with information about uh, uh, statistic about uh, results of war yeah Thank i think that in future it will be good good material to uh, to com complicate some co uh, some historical maybe uh, books or something else. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, Vasil. It was uh, a very interesting uh, presentation, and uh, obviously we can talk more during the dinner and in the pauses. So now yeah, we'll thank have you a so break. Much. Now uh, we'll have a 15 minute break and uh, we'll start again uh, quarter to three. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, um, our next speaker is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Eric Elden from the Norwegian Land Warfare Center. He uh, works at the School of Tactics and Operations and um, he is a senior staff officer and uh, he is uh, working out of arena in norway 
His military background is uh, mainly from the army as a mechanized infantry officer. But he has also served in the Norwegian Navy, Home Guard, and at the Norwegian Joint HQ. He has several deployments to international operations, including Kosovo, Afghanistan, and Iraq. And he, uh, he was awarded the Defense Medal of Merit in 2012 for courage in combat. Elden has his military education from the Norwegian Military Academy, where he holds a bachelor's degree in military studies and from the Norwegian Defense University College, uh, where he has an MA. He has published two books, um, War and Love, that's uh, Krig og Kjærlighet in Norwegian, and Veteraner, vi, uh, Veterans. So, um, Erik, please. Thank you. Uh, general, ladies and gentlemen, in this briefing I will um, address the factor adaptability, um, which I think is one of the main reasons for the Ukrainian tactical successes on the battlefield. Uh, my research shows that the Ukrainians have been able to adjust their tactics relative to the Russians in a way that puts Ukrainian strength against Russian weaknesses. Furthermore, we see that some relative differences in uh, organization, intelligence and leadership have contributed to the Ukrainians being able to do so. I've already been introduced, so I don't have to do that again. <coughs> uh, the agenda is, as shown on the slide, a short introduction, a little bit about fighting power. Then I will go into the uh, mobile defense and the penetration attack and then discuss some relative advantages. <coughs> uh, since May this year, uh, the Land Warfare Center has had a working group dedicated to collecting and assessing observations from the war. Our focus has been on the tactical level or the subtactical, <coughs> and we are trying to identify observations and things that can be useful for the development of the Norwegian army. And this includes uh, verifying whether our doctrines are relevant or not, how to best utilize modern technology, and how to further develop civil-military cooperation. Uh, the Norwegian Army conducted training of uh, Ukrainian artillery forces in Germany in May and June. Um, and this gave us a chance of talking to um, a group of Ukrainian soldiers from different brigades, which my colleague uh, Sergeant Vettel will go into uh, after this briefing. And currently we participate in Operation Interflex in the UK, where we provide basic training to Ukrainian soldiers. Uh, besides information from Ukrainian soldiers and a few documents from NATO, our observations are mostly based on open sources. Uh, since the war is still ongoing, <coughs> uh, we um, uh, try to use the term uh, observation since the lessons identified or lessons learned. Uh, I think it's a bit too early to conclude with lessons learned. And we also see that the Ukrainians are very good at OPSEC, uh, especially in the field that I'm trying to study, which is uh, subtechnical uh, uh, experiences and uh, what kind of methods they use at the tactical level. They are very good at hiding that. So um, uh, bear that in mind when I present my observations. But uh, we have done some extensive research we had had some good discussions um, <laughs> in the combined arms community in Norway, and I think we have managed to find some observations that we believe are valid. And this presentation is based on uh, observations gathered by the working group, but the uh, deductions are my own. I will start by explaining um, what adaptability is and by using doctrine. Um, the NATO doctrine for land operations divides fighting power in three components, the conceptual, the moral, and the physical. Uh, fighting power describes the operational effectiveness and capability of an armed force. Or, as uh, J.F.C. Fuller said 100 years ago, the ability to destroy the enemy's plan, destroy his will to fight, and to destroy his physical strength. And as you all know, fighting power is, of course, relative to the adversary. 
When we compare fighting power, we often have a tendency to focus on the tangibles, uh, the physical stuff like the relative number of troops, tanks and aircraft. Uh, sometimes we also address the moral component by comparing the will to fight. In this case, who is fighting for their own freedom and who is fighting a war of choice. If we add international support to Ukraine and the international sanctions and pressure on Russia to the equation, you can say that this war is a fight between two forces that are more or less equal, or what we could call near pair adversaries. If we look at the physical component, the Ukrainian armed forces may have a relative advantage in training level, uh, readiness and other factors, but Russia has more um, ammunition, more firepower, uh, and the equipment the two parties use is uh, more or less the same. If you look at the moral component, <coughs> the Ukrainians are fighting for their own freedom and for their own lives. Some Russian soldiers also believe that they are fighting for Russia's survival and for their own lives, uh, since many of them are forced to fight and uh, since there is a threat that deserters may be killed. In the conceptual component, both parties have their doctrines and have been more or less successful in applying them, but I think there is a big relative difference in uh, adaptation. Adaptation or adaptability is the ability to adopt to a complex and changing operational environment against a dynamic enemy. A flexible force that orientates, innovates and adapts more quickly than their adversary in a conflict is more likely to achieve their operational objectives. In the long and mid-term perspective, adaptation includes prediction, planning and preparations. In the short-term perspective, adaptation includes understanding of the situation and continuous learning, and the ability to quickly adjust on plans and to adapt to the situation that is evolving. Put simply, uh, adaptation is about fighting in a smarter way than the enemy, and about making the enemy's plan fail. So far in the war between Ukraine and Russia, we have seen several examples where Ukrainian forces have managed to outsmart the Russians and win battles despite having a local disadvantage in the physical component. By utilizing the terrain to their advantage and by understanding how the Russians conduct their attacks, the Ukrainians have had great success by using mobile defense and by having precise intelligence on the Russian defense lines and a good understanding of the Russian soldiers' uh, will to fight or their lack of will to fight, the Ukrainians have enjoyed success by using the penetration attack. I will now go through a couple of examples. Uh, mobile defense is defined as a type of defensive operation that concentrates on the destruction or the defeat of the enemy through a decisive attack by the striking force. Its purpose is to defeat the enemy's advancing, advancing forces and preventing from achieving his objectives through flexible and mobile maneuver. It combines position and movement against the advancing enemy over an extended distance, with the emphasis being placed on attracting and canalizing the enemy. It uses a combination of ground holding forces around which mobile striking forces operate. It is an adversary focused method uh, permitting him to advance into a position that exposes him to a counterattack and envelopment. And the emphasis is on defeating the enemy rather than regaining or retaking uh, ground. The commander holds the majority of his available combat power in the striking force for his decisive op operation, which is a major counterattack. And he commits the minimum possible combat power to his fixing force that conducts shaping operations to control the depth and breadth of the enemy's advance. The fixing force also retains the terrain required to conduct the striking force's decisive counterattack. The area of defense, on the other hand, uh, focuses on retaining terrain by absorbing the enemy into an interlocked series of positions where he can be destroyed largely by fires. If we look at what happened during the summer, when the Ukrainians and the Russians fought along a more or less static front line, we can get an impression of how they conduct their defensive operations. Uh, we have seen that there are great differences in the different sectors, uh, but uh, uh, my observation is, is that um, in a platoon company or battalion, they normally rotate their subunits in three roles. Uh, one third of the force rests and does fieldwork, 
and at the same time they act as a reserve. One third is in their battle positions, holding in line, and one third is conducting offensive action. So in a light infantry battalion, one reinforced company will always be tasked to offensive action, where the objectives are not to let the enemy rest, to create confusion and to take out ammunition depots, command posts and other targets. This is done by patrolling, ambushes and sabotage behind enemy lines, often supported by the soldiers in, uh, in the battle positions who maintain contact by firing towards the enemy front line. The maneuver brigades are mostly used as reserves to attack or to counterattack, often supported and guided by infantry patrols and the artillery units are constantly firing or moving. During the summer, and even as we speak, <coughs> uh, the Ukrainians have managed to prevent any Russian attempts to close the gap, which you see in the lower right picture in the western part of Donetsk. After regrouping to the east, the Russians concentrated their forces and managed to conduct their operations with a more combined arms approach. And one of their objectives was to close the gap by penetrating Ukrainian lines and thereby seizing the whole of uh, Donetsk Oblast. Uh, and there are several reasons why they did not succeed. I will mention four of them. First, the terrain is not suited for mechanized uh, BTGs with little infantry. It may look flat, but especially in the northern and northeastern parts, there are several small hills and pockets of forest which provide cover and concealment for the defending Ukrainian infantry. Second, the Ukrainians were fighting on their own ground. They knew the terrain very well, and they had prepared defensive positions and trenches since 2014. Third, the Ukrainians had a good depth in their defense with several defensive lines, and the lines were also long and wide with mutual support, making it difficult to bypass them. And fourth, the Ukrainians used mobile defense, which, as I said, is focused on defeating the attacker instead of holding ground, but in this case, they uh, managed to do both. The Russian attempts to break through with an attack towards the Ukrainian lines always started with a barrage of artillery fire. As soon as the fire started, the Ukrainian infantry either took cover in the trenches or pulled back towards the next line, allowing the Russian attack to break through the first line and advance towards the next. When the Russian attacking force was uh, sufficiently stretched, Ukrainian mechanized forces counter-attacked on the flanks, supported by own artillery and infantry, and which now were in a position to fix the enemy and secure the advance of a striking force. And after the attackers were defeated or pushed back, the Ukrainians re-established the front line. The Russian attempts to close the gap and to uh, envelop the Ukrainian forces in western Donetsk were still conducted by uh, more or less individual BTGs. Uh, one can say that their tactical actions were badly orchestrated in the sense that they were not sufficiently coordinated between the different BTGs. And the synchronization with supporting elements or supporting actions seemed to be less efficient than they should have been. The Russian plans and orders for these attacks have probably been rigid and detailed. <coughs> the Russians have, through the whole war, shown a limited ability to learn from previous mistakes, and they have less accurate intelligence than the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians seem to have been fully aware of these Russian shortfalls and have several times managed to surprise the Russians with unexpected situations and actions. And they have adapted to the situation and to the adversary. Offensive operations are <coughs> operations to impose, impose one's own uh, will upon the adversary. And a penetration attack is a form of offensive which seeks to break through the enemy's defense and disrupt the defensive system. Basically, the idea is to quickly and with great tempo and surprise conduct a deep assault into, um, on a narrow front in order to rip up the enemy's defenses. The penetration stretches from the enemy's forwardmost positions through his main positions and to his tactical rear area. Penetration is normally used in situations where you can't find uh, vulnerable enemy flanks or you don't have the time to bypass, and when the enemy has openings or uh, vulnerable points in the thin frontal defensive position. Um, what I think is one of the most impressive observations from this war is, the, um, is not the counteroffensive itself, 
but the Ukrainian ability to prepare for it. After months of heavy fighting, the Ukrainians managed during the summer to set up and prepare two large forces for the counteroffensive. At the same time, they managed to hold the front line. This shows um, exceptional endurance by the soldiers, and it shows an impressive ability to mobilize, train, and equip new soldiers, mm -hmm. and to integrate new weapon system at the same time as the war is still ongoing. From early July, the Ukrainians started using HIMARS to strike Russian command posts, ammunition, and uh, logistical caches and uh, landlines of communication. This has had an impact on uh, Russian sustainability in C2 and has affected the situation on front lines by reducing replenishment and rotation forces. The Ukrainians have also degraded Russian combat forces directly, and special forces and partisans have conducted sabotage actions in the enemy's rear areas. In this way, the Ukrainians managed to shape the battlefield to their advantage. During July and August, it became clear that uh, Ukraine was preparing a counteroffensive. There was a buildup of forces both in the south uh, around Kherson and the northeast towards Kharkiv. And uh, Ukrainian officials even stated that a counterattack would come in the south. The Russian forces were at this point stretched out all the way from uh, Kharkiv and Luhansk to Kherson and Crimea, and they had to make a choice, which in fact is a trilemma with three options. First option is to maintain their current disposition, uh, dispersed. Second option, to reinforce the north, or third, to reinforce in the south. They chose to move forces from the north to the south, and this left them vulnerable in the north. Uh, some reports say that uh, after the move, they had 60% of their forces uh, concentrated in the south, and most of the forces in the north were grouped around the gap in western Donetsk. The Russian defensive line north of Itzium <coughs> was thin, and it was manned by newly mobilized Russian soldiers, uh, with reference to the relief in place, which we heard about earlier today. The Ukrainians seem to have been fully aware of this, thanks to their good intelligence system, and they trusted their intelligence since it had proven to be right over time. This meant that they could plan an attack with a very direct and frontal approach, and it wouldn't be too risky. The attack in Kherson started on the 29th of August, with several mechanized and motorized brigades supported by territorial and special forces. With fires from artillery and aircraft, they managed to break through the first Russian line after just two days. Then they more or less went firm, as they had managed to fix the uh, Russian forces in the south, and the main attack in the north could start. The attack in uh, Kharkiv started on the 6th of September. The main objective was to push the line towards east to the river Oskil, and to seize Balaklia and Kupiansk, which were important for Russian logistics. The Ukrainians planned to do this by penetrating along different axes with different combinations of mechanized, motorized, and light brigades supported by territorial and special forces. And they would util utilize tempo and surprise in order to create shock and confusion, and thereby attacking the Russians' will to fight. I will now show you um, one of these uh, brigade attacks. Um, just before dawn on the 6th of September, the 92nd Mechanized Brigade, supported by special forces on light terrain vehicles, attacked from uh, Prishib, which is a small village close to what uh, at this point was the front line. Just after six kilometers at the town uh, Verbivka, they came in contact with Russian forces. The brigade attacked straight into the center of the town and dismounted the infantry which together with the special forces took control of the nearest buildings. And the fighting vehicles supported with fire and covered the outskirts of the town. The Russians were totally surprised and tho those that didn't flee were killed. Later on that same day, the brigade advanced to the towards the city Balaklia, where they teamed up with um, other brigades and together they surrounded the city, but they left an open gap in the southeast. By doing this, they managed to push some elements uh, of uh, Russian forces out before they started attacking on the city. After intense fighting during the night, they ma managed to take control of the city on the morning of September 7th. The 92nd Brig Brigade continued towards uh, Semenivka, 
which is 41 kilometers behind the front. And on the 8th of September, they seized Shashenkov, supported by the 113th Territorial Brigade, which had advanced on a parallel axis further north. Throughout the attack, the brigade was in almost continuous movement, and the enemy was uh, often engaged while moving. Behind the attacking forces, uh, they had supporting units, both territorial and regular forces, who cleared and took control of the penetrated areas. Uh, the Ukrainian offensive was so quick and un unexpected that most of the Russian positions were abandoned even before the brigade got there. The Russian front collapsed and the Russian soldiers were uh, fleeing in all directions and they left a lot of equipment behind. On the night, of, uh, on the night before September 10th, after having penetrated 84 kilometers into Russian controlled areas, the brigade reached Kupiansk, which is on the bank of the Oskil River. And by the end of the day, the western part of the city was under Ukra Ukrainian control. The attack that I have described is only one of the axes and one of the forces that attacked the Kharkiv front in September. Other units attacked further north or over uh, even longer distances. And in total, the Ukrainians took back over 3,000 square kilometers between the 6th and the 10th of September. And by the 12th, the whole of Kharkiv Oblast west of Oskil had been taken back. I will now address some of the, of the relative advantages, um, which in many ways are the basis for Ukraine's ability to adapt. My findings show that uh, under the headlines of uh, organization, intelligence and mission command, we find that Ukrainian strengths correspond with Russian weaknesses. And by exploiting this uh, relative difference, the Ukrainians have been able to utilize tactics that in many ways make Russian tactics or efforts less efficient. In the attack on Ukraine on the 24th of February, <coughs> Russia used an organization based on BTGs, as they had done in Crimea in 2014 and in Syria in 2015 to 17. According to Russian dro doctrine, <coughs> the initial force consists of BTGs, but the main force will be organized as brigades and divisions. In this case, the um, follow-on main force only consisted of additional BTGs. On the other side, the Ukrainians had brigades. A brigade is not only larger than BTG, but it's a, it is a full combined arms system. This means that a brigade is able to conduct a larger variety of missions and it can operate independently and be self-sustained over a longer period of time compared to the BTG. The Russians were also short on manning. <coughs> they did not have enough soldiers to fill all the positions in the BTGs and they had to prioritize. Um, they, they manned their vehicles with crew members, but um, as we have heard earlier today, uh, they had problems with um, uh, filling the vehicles with uh, dismounts. And the Russian lack of infantry <coughs> has resulted in problems with uh, basically three, st three things. Uh, they, can, they, have, they will have problems with securing flanks, problems with uh, seizing and holding ground, and problems with urban warfare. And this has been a continuous challenge for the Russians. Um, as long as the BTGs are not sufficiently coordinated and synchronized in their efforts, they will uh, normally lose whenever they meet a brigade, where the battalions are by organization coordinated and synchronized. And the Russian challenges with uh, C2 have made it difficult for them both to coordinate the BTGs and to utilize joint assets. So my deduction is that uh, the way that the Ukrainian and the Russian forces are organized have contributed to Ukraine's ability to win battles against a physically stronger enemy. During the last years, <coughs> Ukraine has invested great effort in establishing uh, an efficient intelligence service, which have uh, proven itself during the last months. Ukrainian ground operations are to a great extent intelligence driven and at the tactical level we see that intelligence cells have been manned by 
their most experienced and capable officers and NCOs. Uh, good command on and control systems and the use of uh, mobile phones and other uh, means of communication for reporting have enabled military personnel on lower levels to act as sensors. And Ukrainian forces also have an advantage by fighting on their own ground, where every civilian also is a potential sensor. In addition to this, the Ukrainians have utilized uh, UAVs, electronic warfare system, uh, cyber, space, both owned and provided by allies. Intelligence support from Ukraine's allies and partners has also been an important factor for tipping the scale in Ukraine's favor when it comes to relative intelligence. Uh, for example, Ukraine intelligence service knew about the invasion and how it was going to be planned um, before it took place. And they have uh, been, given a lot, been given a lot of support from uh, American intelligence as well as other allies and partners. But uh, I, I must also stress that Ukraine's own intelligence service has taken a great part in this effort. In addition to the relative disadvantage from operating on foreign ground, we see that a fair-based leadership culture in the Kremlin has contributed to giving Russian decision makers false or inaccurate intelligence. In the Russian uh, initial attack of, uh, on the 24th of February, we saw that the Russian plan was focused on bad intelligence. Putin has been led to believe that most Ukrainians want to be uh, liberated and the Ukrainian army was in bad shape. He also believed that the resistance would be the same as in 2014. So, uh, a strong confidence and trust in intelligence over time has given the Ukrainians a good situational understanding and ability to predict future situational development in a way that has provided a good risk awareness. And this has enabled them to utilize a more frontal approach, for example, penetration, which in theory involves great risk, uh, but in practice has an acceptable risk. And such tactical actions based on good and trustworthy intelligence have resulted in great operational effect. According to the legacy of the Soviet Union, the Russians still use a centralized command and control system, uh, which in Western literature is often called uh, directive control. Directive control is an order-based command system where subordinates do not have the authority to do anything else than what is stated in the orders. Uh, and we have seen examples where uh, the Russian plans have had the several steps and stages. Um, and even though the plan had failed at the initial step and was no longer applicable, applicable to the situation on the ground, we see that Russian forces continue to step two and step three, uh, while others just stop and wait for new orders. Uh, the Ukrainians have now for uh, a few years used uh, mission command and uh, against Russian directive control, they have been very successful. <coughs> the fact that authority is delegated and that leaders are, are told what to do but not how to do it, not only lets the Ukrainians uh, adapt to the situation, but it, it can also make them able to change the situation in a way that makes the enemy's plan irrelevant. And when the enemy still continues with the plan, even though the premises have fallen, the situation presents the Ukrainians with great opportunities. The Ukrainians have several times shown that they are able to identify and exploit opportunities that arise, but they have also managed to stop their attacks before they culminate. In the attack in Kharkiv, they stopped the Kupiansk and at the Oskil River to consolidate, and they managed to hold the ground that they had advanced to. This ability is uh, heavily reliant on good command and control. Planning, preparations and execution with good situational understanding has contributed to the Ukrainian success using Mission Command. So uh, Mission Command stood up against uh, Russian directive control has given the Ukrainians the ability to adjust their plans and actions according to the situation, the enemy and the status of their own forces. To summarize, <coughs> the Ukrainians have shown that they have used their uh, relative advantages against Russian weaknesses. And this includes an ability to win battles through having a combined arms brigade organization, risk awareness through precise intelligence and a firm trust in it, 
and an ability to adjust to the situation by using mission command and letting uh, lower level commanders make the necessary decisions and choose the appropriate actions. All this combined with uh, good doctrines and a thorough understanding of them contributes to adaptation. And I believe that adaptation is one of the main reasons for Ukraine's ability to withstand Russian attempts to seize and hold ground and Ukraine's relative, relative success on the battlefield. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Eric. Uh, now we have uh, sufficient time, a uh, good time for uh, questions and answers. So are there any questions for Eric? Lars Karlsson, Swedish Armed Forces. So these battle, uh, battalion tactical groups, how are they led? Are they led directly from the combined arms army or are they brigade or division headquarters between? And if there are headquarters between, are the um, fact that they are, are, are not uh, used to work together who make them ineffective? What is your opinion? Um, I'm not sure. I, I don't have um, enough information on that subject to give a good answer. Maybe someone else in the room can uh, provide an answer, but uh, uh, based on their actions, uh, I think uh, many of them, uh, at least in the initial phase, uh, they were um, uh, not very organized. They were led by uh, written orders, which they received 24 hours before the invasion. The operation was led by Moscow. Uh, but uh, I do not know if there is a brigade or divisional uh, command level above them. Sorry. Anyone uh, would like to ask uh, further questions well then i would like to then uh, thank you <laughs> sorry <laughs> didn't see that <coughs> there is an uh, online question um from your point of view how important is uh, is it for the ukrainian mobile defense to have the knowledge of the terrain given by the rotation of ukrainian units on the front line held from 2014. Um. It's, it's a bit difficult for me to answer that, uh, but um, based on what I have, I have seen, I would say that uh, the knowledge of the train is it's very important. And uh, I have seen examples where they use all the advantages that the train could give them uh, to succeed, succeed with this uh, defensive operation, Be because it's a risky operation or a risky tactic. Um, but. Um, I've also seen uh, examples where they have failed in doing this, uh, so it, it kind of goes both ways, but uh, I believe that um, their knowledge of the terrain is one important factor for their successes. Colonel, thank you. As a general observation, we've heard a lot about BTGs and Ukrainian brigades. We've heard virtually no talk from either side about tactical armoured reconnaissance. Do you know if either side are actually bothering to use it? That's really my um, question. I, I, is this a, um, an omission or is this some, something that's not being reported on? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, I, I sometimes get the impression that uh, at least the Russian side is uh, not very efficient in uh, reconnoitering in their uh, advances. Um, but, um, that's all I have. I'm sorry. Can you, Eric, can you say something about which resources or capacities they can release at the brigade level and uh, not at uh, an even higher level? For their Russians or the Ukrainians? Sorry, for the uh, Ukrainians, for example, uh, air defense, uh, attack helicopters and so on. I think uh, you'll have to ask our Ukrainian colleague uh, that. I can't answer that.
uh, about uh, attack helicopters and uh, some uh, equipments which uh, concern to, uh, uh, for example, uh, artillery brigade, uh, rocket system. Uh, it is the equipment uh, which operated by a uh, commander of sector in our sector uh, or uh, operational t t a tactical group or operational group. Uh, for today, we have several operation, operational group uh, and uh, Army Aviation and, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, Su-25 uh, Tactical Aviation, uh, it means uh, which operate, uh, operates by, by a commander of operational group, not brigade commander. Uh, but uh, if brigade commander needs these resources, he, he uh, like, I don't have enough words. He, he requests it. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah. he requests about it, and uh, it, he, this issue has slowed very, very short time. Yeah. So uh, uh, I think just for a follow-up question, uh, the operational group, is that a bow brigade? Yeah, uh, operational group, uh, operational tactical group, it uh, includes maybe three or four brigades and more. Uh, operational group, uh, it uh, includes two operational tactical group or uh, maybe approximately 10 brigades. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, okay, good. Uh, from my knowledge, uh, both Eastern and Western uh, forces have a concept of defensive depth. Uh, it seems like the Ukrainians are more agile in that field. Uh, do you have any explanation for that? W were the Russians prepared for a defense at all? Um, I, I know uh, Polly Itzebe will probably come into that tomorrow. Um, but they, um, I, I think the Russians have shown uh, a, a good uh, capability of um, doing defensive operations as long as they manage to be in the same place and coordinate their actions and uh, have all the assets they need. Uh, they are very good at holding defensive positions. But um, in other cases, when they uh, must have to prioritize their assets to other uh, sectors or uh, other missions, they have uh, problems. And I think those problems mostly come from the centralized command and control system. Uh, hello? Yeah. Do you see a difference in the regional forces or uh, and the kind of the professional forces regarding? Russian defense? I don't know. Okay, thank you. Hi, we've heard uh, much about the uh, lack of professionalism in dismounted infantry amongst, uh, amongst the Russians. Are you seeing on the Ukrainian side uh, an increase in professionalism from company platoon and uh, section or squad level down? And uh, if they are able to do that, how do they manage to gain that professionalism? Uh, there are uh, different categories of personnel on both sides. <coughs> the Ukrainians have also mobilized uh, new soldiers. Um, but I know that the Ukrainians have a pretty good system of training them I in the fight. They uh, always try to have some uh, experienced soldiers or NCOs in a team to uh, educate and train the new soldiers. In the Russian organization, uh, I think it's different. Uh, they don't get much training, they just get orders. To our uh, Ukrainian colleague, uh, would you agree with that? Maybe yes. Uh, but I would like to say that uh, in Ukraine and in Russia, uh, we have today the same problems with, uh, with sergeants and with uh, young officers. 
because uh, a lot of them will, was killed or was wounded uh, and uh, today uh, at, uh, that uh, uh, it, it was uh, uh, or it was the people who trained before a long time and had a good experience uh, but uh, for today uh, we mobilized a lot of people who don't have enough experience and who served maybe in the uh, so uh, Soviet Union uh, uh, in uh, early in 19th years or uh, start from uh, 20, uh, 20s uh, but uh, that people didn't have enough experience we need to uh, uh, and we need to use uh, not only our our training center but abroad I told about it yes it, it's very helpful for, for us but very short time you don't have enough time thank you Do we have any more uh, questions? Well, Eric, thank you again. And um, now we'll take a break until um, quarter to four. And um, then we'll have the last uh, presentation today before we prepare for the panel debate. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are now uh, going to have the last presentation before the panel debate and um, we are going to listen to Sergeant Erik Bövetal who is the chief instructor on the K9 and K10 artillery systems as well as a project NCO for the implementation of these systems in the Norwegian army. His career started with the NCO school in 2014 to 15 and since then, he has worked with the legacy M109 systems. He's here to talk about his experience from uh, training Ukrainian crews on the M109 systems in April-May, which Norway provided to the Ukrainian army. And for his efforts, he received the Army Medal of Merit. So, please, the floor is yours. General. Chiefs, colleagues, um, it's a pleasure to be able to present uh, our experience from equipping and training of the UK Army on the M109A3 GN 155mm artillery system. Den varslede brannalarmsituasjonen er under kontroll. Faren er over, og normaltilstand er gjenopprettet. The proposed fire alarm situation is now under control. The danger is over and everything is back to normal. <laughs> so, to the background. After the war in Ukraine started, the Norwegian government decided the 19th of April that Norway will donate 22 109A3 GN artil artillery guns to the Ukraines. This also included spare parts and the gun must be tested that they fully work before donation. So I will go through the background, as I just did, the timeline we had, preparations, deployment, training, and the experience afterwards. So at this point, um, it was not stated that we will do any training on the M109 for the Ukraines. The plan was to donate them and let them use it themselves. And in December 2021, uh, Norway decided that uh, we will uh, decommission all 109s because we were fully implemented with the K9. It took some time and um, happily for the Ukraines, it was not started yet when the bro war broke out. So this is the timeline we had. So 19th of April, uh, we got the message and the preparations started in Norway. Two days later, we started test firing the first guns. At the 24th of April, nine guns was tested. And uh, the day after, eight of the guns was ready for deployment, then fully controlled and uh, at the workshops. Um, at 29th of April, we got the confirmation that we were going to train Ukraine forces on the guns. Uh, 3rd of May, the uh, training team was set and ready and we started the preparation 
for a uh, training uh, time in Grafenwar in uh, Germany. 7th of May, the first uh, guns left Oslo to Germany. And the 8th of May in the morning, we started the training. Four days later, we started with the live fire exercise uh, with the Americans, where we tested the American ammunition and high charges for the 109s that they will uh, make it and that we have the ballistics data they need to uh, use them for to use them in the war. This did we, have to did we do at the same time as the training were accomplished. Three days later, the ballistic data was finished and uh, sent to the Ukrainian army, and they uh, implemented, it, I implemented it to their firing system. When we arrived, we didn't know how many rotation we will had, have, and uh, the 20th of May, we got the confirmation that we have, will have four rotations. And we also have a uh, level three and four maintenance. And all guns were donated and the training team were back in Norway early June. So the preparations. In 2008, Norway upgraded the M109A3GN to the M109A3GNM. This means that the panoramic system for alignment were changed to add the computer-based system. Um, this means that all active soldiers in the Norwegian army have never used this syst old system before. It was new for us. Um, and since it was the K9 was used for two years, um, there were no conscripts that have used the 109s. So while doing the workshops and starting testing it, we need to uh, educate the conscripts to be able to help us through the testing phase in Norway. At the same time, we needed to translate the documentation. The documentation for the hull and engine is the same as the Paladin from Americans, so we had that. But the turret is from Rheinmetall, so German, so all documentation is either in Norwegian or Dutch. So while the testing happened, we started uh, translating all the documentation for the Ukrainians to be able to use it. And since we didn't knew that we would have the training, we needed to do how to fire the gun and how to operate it. And one of our biggest challenges when we got the confirmation that we were going to train the Ukrainian forces was that no one had fired with a panoramic telescope before. No one. So we have one soldier that uh, is now in a different branch. That was the last active soldier that in the Norwegian army that was able to help us. So you need to get him back, help us, educate us on the panoramic, and then join us for the training team so we could fully learn it. And since you saw the timeline, we didn't have much time. So the preparation for the course were pretty small. So when we left, we didn't know what to expect, expect and we ha didn't have any time for the preparation of the course. So it was almost made on the flight down. So the deployment to Grafenwar. Um, the Norwegian newspapers started writing about an Antonov had landed in Oslo. And some news started writing about uh, 109s had been spotted on trucks from northern Norway to south. At that time, the first uh, part of the cruise and uh, four of the guns was already inside the Antonov and ready to leave. Uh, and the first flight left down 7th of May, came back, picked up the rest of the training team and the guns and arrived night time 7th of May. It also included spare parts for what we had ready at that time. And yeah, the last flight uh, landed at 7 o'clock, no, 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 7th of May. Uh, then the Americans helped us to transport the guns and spare parts from Leipzig to Grafenwar training area at the night. 
and the uh, training team got some hours to uh, get everything ready, some hours of sleep, and 8th of May in the morning we started the training with the uh, Ukraine soldiers. So the training, what to expect. We didn't know what type of people we will meet. Were they affected of the war? Were they traumatized? Were they angry for, uh, on us for not giving help earlier? Or not joining in the war? We didn't know any anything. Had they a any uh, previous artillery experience? We didn't know. The only thing we knew is that often the people from the east of Europe is more hand good with uh, mechanic systems and doing maintenance. And since uh, M109 is the old gun, we know that they're mechanics. And that was what we had been thought when we st started the course. But uh, the answers were uh, very different than we thought. Some of the soldiers war were, uh, of course, affected from the war. But uh, when they understood they were safe and we were going to help them as best as possible, they started to trust us pretty fast. And after the three first hours of the first day, we needed to change the whole course. We were done with the first, first day. And then, then there's a bit struggling on what are we going to learn them. Um, we were between 16 to 22 Norwegian instructors and staff members in uh, Grafenvor, and we hadn't been able to do this without help from the Americans. So we had uh, support by the 141 battery from the US Army. Um, and when they first were at training, they also wanted some medic training and uh, stinger training. So in the free time, when some of the groups had some rest, uh, the SF Green Beret uh, did help us with some medic training and uh, stinger training. So more deeply into the training. Uh, we had four rotations, approximately between 15 and 100 guys each rotation. And they came from all over Ukraine. Um, some were professional soldiers that have fought since uh, Crimea in 2014. And some were all new, never touched any uh, military equipment before. But everyone did the best they could. And if someone had more problems learning, um, the group of students did help each other in breaks and focus on the person struggling because they all needed to know the gun as best, best as possible. The care for each other displayed by the Ukrainians was amazing and they were very humble to the help for the help they got, got. And as mentioned, some of them had artillery experience from before but that was often from the 2S1 and 2S3, old Soviet guns. Often the guns were either destroyed or worn out, so they couldn't use it anymore. It was no barrel left for the 2S1 and 2S3s, so they need, needed new guns. For each course, we focused on different things. To get the maximum of the five days, five and a half days we had with e each rotation. We had uh, divided into guns, where we had one group of turrets and one group of hull driving, FTC, aiming circles, and maintenance. For the uh, turrets, we focused on, uh, under let them understand to use a panoramic telescope with 600, 400 mils instead of 600, uh, 6,000 mils, and azimuth to aim on. We also focused on taking care of the, of the gun as good as possible, so they will last as long. For the hull and driving, uh, the main focus was to let them learn to drive not an old Soviet gun. It's a total difference. So the first hours were getting used to driving it, and then focus on them not getting it stuck and destroyed the first day of driving. It was a bit hard driving in the start. The FTC 
focused on using the firing tables and fa as fast and precisely as possible, but also get better understanding on different ammunitions, maps, and how the ballistics affects the shell. We also trade them on uh, the FTC guys on the aiming circles because they often use the same guys as FTC and aiming circles guys. For the maintenance, uh, we did as much repair as possible, but we didn't have enough time for what they wanted to learn. Um, so we focused on what we thought and they thought was the most important for them, based on our knowledge of the gun. But after the first week, they wanted an extra course, a uh, more deeply uh, maintenance course. And since we had two mechanics on that part and borrowed one from Americans, we needed more help. So then we got more help from Norway uh, with some extra maintenance uh, mechanics to do a level three and some level four maintenance course. In the middle of the course, approximately day three, four, depend, uh, we did a night maneuver exercise where the Ukrainians planned everything themselves and how to operate them. And we were just advising and taking care of the safety because it's a bit different safety rules from Norway, Americans and Ukraines. So it's a bit, bit special inside an American camp doing Ukraine rules with Norwegian instructors. So to the experience, the experience we have after training is that the will uh, to learn and fight is very strong. They did whatever they could to prepare themselves as best as possible and the focus and care for each other was extreme. They stated early that they tried to uh, try their best to protect and don't send the youngest to the front line uh, because when the war is over, someone needs to take the country back to what it was before the uh, war. One special uh, situation uh, where when one of the Ukraine soldiers got a uh, phone from home, uh, some of his family members were killed. He got out of the gun, cried some tears, got some hugs, and after five minutes he was ready to uh, learn. He now needed to understand the gun as good as possible, so he could make up for a loss and protect the Ukraine people from more, more unnecessary killing. On the last day of the training, we had a graduation ceremony and held out diplomas and took some pictures. When the speech speeches was over, the chief of each rotation said, Slava Ukraine, and the rest of the soldiers answered. This was amazing, but heartbreaking at the same time. In just 48 to 72 hours, they will probably be back in the war. While training, they did also, sh did also share experience from the battlefield. They mentioned how they operated the old guns and how Russian artillery affected them, and how they needed to change tactics in different areas and situation. However, there were nothing big news. Um, and it tells us that our training and focus is the right way for today's battlefield scenario. Some key points is of course the use of unencrypted um, communication systems while with uh, civilian radios and stuff. That provided the Ukrainians the opportunity to understand while going uh, into the, the uh, enemy's channels to get the information where they were going to firing, so they could move. The different rotation of the Ukraine forces did share that they had different jobs on the battlefield. Some had the shoot and scoot tactics as their prime uh, tactic, and some had more heavy firing, with up to 50 rounds per mission. In the middle of November, Norway did also send a new pack of spare parts and one extra 109 that has been restored from uh, uh, a workshop and was donated. Uh, the information we know how and have seen in videos is that two of the guns have been destroyed. One of these is destroyed and one is partly destroyed by kamikaze drones. That means there's still possibly 21 of the guns still active. I think they have been worn pretty good and uh, some of them have been doing maintenance or probably undergoing maintenance. Uh, but we believe our contribution have made a difference on the battlefield and helped the Ukraine forces and the people of Ukraine to getting closer to the get getting their freedom back. Thank for your attention. Well, 
we have uh, some time for uh, questions and answers. So, uh, do you have any for uh, Vettel? In the rear. Hey, thanks, Sergeant, for what you shared with us. Quick question, just to clarify. So for the information that was coming from maybe an observer or targeting data to the FDC, and then transmitting that data maybe to the guns for firing, were they using, you said, commercial radios, or was how did you train to that, and what did they use in execution, if you know, once they took them forward for uh, combat use? For the Ukraine forces? Yes. Um, while we were doing the training, we borrowed uh, American systems. Okay. But uh, I think in the war they are using both uh, commercial systems and uh, some cryptid. Okay. And as someone mentioned, Signal, WhatsApp, I think they're using whatever they can, Starlink. Yeah, I was just curious. We've seen in exercises using different systems like a Signal or some sort of messenger, which can actually be clearer than trying to listen to data. You can just read it and get more precise. So I was just curious, yeah. any feedback you may have observed from them, but thanks. Start with Chris. Yeah, what was the age of the uh, Ukrainian soldiers you were training? The youngest, uh, oh, the youngest was 18 years old uh, and the oldest were probably 70. So it's, what's a Big span in all ages. Were they? Some were professional, some were hmm. not allowed to leave. Um, one of the bat battalions had lost half of their people in uh, shelling, transported out, got some infantry people inside the battalion, driving on the flight to uh, Germany. A new battalion of art artillery system is ready. That was the way. Mm. Thanks. So, uh, uh, you mentioned the, uh, that uh, a number of the Norwegian MLI Sorry. were. You mentioned that uh, a number of the MLI's, Norwegian M109s, were uh, upgraded with the computerized turret. Uh, is there any uh, particular reason that we are not donating those? guns or if there are any plans to to do that um, <clears throat> the main reason is that uh, when we upgraded them we upgraded just some of them 109s and changed the systems but we didn't buy enough spare parts to have it in use so it was a better decision to give the old ones that we have spare parts with and was in a good condition instead of giving worn out newer m19s Yeah, one over here. So when it, it comes to challenges, uh, challenges. Uh, what about the language uh, when you were doing the training? You did the training quite fast, uh, from my point of view. But uh, I suppose it was some challenges uh, when it comes to the language. Yeah, um, we have some uh, translators from the Ukraine forces and uh, some help from the Americans with translators. Um, sometimes we didn't have the translators where we were, uh, so we just used uh, Google Translator, or we talked in English, showed them, and they understood some of the words, and they answered to us in Ukraine, showing that, oh, we understand, and thumbs up, everything is ready. <laughs> and on the fifth day, we did a live fire exercise, so it worked. Well, uh, are there any from the online uh, audience? Thank you. Uh, very interesting and uh, um, good hand for you. <laughs> now we'll have um, a longer break. Uh, we'll uh, rearrange here to have a panel debate. Uh, and I would uh, ask uh, the six panelists to, to link up with the technical personnel at the rear.
to get your uh, microphones uh, ready. And the panel debate will start at uh, 16.45. And Sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, the microphones is ju they, they're just for the sound because there will be no streaming. So whatever you say will be in this room. So that that's a, a key uh, issue. So please have a break, have a, have some, or have a lot of coffee, <laughs> and uh, see you later. <laughs>